Good afternoon everybody, welcome aboard and happy Bathurst 500 day here in ASR. The third day of consecutive action here at the mountain. Been a bit of a big weekend for ASR, we've not done anything like this before. We've had the two day events with the Bathurst 500 twice in years gone past, but never three consecutive days of on track action. We started with the development series and all the championship changing implications that happened on Friday night. We got through qualifying and the top 10 shootout yesterday evening and set ourselves a grid of 22 cars and 44 drivers ready to tackle the mountain for 81 laps and 500 kilometres. As I welcome Benjamin Rody Rhodes to the commentary box alongside me for this afternoon's race. Rody, we're looking at around about three to three and a half hours, give or take uh, a few minutes either side with regards to how long these drivers are going to be racing for this afternoon. But is there going to be a sting in the tail here? Is there going to be anything that makes life a little bit different or a little bit interesting? We have had a bit of a thought overnight that we know that probably out in front there's going to be one or two drivers that will be tough to beat for line honours today. But what about the rest of the field? What do you think is going to happen up and down the field today? Well, good afternoon, Nether, and good afternoon, everybody else watching along on the broadcast. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting race. I think the only curveball we could really throw at a Bathurst after all we've seen in the last few years would be a Bathurst with no safety cars, but I guarantee that is something that nobody really actually wants because uh, the Bathurst can get quite long in the tooth when you're out there racing around by yourself. But uh, look, you're right, there are some drivers who are probably already pretty well pegged for some solid performances. Um, uh, you know, the the Pixel guys, um, the lead CRE car with Will and Termo, um, the lead AR Mustang, and uh, the guest car, as well as um, I know that um, the lead Kiwi car is definitely looking to be in the hunt as well. Outside of that, though, yeah, it's interesting to see how some of this plays out. There's some drivers that uh, we haven't actually seen yet in the Enduro Cup. Uh, unfortunately, um, scheduling conflicts and the like meant a, lot, meant a few cars missed round one at Phillip Island. People like uh, Corey McFarlane and Luke Rosella in the lead AR uh, Mustang. I think both the AR Mustang actually missed the first round. Um, so good to have both of them here tonight. Uh, we've also got... Um, ben Hall and Lockie Lock in their Mustang. Good to have them back as well. Uh, and we've also got both the PBF cars in uh, Phil Boke and Brenton Foley, who we actually saw in the shootout last night. Great lap by Bokey to put himself in there. And we've also got John McDonald and Brad Severs running for PBF Academy Young Leopards entry. Um, and uh, all up, we've got, I think it was 22 cars in the grid, which is a pretty strong showing. Absolutely, yeah. We're actually up on four cars compared to last year's 500. So we had 18 last year and 22 this year. And I think there was about 24 cars total, I think, registered for the series. So that's a really great showing. Then a big, fantastic uh, pat on the back to everybody that's uh, put in some effort for this, uh, not only the Enduro Cup, but also for the 500. So thank you very much, guys. It does mean a lot to ASR and to the group. Let's actually have a look at the, the team standings while we wait for things to work their way out today. So this is coming into the event. Of course, there were a couple of cars Rody just alluded to that we haven't seen so far in the series. So out of Phillip Island, 346 points and a 20-point margin is the advantage for the Kiwi Sim Sports Beyond Borders team. That's Nathan Higginson and Tim Redmond. Over Termo and Will Devonish in the five minutes racing ZB Commodore. So... The sprint result went in favour of Will Devonish. He picked up 50 points for that little uh, win on the Saturday evening. And then the main race on Sunday went the way of Redmond and Higginson. So uh, that's why they're pretty close on points at the top there. There was 50 points for the win in the sprint. There was 300 points on offer for the win in the main race. And then working the way down the field. It's kept it fairly tight, which is, is good to see. There were a few changes of position between the sprint and the main feature race. So all in all, Rody, there's not a lot separating the teams there. It would have probably been a little bit uh, wider the margins between a lot of these drivers had the results of the sprint or the results of the uh, the main race sort of been the same as the opposite race. But uh, it's good that it's varied the order a little bit, having the co-drivers have a, their own little race and then the main drivers and co-drivers deciding who started when 
on the Sunday afternoon has just varied it up a little bit, kept it interesting heading to Bathurst. Exactly. It's shaken the points out up a little bit quite nicely. Um, you know, the, just the variation between um, the Kiwi Simsports Beyond Borders entry and the five minutes racing entry is, is way the way that things are played out just by virtue of the main race paying more. Um, but look, a combination with factor is obviously a round in, so there's less points on offer so far for the season, but it has kept the gaps nice and close. Uh, it's 20 points between first and second. There's, I think, uh, might be even nine points between um, second, uh, three and third and fourth. That's uh, the team has been uh, Mustang and the AAR um, number 111 Mustang. Um, but uh, even down the grid, there's some good little gaps going on there. Um, and as we mentioned, there's, there's a lot of entries that didn't make um, Phillip Island that are here tonight. So there's, um, I think there's, I think uh, the Kiwi Sims was community beyond car. Um, I've just seen the undevelopment car out there for Damo and Luke Diego, as I mentioned, both PBF cars, Corey McCall and Luke Rosella. Um, Bailey Hall and Mark Davey are actually out there on the grid as well. I have seen the 38 racing car around. Um, and actually, Brandon Dostal and Rob Carr, I believe, are actually on the grid as well. Um, so everybody who hasn't raced yet uh, is everybody who hasn't scored points. Or, so everybody who hasn't turned up to a round has now turned up to a round. So, um, yeah, good to see. And, and you're right, it's going to spice up the championship order. It will be different this time around because there is only the single race points on offer. And uh, from memory, there is... There is a, quite a good haul of points on offer for Bathurst. So we're going to start to see some of those gaps change around a little bit and possibly see a, a leader pull away at the top. Yeah, absolutely. So actually, it's a good point that you raise that as well if we look over to the weekend format because you can see there on the right-hand side with the point structure that it is 300 points for a race win in today's 500 kilometre event. And then it does pay down from there. It follows the supercar point system. So if you're playing along at home and you know how that works, you can figure out who's going to get points for second, third, fourth, and how it's all going to uh, unfold from there. And the pay's all the way down to 26th place. And of course, we've got 22 cars on the grid. So as long as they all finish and all see the chequered flag by 80% of the distance. So even if you're a couple of laps down at the flag, as long as you've done that 80% minimum requirement for the car and both the drivers have met the minimum laps required of 33 then you will be fine and you'll get points for finishing the race which for a lot of drivers they will probably take that to the bank every day of the week roadie especially at Bathurst absolutely yeah and, and, and you're right yeah just the points on offer and also just the, the individual thing as well um, definitely some drivers out here focusing on the wider picture of the championship teams championship drivers championship is actually the same thing in this case obviously essentially single car entries for the team um, i'm sure there's been some bragging points around going with a with a dual car team so it really only it's i think uh, uh i think it's only the aar and uh, locky lock motorsport cars that are actually under the same name banner completely but um the, the other focus for some drivers is just individual glory and uh look as bathurst goes it's probably the race in a supercar calendar that you want to win that's right well it only comes around once a year for things here in ASR when we're running in supercar can, uh, competition, whether it's supercars in the real sort of competition that we have, our main game competition, or as it's been for the last couple of years, an own separate event for the 500 or part of the in endurance format, which is great to see. So with a little bit of, uh, I guess, time up our sleeve here, Rody, there's a few, I guess, things to tick off. Um, we did mention a few moments ago, 22 cars uh, on the grid, so which is great to see, four up on last year. Driver's briefing underway. Now, there's going to be a couple of points that are going to be getting raised in the driver's briefing that are a little bit new and a little bit unfamiliar to some of these drivers. And uh, for all the viewers at home, it is a little bit different to what you have seen uh, in Supercar's main game competition this year if you've been watching the Outwell Broadcasting Channel. So it's time to pay a little bit of attention. For the first time, we are going to be involving a full field lucky dog situation. So what that means is if there, are sa uh, if there is a safety car at some point and there is the ability to do so, all cars, one or more laps down, will be permitted to unlap themselves. Usually the lucky dog that uh, is run by Automobilista is the first car that is one or more laps down is the one that gets the free pass and everybody has, else has to stay behind and stay in queue. For Bathurst, we're going to be following what they do in real life and allow all the field that are one or more laps down to unlap themselves and then catch up to the back of the queue. 
We're not going to do it on Conrod Strait, though. We're going to be aiming to try and do that on Mountain Strait and give the field as much time as possible to catch up to the back of the field um, or the back of the snake before it goes live. So drivers will be getting the instruction that if they're pitting throughout the course of a safety car, that when they come out, we don't want them to dawdle. We want them to catch up to the back of the train so it becomes a little bit easier to release those cars that are one or more laps down. So that's a new thing for this year. So I think that's probably put a smile on a few drivers' faces that are starting the racing uh, this, e- or this afternoon. The other one, of course, is there is going to be probably at some point at least one random safety car intervention. Now, this is, again, a new feature just to try and keep the racing interesting and the racing close and the strategy element going for a number of these drivers because a few people that are in this field will not only be stepping up from development series into main game next year, um, but some of them will also be doing double duty. So they've got to sort of get familiar with how the safety car periods operate and how to, you know, what, when to make those sorts of calls. In development series, the safety cars are on, but a lot of the time the drivers don't actually need to come in for a pit stop unless it's for damage repair. So they're going to be coming uh, in at some point, probably during some safety car periods, there's at least going to be one of those random ones. So that means it could be one, there could be more. So we'll have to see how that pans out. And then the third thing for this year as well is the broadcast crew, being Rody and myself, um, while we're flicking through on our own cameras, of course, I've got two here. rody has got his one there. If we happen to see an incident that should trigger a safety car, but does not. For example, a couple of cars get together at the Forest Elbow and end up sitting there for two or three seconds longer than probably would would have normally triggered a safety car. They're going to be having a yellow flag thrown immediately rather than sort of try and let them sort of sort themselves out. We actually had an incident at Phillip Island where I think it was the Vivid Esports machine where he blew an engine sort of late in the race, pulled over to the side of the track and was there for a good 30 seconds um, before they actually exited the lane. And that, in reality, would have, in a real world, that would have triggered a full course caution. So we're going to follow that same sort of tactic. If there's a car that's stranded somewhere or a car that can't get themselves extricated from a gravel trap in time, we've got the decision and the authority to throw a yellow flag to nullify the race. So that's how it goes. Yeah, and, and there's some good changes this year just to try and, uh, you're right, like it, it heightened the action a little bit for us, but it importantly keeps the strategy in play. And look, for drivers that um, look are doing all the right things in the race, um, but uh, yeah, they're doing all the right things in the race, but just, you know, one or two things goes astray on them. It doesn't necessarily mean their race is over. It doesn't mean they're going to throw the towel in. Um, it means they've got the opportunity um, to get back into the race, uh, whether it's because they've been involved in a bit of a tangle that, you know, in theory would cause a safety car, but uh, isn't able, it just one isn't triggered by virtue of um, how the game decides to calculate it. Or the other more important thing is, look, they're a lap down by virtue of pitting out of order or some other stuff in, in, in how it all plays out. Um, and they've got the opportunity to get back onto that lead lap, get back into that into that race position. I mean, we even saw this. It, it also really kind of comes off of some of the stuff we saw at um, Gold Coast with the supercars, where it was helpful to have. Um, it would have been helpful to put cars back on the lead lap just to try and avoid some of the uh, like just the inherent cluster that we kind of had at the back end of that race. So it's hopefully going to clear up some of that stuff as well, and it will mean that more cars will be able to race not only. For, for actual position, but the way we race each other because more cars will be on the same lap. So it should also make restarts a bit cleaner. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the hard part about Automobilista as well, AMS1 more precisely, is that all those procedures are manual as well. So the, full, the the lucky dog is the only part of the equation when you've just got one car unlapping themselves that's automated. Everything else is manual. So if we want to do a full course lucky dog when we have to get them out, we've got to get all the cars around. They've got to be told manually to go. If any penalties pop up as a result of you know people coming out of the queue to do that we have to manually remove them <clears throat> so there's a fair bit of effort involved in getting it and that responsibility actually falls to us Rody. it falls to the broadcast yeah. crew so we've actually got a fair bit of stuff going on <laughs> these days not only broadcasting and keeping eyes on the track and what's happening but we've got to actually manage that as well so i'm actually kind of grateful that you're in the box here with me because it'd be quite difficult trying to do all of that solo yeah, no, it'd be good fun. Like I've, 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 I've had a little bit of play around, obviously in the past, 
with some of the server commands. Uh, not actually done it under the pump too recently though. But uh, look, it's uh, the the good thing with 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 Bathurst. It's a long lap, all things considered. You've got three laps if you get given a penalty to serve it before the game gets unhappy with you. And a lap around here is north of two minutes. So. You know, there's, there's a good six minutes for us to sort of out. We're not aiming to take that full six minutes, of course. Uh, it's only going to happen if, for whatever reason, we have the entire field just gets thrown a curveball, um, and we'll do what we can in the moment to react to it. But yeah, yeah, it's 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 good to it's good to have there, and it's 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 uh, nothing else. It's good practice. Um, you know, I've 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 been an admin with this league now for I think coming on to two years, and I'm not actually had to do a lot of the the in depth admin level stuff so it's a good chance to sort of dip the toe in the water as well um and you know help to keep things running absolutely so we've got a couple of minutes left in the warm-up sessions driver's briefing has just finished We're not too far away from getting this thing underway for the third year and well as i've said earlier we know who's probably going to be finishing up the pointy end of the field so that part sort of out of the equation We'll offer up, we've got a couple of prize packs to offer up throughout the, the race today as well. So we'll take a little bit of a, uh, a vote on, you know, we'll come up with something random about where someone might finish or, you know, closest to pin or something like that there. And then the person that's closest will, uh, will get themselves a prize pack courtesy of uh, Penrite, a better class of oil. And we probably also might throw something in there for uh, anybody that uh, comes up with some nice comments or some things in the live chat that are interesting to, to read. And we'll see how all of that unfolds as the race goes on. We'd like to uh, to encourage the viewer participation in the live chat. And uh, I know there's pl plenty of drivers that uh, didn't make it out for Enduro Cup, likes of Brian Walsh, Glenn Miles, and a few others that are, are watching along. And also the co-drivers that are watching along while they wait for their turn at the wheel um, as well. So be very grateful to see um, some of those comments coming in throughout the course of the afternoon. Looks like we've got everybody in though, Rody. We've got 22 cars that have just made it into the server. We've got all the starting drivers look like they've been confirmed. So let's. I'm just looking at this list now just to see anybody that's in there that stands out to me um, as somebody that is a bit of a curious choice to start. Um, surprisingly, the man who qualified on pole yesterday, Dane Warren's actually opted to start the car. So um, that's a bit of an interesting... Uh, call from there. I actually expect probably Dane will probably do the lion's share of the driving today as well in that car. Um, for Braxton and Scott Stancliffe, that's the uh, the only query that I sort of need to look at as well about who's going to be dropping into that car. I'll have to go and check their broadcast camera in a minute. Um, but who else on that list for you at the moment, Brady, stands out as a bit of a question mark about uh, the choice to start the car or even a smart choice to start the car? Look, you're right. It's a bit of a maybe there's not one thing Dane out there, especially because his co-driver does, I think, have the the vaster experience of racing within the, the platform and within the sim. But I think the important bit for for Dane is that he can put that car out of trouble. He can get that car clear out in front. The only thing that's really going to risk troubling them is a safety car, or uh, potentially as we get further into the race with flat traffic. But and crucially, he's able to put the car out there, out front, out the way. It's probably the same reason why I believe we do have Corey McFarlane. I'm going to double check, but I do believe Corey is starting the second place car. It's going to tick through the list to find where he is. Uh, there he is. Yeah, so he will be starting the uh, the number 55 AAR Mustang, and I imagine for the same reason. Also, to be fair, Corey, I believe, is starting because I, I believe Corey has issues getting in a car in a driver swap. So. I imagine Corey will be tripling and then Luke will be picking up the back end of the race. Um, I know that uh, that explains another reason uh, for reason for another one of the starters. Um, Zorolazak or Brad Severs is starting the PBF Young Academy, a PBF Academy Young Weapons car. Um, and that's for much the same reason. Brad's, they've decided that Brad's going to do a triple. John's going to pick up the, the back end of the race. Uh, this less for any sort of practical service swap reasons and simply because for Brad, it's approaching midnight. So the sooner he can get his stints out of the way, the sooner he can go to bed. It's been a long day for him. He woke up for qualifying last night. He actually ran in a, uh, a another league Bathurst 1000 mock-up during the day for him. It was uh, started at 2 a.m. for us. Um, and uh, he's now running his stints at our Bathurst to finish off his very super Saturday. Um, so... Uh, he'll get those out of the way. Um, looking at the rest of the drivers, though, a lot of drivers that, yeah, that probably make sense to start. Um, Greg Tara starting for the Flinders Auto Sport car. Greg has a bit more seat time than Noah, so that's probably a smart decision. 
uh, when it comes to dealing with the traffic. Um, Cam Rutledge starting for uh, the Seri Anson car. Um, they're probably even pegging on to a driver experience. Um, Cam's definitely got more experience in a supercars field than Coxie by virtue of his couple more seasons on his belt. So again, probably a smart fit, uh, bet just on the experience base. Um, just looking through the rest of the list though. A lot of drivers that, you know, I, I'd, I'd see as either the primary driver in the car or at least an equal pairing to their compatriot to start the car. And nobody out there, I think, that's really going to make a, a, a monumental hash of it. Everybody who is starting the car has got a wealth of experience um, and uh, just knows their way around a racetrack. Absolutely. And you're right. I think a few people that uh, have made the right calls to try and get those laps out the way early. So as you said, Brad Servers getting his out the way early. Corey McFarlane getting his out the way because of some of the issues that he's actually had in, in years gone past with regards to driver swaps. And a few smart decisions to get those drivers over and done with um, for various reasons. And a few of them that will be will be keeping an eye out with interest because when the other drivers swap over uh, and put their compatriots in the car that will be the real interesting bit about who loses ground in the first few stints and then who gains time in the second couple of stints as well. And do they opt to change drivers, you know, regularly enough? Do they opt to, you know, keep that that ticking over and, um, and keep, you know, the flow up? Or do they opt to try and just get one set of drivers laps out the way and then have somebody into the finish. I think even at Phillip Island, we did see there was a few drivers that took the opportunity to swap almost every stint and get their laps not only ticked off, but also just keep each other fresh. So there's a couple of different schools of thought about how people may opt to tackle the 500 kilometre race this afternoon which we are about to get underway. So it's uh, it's 25 past one here on the east coast of Australia, or at least it is in New South Wales and Victoria because of the, the daylight saving situation. So let's see how things shake out. We're expecting about three to three and a half hours, just depending on safety car intervention and what happens throughout the course of the day. And I'm being told as well, just looking at the uh, the video I'm checking out here, looks like Scott Stancliffe's actually going to start for the Team Stancliffe entry. I did see a few seconds ago, Braxton was on the in the sim just doing the last couple of laps, but nope, the video is up. It's got Scott behind the wheel. So that's a very, very interesting late change, very late minute change for the number 187 Stancliffe Commodore. Yeah, it's an interesting decision, but... Look, as, as things sit, they've probably got equal car experience, but Scott, having run in the supercars game amongst uh, all those other drivers, Scott having spent a bit more time in the main game than Braxton, probably the, the safer choice when it comes to putting 22 cars on a start grid as close as you are at Bathurst. Um, so, you know, a smart decision, um, and we will see Braxton in the car later in the day. Absolutely. So here comes the field as we get the formation lap underway. So Dane Warren starting off the pole position. The, the lap record absolutely obliterated yesterday evening. And as Rody mentioned, probably to the tune that we will probably very, be a long time before we see that record even gotten close to, let alone eclipsed. Behind him, Corey McFarlane starting the number 55 AAR Mustang, who's sharing with Luke Rosella for today's proceedings. He'll be ex expecting him based on we understand to get his minimum laps out the way as quickly as possible and then hand the car over to the uh, the Synergy Sim Racing man um, who's done a very, very good job not only in the supercars this year but also in the uh, in Scops and other categories along the way as well. Behind him on the second row of the grid, Termo is going to start the number one 15 uh, five minutes racing Commodore. So he's sharing with Bill Devonish. Lewis Wedding's going to start car number five for team, or for has been racing with Brendan Ross to take over at some point. Lachlan Burke, who hasn't done a huge amount of laps in the server across the week, he's going to start the Triple One machine. He'll hand over to Hans Brunswick at some point in proceedings. That's the second of the AAR Mustangs. There's Scott Stancliffe alongside him in sixth place. It was a good qualifying result for Braxton yesterday evening, redeeming himself from uh, the, the muck up that he made in the 2021 shootout. Greg Tara, again, probably another smart choice here, starting Greg in the car, similar way they did to Phillip Island, but at least Greg will be trying, probably looking to try and keep the car on the circuit and out of the walls for the first couple of stints before he hands over to Noah. Tim Redmond, he started the first race at Phillip Island, and he's going to start this race as well, the current points leaders 
out of position eight. Then you've got Steve Burko. He's sharing with Dane Licardo. He'll start the C7 Motorsport ZB out of ninth. And then Brenton Foley, who missed out on qualifying last night. Probably would have been the preferred man to have in for qualifying. He's going to start 10th. Bailey Hall sharing with Mark Davey. He'll start 11th in the 38 Racing Machine alongside Cam Rutledge. And there's a bit of a developing story there for the number 915 machine, which we'll talk about in more detail a bit later on. Peter Thrower in the 56 Mustang. He'll be out of 13th with Ben Hall making his second start out of two races for the Enduro Cup in car number 237. Steve Warwick, another car that has a few tell, tales to tell over the course of the weekend. We'll get two. She's starting out of 15th alongside NZ Snipes and Cheese in the Team Tanner for Kiwi Sim Sports Machine starting at 16th. Then rounding out the rest of the field, Justin Cecil in the second of the LLM Mustangs. Then comes Hayden Cupid in the 158 Ignition Sim Racing. Then Brad Severs, or Zrolazak, as Rody's referred to a few times, out of 19th. Matt Cecil, 20th, who's his first actual Enduro Cup hit out this year, with Jesse Bennett subbing in for him at Phillip Island. Luke Yeager, second last on the grid. The Kiwi Sim Sports underdeveloped and Emirates backed ZB Commodore. And then Hayden Link sharing with Ed Felipe in the second of the Ignition Sim Racing Mustangs. What a field, Rody. We finally got there. And the field now coming down to the last corner to form up and take the start here. Closing thoughts before we go to green. Uh, I'm, I'm just really keen to see how this race goes. We've lucked out with it with a small group. We're definitely going to get everybody on the uh, in the start or in the on the start finish line for the start, um, which is which is good. Um, uh, look, I'm just keen to see how this first few laps play out with some of the drivers. A lot of sort of A drivers, a lot of quality drivers in the field. Um, but these starts can get pretty hectic. But importantly, I need to remember, it's a 500k race. You don't win on a lap one. That's precisely right. It's going to be a long haul. Everybody's got to get ready to go. And everybody's got to be right smack on the money. You've got to be just take that early risk out of it and then not worry too much about it. And then worry about it all at the back end of the race when it comes to the, the crunch. We're just waiting on, I think, a few drivers just to get themselves into the right grid spots here. Because the lights are not in sequence just yet. They are now. It's time for the ASR Bathurst 500, the third year of running, and we are underway for the 81 lap duration, and off we go towards turn one. Unsurprising oh. launch there, but there was a massive collision in the back of shot. Was that the Tara machine? I think the Flinders Autosport ZB got high-sided by somebody at the start there. They've dropped all the way sort of back to about the third last row of the grid. They've had an awful start. We'll have to go back and try and get a replay of that. No surprises out front, though, apart from a change of position with Termo getting the, the whole shot off the second row of the grid ahead of Corey McFarlane. Yeah, I think the gist of all that was Lewis Wedding got a bunch of wheel spin off the start, which is what pushed him sideways. Cars were trying to pass him as they got better runs, and unfortunately, um, the Tara car was stuck on the outside. Also going nowhere off the start is Corey McFarlane. Um, he got out-dragged by the car behind him in the row, which I think was Termo. Um, and as a result, he's now back in fifth. He's behind Tim Redmond as well as Lockie Burke. So Lockie Burke actually the lead AAR car despite before buying further back uh, the, outside the top ten. We've got the replay here on board with Greg Tara at the at the re race start here. So here's what happened. It was a... Oh, yeah, you're right. I think Lewis Wedding looked to try and go around the car in front. That pinballed into Braxton Stan... Sorry, into Scott Stancliffe and then sent the Tara machine back down the order. If we just rewind it back, here's the other, here's the other viewpoint of it at the start here. Keep your eye on the Hasbeens Mustang. Yeah, um, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure if they've got a, a bit of a shove from Tim Redmond behind, who was a little bit quick starting. Maybe that's pitched him sideways there into Stancliffe and then into Tara. I'm not quite sure. That's a bit of an awkward start line incident. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, yeah it's just that. It's, uh, yeah, you don't win on that one, but it's just that urge to try and get out, get into your own clear space as soon as possible. Um, and it's easy enough to do, especially up the front of the grid, just to get a bit of wheel spin, just to drop back. As I mentioned, it's a narrow grid at Bathurst. Not the narrowest thing Phil Byland takes the cake there, but definitely not one of the widest grids. Like a, like a, like a bend grid is a great one for a start because you've got room to maneuver around cars. But look, it's lap one. Um, crucially, the uh, Hasbeens car has dropped a few spots, but not too bad. The Tara car has actually dropped quite a few spots. But the way this race will play out, I don't think it's in a fair race just yet. No, I don't think so. Still a very much a long way to go here as we chalk lap one off for the field. 
there is the car that you just alluded to there. The, uh, the team has been racing number five machine. The uh, Braxton's is Scott Stanklin, very wide in the background there in turn one. He's going to drop a couple of spots in all of that as Weddings dropped two spots. Already hearing as well that there's been an early retirement as well. The, uh, the PBF Young Leopards car of, of uh, Brad Severs and John McDonald already looks like it's out of the race, having not completed a lap. So that's a very interesting uh, development. I'd be keen to find out, Rody. I think you're probably messaging I'm, some of the drivers now I'm, to figure out what's I'm happening. I'm going back in the replay right now. I'm, I'm curious on what's happening because that's, that's my entry. I've put a bit of evidence on that one up. But I was insistent that they try and get far enough in the race that uh, maybe they have an, an issue uh, with uh, the driver swap, but that pulls them out of the race. I didn't want to go, the car to go out of lap one, but uh, yeah, I will chase that one up. Well, we'll find out what's happened there because that's a bit of a heartbreak early on for the that machine. A bit further up the field, so it looks like McFarlane has... Uh, actually, no, there's been a bit of a change here as well. It looks like Lockley Burke has actually managed to surge up into position number two. So that's a good start for him aboard the Triple One machine with him and Hans Brunswick. And then Redmond around, and he's around at the hairpin, and he's had a major, major incident there. Has he actually managed to keep the car going? That's the key piece of this puzzle. Is this going to trigger a safety car? I would not be surprised. I think he's going to get away from it pretty much. He, he is off the racing line. He is out of the way. That is going to drop him right to the back. Yep. Full, right, course. Right. Full course. Full course has been called. Yeah. Full course has been called. So that's a very, very unusual incident. Actually, and, uh, did he get cars did, involved with that. Did he get Bailey help? Hall as well. Bailey yeah. Hall's well further down the track. So I'm not sure whether he was part of that as well. A separate incident. Well, here we go. We'll bring it up on the replay again here. Now, the car behind was Corey McFarlane. And no, I think Redmond's lost that all on his own. And then you said there was another car that was involved in this. So I'm just trying yeah, to keep an eye out for who it actually is. If we pan the, the camera up. Ba the Bailey Hall car, he's, what he's done is he, he's, oh, he's looped it. the wall and spun it. We actually, I just saw in the replay as well, Matt Cecil getting past Bailey Hall. Very nearly spun it as well. So a lot of guys almost trying to crash in sympathy for Tim Redmond there. But um, yeah, two cars out. Um, uh, yeah, look, look, it was it was a pretty dangerous spot at a point there. So no surprise, safety car was called and uh, Look, I thought we maybe we got a little further into the race, but look, there's a lot of energy in this field today, so maybe not too much of a surprise that we're seeing the safety car this early. No, well, there's a bit of energy in the field, but for Redmond, I'm a bit surprised that that came as early as it did. Now, there's already a few drivers starting to take service here as well. So one of the LLM Mustangs is in. That's the Justin Cecil and Taipan machine. Snipes and Cheese have come in. So too is Bailey Hall and Mark Davey and then Tim Redmond as well. Now, the important bit I need to look at here is, are there any driver swaps taking place at this juncture? You know, we'll have to look at some of our race stats in just a few moments' time. Oh, the compound matters. There's a drive-through penalty for NZ Snipes caught speeding on pit road. So that's going to put them well off the back of the train when all of this is said and done. Yeah, just to fill out the rest of that story from earlier, I, uh, I have had a chat to John McDonald and... Um, Brad Matt to turn two, and then his game crashed. Oh, well, so that's a, a heartbreak for that particular car. So didn't even see even a full lap, or close to a full lap, only two turns, probably the better part of a kilometre. And that was it. So we've lost one car, but there are some cars that are getting plenty of repairs done. Importantly, it doesn't look like any of the cars that came in actually conducted a driver swap. So. There's everybody still in the car that started this race. And NZ Snipes, they've come out in 18th after the stop there, so they will be touring the lane. There is no choice in that one. That's uh, not a penalty that's been handed out by being ahead of a car that you're, you know, you're, follow you're supposed to be following as per what the game tells you to do. That's for a completely self-inflicted incident. And Redmond now catching up to the back of the, uh, the pack. So who else took service under that one? I actually think Lockie Burke may have taken some service too because he's come all gone all the way down to 17. So I think that's a very smart play for them up in second place. That actually buys a little bit of flexibility for a car that we expect to be sort of top five today. Who else took service aside from them? So the 111 machine, NZ Snipes' is, uh, 420, Redmond's 430, the 21 machine of Justin Cecil and Taipan and then the 38 racing entry of Bailey Hall. They were the five cars that came into the pits on the last lap, and it looks like McFarlane and Rosella are taking the bait here as well, I think. Uh, I believe they are. Yes, indeed, they are. So into the pits they come. 
Yeah, so good opportunity just to, to pick up some stuff early, get the fuel covered. Um, crucially with these cars, and we'll find out some more race facts as we get further in, but crucially, the fuel is the limiting factor with these cars. The tyres will be pretty average at the end of a fuel run. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, what it, what it will mean is um, that, yeah, you, you can get your fuel now to the end of the tyre window if you want to push your tyres that far. Um, it also gives these guys some flexibility. Um, the minimum co-driver laps is, depending on where your fuel window is, is about or just short of, of three so racing three. stints. Yeah, but uh, it gives you some flexibility in there as well that maybe if you play a little bit here and there, a little bit here and there, maybe you make it into, um, you make it closer to a two stint run because you managed, just, you managed to gap that stint out because of picking up fuel and the like under a safety car. Yeah, you're spot on. So if we have a look at our race facts, with thanks to Daniel Cox Designs, we bring them up on the side here. You can actually see that full service pit time there, Rody, is 60 seconds. So that's from the time you enter the lane to the time you get to your box, do your driver change, put fuel tyres in on, all that sort of stuff, and get out of the lane, you lose 60 seconds. So the pain under safety car is, is absolutely nothing. It, under green flag conditions, it is a, a big, big problem if you're you know, getting close to being a lap down. And the stint lengths, you just alluded to it. About 12 to 13 laps when it's green flag running. That's the important piece. That's based on last year's numbers. And it does, unfortunately, make you fall short of the 81 lap distance by a couple of laps. So you do need some safety car help if you're going to you know, make sure you try and meet it there. So this is a bit of an awkward time. It's only the early going to the race. People are going to be in maximum fuel conservation mode to try and extend this stint out now. So instead of 13 laps, they're probably going to be targeting somewhere between 14 and 15. Some may even try to get to 16 laps. It'd be a bit of a stretch because then it buys you some insurance at the back end of the race, having not have to come in for a splash and dash. And then of course the safety car probability being a medium to high proposition. Well, we've already just seen why. Just keeping yeah, an just, eye on. Sorry, Brody, go on. Sorry, no, I was just, I was just getting confirmation in, in the chat. It was a, it was a runtime error for, for Brad. He's, he's had put in some practice today, so I'm not sure whether, maybe just, um, it, quite possibly, just hadn't been on a, the server with all the cars present and um, uh, had sort of the settings set up as a result from Phillip Island. Um, I sorry, he wasn't even at Phillip Island, so we'd go back to uh, last year's race, which have less cars on the grid. So possibly that's where we, we've come to. We did try and cross a lot of preparation off, but. Um, uh, with the weekend that uh, Brad's had, he's obviously run to Bathurst. I've been involved with shooting from Bathurst, um, and we're both, uh, uh, in this case, I'm an admin in both situations. He's an admin for the other league. Um, it's been a busy weekend. Um, ideally, we'd be a little further than that, but it is what it is, and we're going to Adelaide. But um, no, as you're saying, we're, we're, I think we're about to get underway soon, actually. I think we're coming up to the last lap of the safety car. Everyone has actually caught back onto the train. Um, and uh, actually I believe everybody has it. We're just waiting on. Waiting on no, everybody's there. Everybody's up there. We're just waiting on confirmation for the safety car lights to go. I think it's actually got one more lap to go because it uh, it's just gone past the pit entrance now. So there'll be at least one more lap under safety car, and we'll keep an eye on things as we go along. So I'm actually just having a look. I think in the live chat as well, Rody, you were talking just a few seconds ago about uh, the issue for John McDonald and, and Brad Severs. Um, I like the analogy that he's using in the chat. You know, essentially a game crash is effective to an ECU issue for the car, which it's not wrong. I don't think it's far wrong at all um, for what he's describing. It's, it's a chip in a computer. It's a chip in an ECU. So therefore, it, it must be an ECU failure of some nature. Um, I actually like that comment so much, John. I'm actually going to give you a, uh, a very small Milwaukee uh, prize pack with thanks to Milwaukee. Nothing but heavy duty. I'll get something out uh, in the mail for you in the next couple of weeks. Um, just drop me a PM in the Discord with your address and I will send something on to you. That's the kind of comments we'd like to see. Some some smart comments, you know, a little bit of light heart. It's hard, you know, getting a something together at short notice to come in and race for Bathurst, but by the same token, um, you know, looking on the on the bright side of life, to quote Monty Python, and um, you know, staying, trying to stay positive, trying to stay upbeat, trying to stay happy, and um, a smart comment and a, uh, a very very you know, funny comment, I think, from my point of view as well. You know, make, trying to make the best of a bad situation. Exactly. No, it's, it's it's good to see. It's good to see like all the guys we've had in the chat, um, all the guys we've had in. Um, I do. I have actually saw very quickly early. I did actually see uh, Josh Watson in the chat who. Uh, 
claim to fame recently was basically doing a live play-by-play -play on the Kiwi action at Pukekohe, separate to what we were calling, uh, from what you can see in the live stream. And I do hope Josh is watching it today. Uh, I'd love to see some more uh, reports of what the Kiwis are up to, just in case we're not catching all of it. But, um, no, good to see some good interaction. And, um, no, it, it's, it's a good comparison. And, unfortunately, um, I think that's two on the trot for... Uh, it's not so much two on the trot for John, but it's two on the trot for John with early issues in a Bathurst race uh, last year. Um, he, well, actually, he and technically I, well, I being Brad, both missed the start. Um, John had uh, made the decision to go for a bathroom break two seconds before the end of the warm-up, <laughs> and that went about as well. You think it would go, um, and I think I think Brad ended up having some, you know, had some wheel issues and had to start for the pits. So uh, unfortunately. Um, it's come back to bite us again uh, this year. Um, but, uh, yeah, as I said, look, we looked out of late and, um, uh, look, outside of that, the team is, as itself, you know, we've, we've had a pretty good Dev Series campaign. It hasn't been a bad year all up, but we'll go to next year and obviously Adelaide first and get some stuff sorted. I think so. Looks like we're getting a few drivers are starting to wee tyres and get temperature into them because that's usually a signal that the game's told them that they're going back to green flag running so I expect when we get down to the chase everyone's going to be sort of line astern and we'll be getting ready for a restart here. So Dane Warren he kicked away at the front of the field quite easily got launched it off the line quite uh, sensibly and smartly and he had a good margin on the field after the the first couple of laps before the safety car was called so his lead has been all but wiped out but probably won't take too long for him to bring that back into uh, the realm where he likes it as the field starts to bunch up a little bit now for the restart. So at the restart here, Dane Warren from Termo, Lewis Wedding, Retton Foley's managed to make his way up to fourth place after all of that calamity. Steve Burko, followed by Ben Hall, Scott Stancliffe, Peter Thrower, Cam Rutledge and Steve Warwick, the top 10 as it sits right now. So we come down to the control line to restart the Bathurst 500 and he can go right now. Dane, Dane Warren and he does. Termo tries to go with him and then Lewis Wedding's now looking at an opportunity down here up the inside with Termo just fractionally off the mark at the restart there and Wedding's down the inside in a flash and he's got the job done but he's now got a whole position heading up mountain straight here because Termo's still over the left the other right rear quarter panel here and could potentially throw that car back up the inside. Pulling back into line now I think he knows that that job is pretty much not going to happen and he tucks back into the slipstream at car five and very smartly through Griffiths. Yeah, I was just looking in the background some of the movers and shakers. I see Ben Hall in the 237 Lockheed Lock Motorsports Commodore, uh, Commodore sorry, for, uh, Mustang. Mustang. Um, yeah, so I'm used to I'm used to Dev Series. Um, he's, he's, he was looking quite a quiet race already. He's up on the back of, uh, I believe that is Steve Burko, Burko in that car. Um, Burko, not a slow driver. We've seen him in the back end of the supercar season. Um, and I believe they'll be in the same chat channel as well, so they'll be trying to coordinate that in a way that doesn't uh, doesn't cause any tears. But um, no, really good start for uh, for Lewis Wedding actually in that one uh, as, as we played out, um, and he is the best of the rest with Dan Warren pushing out now to a second and a bit lead. Ben Holt, the wheel of the 237, just had a quick onboard with him. He looked like he was a little bit out of control at the restart here, just maybe tire temperature not up to where he needs it to be as he pursues Burko down the hill here. Burko with his own moment going through CRE Forest Elbow. Very nearly through the rear end of that uh, number 735 machine away. They've actually been having some issues in the warm-up session earlier on this morning in that car. They were just a little bit uh, upset and annoyed that the car didn't feel the same as it was throughout the whole entire week, yet they've made no changes. Here from the high shot, Hall having a look down the inside at the chase, and Burko left in the space. So fair driving and good play between the two of them to get through there with no, you know, really major room for error. But a very late minute lunge from Hall. He's now going to try the flip side of the argument and look down the inside at Murray's, and Burko's going to let him have it. So some smart driving there. Burko runs wide. He now coughs up a place to Scott Stancliffe. He's also probably going to cough one up here, I think, potentially to Peter Thrower, who's looking down the inside at Hell Corner as well with lockups happening ahead. So Burko... Oh, Thrower well, throws it away! Throws it away. He's in the trap. And another car around, around as well. So Burke as well. So there's two cars facing the wrong way here. So Thrower's one of them. Lockie Burke's the other. 
Can they get going? So Burke's gotten going. Thrower's just trying to extract himself from the travel trap here. So I think Burke might have been able to get going, and that's kept this race green. So everybody got through unscathed. It wasn't in a. It was in a little bit of a precarious spot. Everybody managed to avoid it. It wasn't like the previous incident up at Forest Elbow that we saw, where we had the machine of uh, Tim Redmond have any major have a major drama. Yeah, there I can see Burke in the background. There, I'm seeing Peter Thrower extracting himself on the replay here from the gravel trap. Burke actually sort of was facing in the in a direction where he didn't have to do too much to get back onto track. He was able to get away relatively unscathed. I think that one for him has probably just really caught him by surprise, I think, Brody. I think so. I did see something pop up in one of the chat channels. I'm, I'm not sure whether it was actually contact with another car or not, but yeah, that was yeah, it, it was a very odd one, actually. I think it was just, I think, I, I'm not sure whether, whether it is just the same case as before. I'm hearing actually more collisions down at the elbow. I think it might just be people clattering the inside wall trying to get passes done. Um, but no, as I was saying, um, I'm not sure if everyone's just in a in a I see you're suffering and I want to join you mood. But we saw this. Oh with no, we've got another Hayley car. Hall. We've actually got another car. It's Cuppet. It's Hayden Cuppet. I think it might have been having a bit of a scrape somewhere in the 185 machine. He's very slow out of the dip up, and Thrower, who was facing the wrong directions, rounded him up. So what happened to car 158? Just looking at the timing here to see if I can work out if they're going to get a second sector split or not. Uh, just waiting for the timing to update itself. I think their second sector split, yeah, is, um, well, it's not too bad, but it's still pretty poor because there was another couple of cars that had poor sectors. So, Luke, there might have been a collision maybe with Luke Yeager in the Kiwi Sim Sports underdeveloped entry because that car's got a 47.3 middle sector on this lap as well. So, I think maybe there's been a little bit of a coming together between these two. Let's see if Cupit, oh, sorry, it's Cupit, it's Cupid, not Cupit. Um, decides to pit, and the answer is yes, and I think maybe there is a little bit of damage on the 158 ignition sim racing car. Yeah, it's, it's not only possible just with the speed you're going through there, these possibly run a little deep, uh, a little fast over Skyline, down the S through the dip, and maybe it's just grab the wall there. We've seen a lot of guys do that IRL. It's very easy to do. You're, just, you're, you're pushing very hard through there, but it's, you, it's counterintuitively you want, to be, you want to be slow through that section because you need to get the car turned in and it's very easy to overspeed that section and grab the wall so that's possibly what's happened in which case there's a good chance he's maybe a puncture as a result which might explain why he's pitting. That's right. Well, here's something you don't see every day. The third place battle between Brent Foley and Termo is actually surprisingly closer than I would have expected considering Foley's experience behind the wheel in sim racing here in ASR and then Termo who's for a couple of years, did both development series and the Supercars main game. This year, transitioned just over to Supercars main game. He's actually doing a pretty good job of hanging on to the 046 machine. Yeah, he's, he's hipping on quite well. Um, so yeah, it, he's, he's doing a he's doing a really good job, Temo. Um, he's maybe not quite the year he wants for pace in the Supercars season. Obviously, he still managed to take home the team's title with Will Devonish, um, but and obviously running with Will Devonish today. But um, yeah, he hasn't quite been able to ascertain the pace that he's probably truly capable of this year in supercars. It just hasn't fallen his way the, the like as it goes this year. But look, it's a chance to reset the Enduro Cup. And um, look, they've, they've got a, 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 from my understanding, they've got a really good setup going around at CRE at the moment. And clearly it's doing the business. I know that um, Foley has been working on a setup himself. He had Premier Virgin Albert on Friday that uh, John McDonald and Brett Severs would have been running. Um, and uh, they have been doing some tweaks since then to really extract the most out of the car. Interestingly, Foley actually considers himself to be the B driver today, <laughs> despite being a supercars driver. But uh, the, I thought the other flip side of the coin is that um, he's had a lot to focus on this year as a driver, whereas uh, Boki, outside of the couple of first rounds of Dev Series, is able to focus solely oh, on the Enduro Cup. Big, um, big moment. Sorry, Rody. Big, big moment in the back there. I think that might have been... Was that Matt Cecil? or potentially, uh, or Darren Kemp. No, Matt Cecil, I think it was. Um, he'd just been passed by Bailey Hall, and he'd almost did a Peter Throw. He lit it up pretty comprehensively off the exit of the first turn. Had a big tank slapper. And he's dropped at least two spots there, if not three. I'm just counting. He's dropped two spots. He's dropped one to Justin Cecil, and he's also dropped one to Lockie Burke. So Burke has obviously pitted, um, and Cecil, I think, is still just circulating. I don't think he's been into the lane just yet. But that was actually quite an interesting battle. I was keeping an eye on it coming through the chase, and Paul put a really nice move on 
the number 23 Mustang heading into the chase. And then Matt Cecil in his haste to try and keep pace and Bailey Hall just unfortunately overstepped the mark a little bit, trying to, you know, just try and not lose too much time. A little bit of a shame there that that battle's come unstuck, but thankfully only the uh, couple of minor incidents so far. Most of the cars still circulate, except I, I do say that now, but it looks like we've lost another car from this race. NZ Snipes and Cheese look like they're out of it. Um, I, yeah, did, I, did, I, I did see I'm that they sure served their penalty, they, that they've no. obviously felt come out since. It was, it was, yeah, they would have come to serve their drive, so I'm not sure if it was internet or if it was game, but they were, um, the car was going full speed into the chase and just straight back to the garage, so uh, it could have been a runtime error like we saw for John Mc, uh, for, sorry, for Brad Severs. It could just be an internet problem. I know that they've, um, not see that car, but I know a few guys have had internet issues pop up a little bit recently. Uh, we did have a decent storm blow through here uh, last night through this morning, and maybe that's been on its way over to New Zealand and is blowing through for them. I don't know, but... Um, the end of the situation is that um, is that the Snipes and Cheese car is out, and that's a shame because they were running pretty well from memory at Phillip Island. So uh, it's a shame. It's 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 an early out. The, the advantage, I suppose, of an early out is that you don't have too much invested in the race itself, but uh, it's still not great. But uh, we should see them back that away. Absolutely. Change of position here as well. Burko going through on the Hall and Locky Lock Motorsport Mustang machine here on the way up to Griffins. Oh, Burko, so loose and just, he's got no confidence in the front end of that car at the moment. The car understeering well wide through the center. Oh, and is he, oh, never got a car in the fence. That's, oh, two cars in the fence. That was Stancliffe and Burko, basically. Burko going in in sympathy there. Cops the position straight back up. And I think it was Scott Stancliffe ahead. He was doing something similar. He, he must have just made a mistake, like similar things what Jamie Wincup did, although not as severe. Yeah, I think they've both probably come in a bit too fast to the corner. Brax, uh, sorry, Scott, just because he's, he's out there pushing, he's trying to make a gap. He's trying to probably rein in on the back of, um, probably trying to catch up with Corey McFarlane or maybe trying to push, maybe move further ahead for Turbo in terms of uh, a quality driver pace. Um, but yeah, just pushing a bit hard, ran a little wide. And Steve, obviously, he's probably a little fussed in his battle. He has now let Ben Hall through. He's now got Steve Warwick um, chasing him down. It's very little bit flustered, just trying to make up some tents here and there, some micro sectors, and just trying a little deep and a little harder corner as well. And the the way that corner is kind of almost cambered, there's a, there is a good berm to that corner, but once you're out on the high side of, the, of that corner, you're kind of stuck there for the rest of the corner until you get back to the end of it. Absolutely. It's a uh, interesting point you mentioned, Steve Warwick. It's a good opportunity for us to actually have a chat about what has gone on with this car in the last 48 hours or so. Uh, is he looking for a little bit of a dive here down the inside of Burko, who leaves him some room if he wanted to go through with it, but that's going to sort of compromise him a little bit on the exit here and make him vulnerable to Redmond, potentially at the last corner, who's going to have to go the long way around if he wants to make it happen, but thinks better of it. Probably some smart play there, looking for a crisscross on the other side and in position now for a move up the inside at Hell Corner and through goes the 430 machine recovering after that early damage and pit stop. But now coming back to Steve Warwick, actually he approached me yesterday afternoon, it was less than 24 hours ago, uh, and actually said that uh, Cuz Baron Whaler, who is his normal co-driver in these Enduros, had actually accidentally injured himself um, when loading some equipment into his van. He's a DJ, he does all sorts of things on the thing. Oh, as Warwick's very wide, he's given the fence a lick there. Um, but because it actually injured himself, um, actually it was an eye injury, more importantly. So probably the one thing you need in enduro is your eyesight because you've got to have your wits about you. And he'd been ordered by the doctor to rest, so he was, thankfully he's okay, but he needed to rest and was looking for a co-driver. One potentially popped up. That then unfortunately bore no fruit this morning. He actually bailed out of that one and had to uh, find another co-driver. So it looks like Darren Lochnan has very graciously picked up the baton and is going to run with Steve Warwick today. So we'll expect to see the uh, the Super 3 champion jumping aboard car 50 at some point in the day's proceedings. Yeah, adapting to running with that ABS might be a bit of a challenge for Darren. He has, look, it's available to us, and I think both of us have been pretty comfortable running it this year just to take a little, a little off our plate just so we can focus on the racing that we're doing with each other rather than controlling the car itself. But uh, yeah, no ABS, no touch control, not that he's used it in. Uh, it depends on whether Steve's been working on a setup as well and whether Darren's had access to that and is able to practice on that. I wouldn't be surprised right now if actually Darren's out there doing some laps in a single play session, just acclimatizing 
to running a, a supercar without assist around Bathurst. But look, he, he may not be doing breakneck pace, but look, Darren's going to give it a, a real honest go, the same way he has the entirety of Dev Series. And, and look, it's, it's really good for the community to get oh, behind Steve. We've got Wyatt. a yellow flag. Sorry, Lerody. We've got a yellow yep. flag. we got Lewis Wedding in the wall at the final corner. He's trying to extract that car out of the corner here. And oh, this is a real challenge for the has -beens machine here. Oh, and he's just managed to get it out at the last split second. I think just before they were about to call a safety car in race control. And he's dumped a bunch of spots in all of that. So that's he, they were running second. And he's gone off the road. He's now just got one back because there goes the Ignition Sim Racing 85. But that's a really strange incident for the has-been machine. What a, did he just lock a brake? That's the only thing I'm going to be interested in finding out. We're going to have to wind this one back on the replay and have a look. Did he actually just lock a brake coming into the last turn? Oh, it, it's easy enough to do there. I'm not sure whether it would be a front or rear, but um, easy enough to do. Front. Um, and it, lo I should, it looks like it's a rear. Um, the car just it, it's ploughed on. It doesn't look like he hit the wall with any huge impact. That's the important bit. The, the main problem is extracting it out of the kitty litter. So he's managed to get it done. And oh, I only just sort of cut to it and saw it at the last minute, just as we were watching the battle with those coming around the corner. And then Redmond, look at Redmond arrive on the scene with Burko right there. And did a very good job to avoid that car that was trying to get back onto the track. Yeah, I've just, uh, just uh, putting this in the chat, I've just noticed there's a bit of a developing story. It is at the back end of the grid, but uh, I'm, I'm just checking whether it's still a situation at the moment. But I'm led to believe that one of the teams did actually attempt to drive a swap and it didn't work out, with the end result being that neither of them is currently driving their car. Yeah, I'm reading that in the live chat as well. That's one of the... Uh, it's the, it's the, the number 158 machine, I think. It was a cup and... Um, so Cupid and Felipe, I think, is what I'm seeing on the thing as well. That they believe it's in the hands of an AI. I mean, the last lap that it did was a, a two minute 14, which is sort of, um, it, it makes sense when you think about it from a lap time point of view. I'm actually just having a look server side at the moment. And uh, according to me, it actually still says that Cupid's got a, uh, a ping. So, that does it, that part of the of the equation doesn't correlate, but mm. the the lap time does. That's a bit we're going to be interested in. Oh, and to make matters worse, to make matters worse for the has beens car, they've tried to come in for a pit stop, and they've skated through. Oh no! So they've actually that got to go the long way around here. Now the, uh, they're they're off the circuit. They're in a spot where they're not going to trigger the car, but oh, they're having all sorts of issues trying to get that car into the lane. They've finally got it in again. Time for a bit of a look on the replay here to see what's going on. Here they are approaching the lane here. I'm wondering if that damage is just... Oh, they got themselves on the grass. That was the problem. That was the problem. They tried to bite off a little bit more than they could chew coming in for a stop. And that's the end of that. In actual fact, I've now just seen that it looks like the uh, potentially that the Ignition Sim Racing Machine has actually, uh, the one that we were just talking to, has effectively non uh, uh, finished, uh, out is, uh, is out of this race. And so too, it looks like there's been a, a driver swap issue potentially for Steve Warwick and Darren Lochnan. So I don't know what's gone on there. So car 50 also looks like it might be out of this race as well. So something else is, is some swings and roundabouts in this one. Yeah, to, uh, oh, actually, that's that, yeah, so it looks like that's gone wrong. A shame for them, actually, and something I did notice, actually, just running back through, is to notice what happened to the ISR car. I wasn't sure whether somebody had got in and fixed that or not. Uh, it turns out, actually, and this is going to be a tricky one to look at, because they weren't potentially in the current control of the car at the time, but they were being lapped by the race leader, currently Dane Warren, in the wildcard car. Um, if it was AI, it might explain it, because there was not much room given or no room given for Dane at the top of the mountain. He ended up backwards after running into the back of the 158 car that was essentially a sitting duck at Skyline. Um, and uh, look, that's that's uh, that's that's just really, really, I'm going to say really shit luck for both the wildcard car to come across an AI car and for the 158 guys to end up with an AI in the car. That's not the intended way anyone does a pit stop. You don't, you don't, you don't want to throw an AI in the car because of other things. They don't know how. They don't know when to pit for fuel and tyres, no. so they'll keep running until the car dies. Which is entire. Which, to be fair, 
is entirely possible for what's happened depending on if they picked up fuel and tyres in that most recent stop where they tried to swap drivers. That, I don't know. Yeah, that's the part we don't know. We'll have to we'll have to look at that one, I think, after the fact and we'll get some details on that one. We've got our first driver change though. So despite all the adversity that Car 5 has faced, they actually have gotten into the pit lane and we've got our first driver swap. So Brendan Ross has taken over from Lewis Wedding at the end of lap 12. So that's our first... Uh, proper driver swap in the equation so if you're playing along at home that was at the end of lap 12 and let's see how far Ross goes into this race now I think their hand was probably forced I think in that one roadie that part I think is pretty clear that their hand was forced when it came to uh, in the in the pits and all the damage that they had. I believe our race leaders potentially come in as well and the answer they to that is have, yes. yes so there's a driver swap that's gone on there as well between Dame Warren and Kurt Stenberg. Now, he's now 10th in the running order, right up behind Justin Cecil, and gives him a bit of room going up and over the top here through Sulman Park. And now down through McPhillamy Park and on towards Skyline. So when did they come in? Did they come in on the same lap? I think uh, it looks like Kurt's taken over at the beginning of lap 14. So for the Triple Eight machine, that means Dane Warren has completed the first 13 laps. Yeah, it, it would have been the last lap through, probably as a result of the contact with the 158. Um, it would have definitely been a bit of aero damage, if nothing else. Um, and uh, look, to be fair, they probably don't need to have 100% car beneath them, but with any one look, it, it's just it's just more beneficial to have just the car in tip-top position, uh, tip-top condition, so that you can do what you're, you know, what you're best at best. Um, so Kurt's now in that car. He's going to be starting to push through the field. Um, his next challenge is Greg Tara, but I'm not sure if Tara is not far pissed off either. Um, from there, it's then Lockie Burke in a car a bit further up the road. Yep, I've also got some word through as well that Braxton Stancliffe has taken over from his father in the 187 machine. That was at the end of lap 13. So car 187 also has made a driver a swap. Um, and that, uh, it's interesting now just seeing how a few drivers are starting to play this one out, Rody, because we looked at the safety car and we thought, well, you, the longest your pit window can go with a full tank of green flag running is going to be about 12 to 13 laps, and that was based on last year's running. We're now seeing a few drivers opt to pull the trigger around lap 13. So realistically, the safety car, even though it was three laps long, hasn't probably given a couple of them as much of a free kick as they were planning to, or they're just deciding to try and just stick to some sort of strategy so they make it easy for themselves. You can see another car, two cars in the lane, in fact, as well at the moment. There's the 26, which is the Flinders Autosport machine of Greg and Noah Tara, and also the 915 belonging to Cam Rutledge and uh, Daniel Cox. Now, I don't believe, no, there isn't. There's no driver change in either of those two cars. Yeah, so I imagine a couple of drivers, we mentioned a few strategies that were playing out that were looking like uh, just essentially get all of A drivers' laps done and all the B drivers' laps done. We might be a similar thing, a similar position happening with a couple of these cars that have just come through the pits. Uh, Cam obviously still behind the wheel of the 915. Probably, again, probably even pegging with with um, with Cox in terms of driver pace and experience. Probably a bit more experience goes Cam's way, maybe a little more pace goes Cox's way, but they're probably not too different over a lap time that they would consider waiting one driver over the other. Um, but they're probably just at a point where, yeah, we'll just run Cam until Cam's done, and then they'll probably put Cox in for the back half of the race. I'm also seeing as well Phil Boke's gotten into the 046 machine at some point or another as well. So I'm going to have a look to see what lap they came in and did that particular swap. Speaking of Cam Rutledge, that. How's this for dedication, Rody? I got a message about an hour before the race today saying there's been a blackout at his place and he was in the process of hooking a generator up <laughs> so he could race. He is an electrician himself, so he knows what to do and I'm sure he's got all those goodies that are ready to go. And then 20 minutes before the race started, he said the power's back on. Um, his mate at, uh, the, at the power company was telling him it was going on. The power's back on, but he was going to stay on the generator because he didn't want to risk it. How's that for <laughs> commitment? No, that's like, we've seen that with a few drivers in various forms over the last couple of years. I know that um, I think uh, Brenton Foley and Will Devonish both in 2019 started the season off on hotspots because uh, their Wi-Fi wasn't great. And then I think in the end, the Wi-Fi did actually come through in the end because the hotspots were throwing trouble at them. 
Uh, just noticing, actually noticing a bit of, I think it's a bit of, actually a bit of racing happening in the field, actually, over the guys in, so 5th, 6th, 7th, actually, no, that's a cluster of cars all pitting. Yeah, it um, is a cluster so of cars pitting. So Higginson, here we go. So there's been a driver change there at 4.30. So Higginson leaving the lane at the end, at the beginning of lap 16. So Redmond has managed to do 15 laps on the opening stint for... Uh, for that particular car. Who else was in the lane there as well? Because there's possibly a few other uh, drivers that we need to be keeping an eye out for here. Uh, I think Bailey Hall has jumped out of the 38, is now Mark Davey behind the wheel. So this will be his, uh, actually, I don't think, I think it is actually his first lap yep, in a supercar. It is. Outside of, outside of, as I said, he did try to wildcard on Friday, but he DNF'd uh, on the formation lap. So this is actually his first racing laps in a supercar at Bathurst. So good luck to Sticks. Um, we also did have, I believe, um, Justin Cecil might have been in the lane. I know Hans Brunswick uh, was in the lane at one point as well, as so we saw him get into the uh, the triple one. Yeah. Um, but there's a few guys through the pits there. Nothing was another one we mentioned as well. Um, but uh, far yeah, in now as well. So there's a little Farland, bit of yeah. activity here. So this is the longest anybody's been able to go. They've been able to chalk up 16 laps. So this is lap 17 or well, the beginning of lap 17 for car 55. The question will be, do we see Luke Rosella get aboard? And you're right on the other side of the equation. Hans Brunswick has gotten into car triple one at some point in the last couple of laps as well. So we'll go and have a look here and see uh, how things are going there. Well, with regards to McFarlane, we do actually expect that McFarlane's going to stay in that car uh, because, of course, we've alluded to it already, the, uh, the issues that they have had over the course of time and the answer to that is yes I can see on the other side now that McFarlane is staying in the car so Brunswick is has got in after 15 laps for Burke so it seems to be that a few drivers are starting to take their first driver swaps with about 14 15 16 laps on the board which again still slightly short of you know even halfway towards that minimum 33 lap requirement yeah, it's interesting how some of the things are played out through the pit stops and some of the drivers swapping and not swapping. We did see Foley in his stint get past Termo and actually a good battle, and now it's going the other way around. Uh, Boki trying to hold off Termo, but he has just let Termo through at turn two, but no. Uh, over under Oh, we've got a car in the wall. We've got a car in the wall. We've got a car in the wall. Yep. I'm pretty sure it was Bailey Hall. I'm just keeping an eye on things. He's had, he had a moment in the wall and came across a few cars there. And, so not Bailey Hall, sorry, it would have been Mark Davey. I think he's done essentially what Lewis Wedding may have done here. Just gone a little bit too deep, the final corner. Did he? Or did he? No, he's gone opposite way. Tank slapper. Oh, he's given the wall quite a nudge there. And he was in the right spot. Oh, and this is going to... Oh, and there's another car off in sympathy. That, yeah, was, that was Cam Rutledge. Cam Rutledge. And then, look at this here. Oh, no, that's going to be terrible. And great evasive action by Zatara and Cecil to get out of that one. So that's going to be a little bit of an insult. I think that's going to have to be looked at post-race because that's, technically, that's an unsafe re-entry into the track. Yeah. And I think the car's got some damage as well. It's gone understeering wide at the cutting and kept it out of the wall, thankfully. But baptism of fire here for Sticks. Absolutely, no. He, he, he's been quite keen to get into a supercar. Uh, he's been running mostly Rookie Cup so far this year, but the Rookie Cup cars are set up pretty well to prepare one for driving a supercar. They are essentially a supercar with, with full-blown assists on. Um, so, look, it's it, you're right. Baptism of Fire, probably, it's probably, like, probably ultimately just putting a bit too much pressure on himself at this point. He, I think he's got Bailey in the chat. Obviously, his co-driver. I think Darren is actually in there as well, just you know, trying to help him along. Um, Darren and Mark know each other from from way back uh, from the league that I I met them and brought them over from. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, he just he just needs to just needs to focus. He needs to just just close out all the external noise and just focus on driving the car and just getting a stint under his belt. Uh, yeah. He can go from there. I think so. Back to this little entertaining battle, Phil Boak and Termo. So Brent Foley had a bit of a crack on the back of the number 15 five minutes racing Commodore throughout the first stint. Couldn't get past. Phil Boak now in the catbird seat chasing down the same machine. Hasn't been able to strike a move just yet, but I get the impression that he's probably just thinking about staying right where they are, just stay with these drivers, and then when Will Devonish potentially gets into the car a bit later on, just seeing if they can use Will to drag them up to the, the next car up the field, which of course is going to be Corey McFarlane and Luke Rosella. But that'll be a bit of a tall task, 
by the time we get towards the back end of this race. Yeah, like 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 you you wouldn't enter a race if you didn't at least have aspirations of winning or of getting a, a personal best at some point. Um, but uh, realistically, where we sort of penciled off the challenges for the 15 car, um, we actually didn't put the car behind them in in the frame of reference coming into the weekend. And look, Boki as the the A driver from what Foley's told us is doing a good job. Uh, Bo, uh, Foley as the B driver also doing a very excellent job, and look, they've kept out of trouble so far, which is what's helping them out. Um, the, the other cars we really thought would be competition is Higginson and Redmond, and they've not had the best start, but they're still trucking along. And the other one being the Pixel Sim Sports car of um, uh, not pick, Ross Not, not and Pixel Wedding. Sim Sports, you've got to remember too. Uh, sorry, That's a slightly sorry, different sorry. now. Pixels, <laughs> sorry, there, ha there has been for the injury. There has been this car. Run because there's probably some deep lore in, in how all that plays out. But yeah, uh, they're, they're the other sort of really big competition. The other one as well, actually, um, the, the AAR Mustangs. Um, obviously, the, the, the prime one is is up the road and will probably stay up the road, but really on pace. We saw them last year. We talked about them yesterday. They were the dark horse. They were the underdog last year in the Enduro Cup. Um, I, I would be I would not be surprised at some point if in this sort of lead three, four, five, six battle that somewhere in this at some point today, might not be soon, but at some point today, I would not be surprised if Lockie Burke or Hans Brunswick are playing into it as well. I think so too. I'm, I'd be interested just to see how they compare at the back end of this race as well and if they try and factor themselves into the equation a bit later on in the piece. You mentioned Higginson and Redmond a few moments ago, the current points leaders coming into the Bathurst 500. You're right, they're trucking along. They started eighth. They're currently in seventh. They did have that early incident which triggered the safety car. So they are missing the bonnet on car number 430. But they are chasing down the 237 machine currently piloted by Ben Hall. So they've been in for a stop, but they haven't changed drivers just yet. So for Higginson, he's no stranger to tackling the supercars or the development series with Ben Hall, uh, one of his adversaries in the early season running before Ben stepped away from things and sort of focused on the Enduros. And he caught him very quickly coming out of the cutting there as well. So I'm just wondering if Hall's just starting to struggle a little bit here as they head up through Reed Park, Sulman Park, now on to McPhillamy Park, and then they'll get ready to start heading down the hill from Skyline through the S's. There's a one-line groove down through here. You've got to be very, very careful. Don't graze the wall. Higginson's getting mighty close to the back of that 237 Mustang heading down through the dip up. And now onto the elbow. Does he look to pull the move? Thinks about it. He pulls the move. He pulls the trigger. He gets it done. Hall leaves him the space. So smart heads up dri driving from both of them there, leaving the gap, realizing, or going for the gap, realizing the move was on, and then not making any contact. But Hall's not going to make this easy for him. He's going to force Higginson to stay narrow for the chase. They come side by side, approaching 300 Ks. They're probably doing about 290 ish by the time they get to the turn in point. Hall has another look at a reset here. Higginson's got to leave him some room, and there's a little bit of contact here as they go through the chase. And this is now allowing Brunswick to play catch-up, the car that you were just talking about about three or four minutes ago, Rody, starting to play themselves into the equation. This is costing not only Higginson and Redmond and Hall and lock time, but it's actually give, it's given time hand over fist to Brunswick. He's right there now. Yeah, so he's playing this as well. There's definitely, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say there's a big rivalry going on between Hall and Higginson as Hall nearly spins it off the corner. Um, but if, crucially, these guys were said to have a tectonic battle uh, at this point, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, up until this point of the year with Dev Series. Hall has unfortunately had five step in through most of the year and he's missed a chance to fight for title this year. He will be making a run in supercars only next year based on the pace he has shown. So he's missed a chance to battle with Higginson this year, but this is really just trying to get back some of that lost time. And look, um, look, on, on pace, you know, the Higginson and, and Redmond car should be a lot further forward. But uh, as it sits now, Paul is there on track. Paul is entitled to race them, and he is. And look, if he's going to race them, he's going to pass them. He's, he's going to do it pretty comfortably because at this point, yeah, he is slowing them both down. He is bringing Brunswick into the mix. And look, Bathurst is a narrow track. You can kind of get too wide in places, but you wouldn't want to try going three wide. No, definitely not. And importantly for Hall, he defended pretty well there, heading up the, up the mountain straight towards turn two and it's held position for the moment, but he's a little bit loose and a little bit out of control there. And Brunswick smells blood in the water like a shark, and he's honing in on the back again of the 237. Oh, Hall, I reckon he pinballed off a wall there for a moment as well. He's very, very sideways through the dipper, 
And this is all music to Hans Brunswick's ears right now. He's just got to get a good run off the elbow here, and then he'll have a stab down into the chase. Higginson's going to try and kick away here. He's doing his best. He's got that margin out to about a half a second, but at the moment, not quite enough. He needs to be making good inroads while Hall is occupied with the Triple One All Australian Races Mustang. Oh, late switch. Late switch by Brunswick. He thought about setting up the inside, but he was a little bit too late to make the switch happen. But I like the thinking, and it's distracting. He's trying to distract Hall into a mistake here. And this is now where the nibble's got to be. He's got to go down the inside if Hall doesn't defend it. Now he's going to say, well, use the outside here. But that's getting a little bit too close for comfort as the switch back on. I think it will be. Look, look Hall's running very defensively right now, and it's actually impacting his run off the corner, his ability to make speed out of the car. He's got a really good setup on that car. It's looking like a really well-trimmed car. It is just stepping into oversteer as he's pushing it, though. Uh, which you can catch, but it's definitely slowing down. You can see just run off the corner as well, just a, bit of, a little bit of wheel spin. He has now got through Hans Brunswick. He's really going to probably hold him off for another corner, if that. Ben is going to probably try and have another look at this, the way I can see he's moving that car around. But um, otherwise, you know, if Hans can survive uh, the next couple of corners, and the, he looks like he will actually Ben Hall, a bit of a slide on the way into the corner, which is going to slow him down a little more. Um, Hans Brunswick is pretty safe. His next battle then is going to be Nathan Higginson. And for Ben, his next battle will be... Uh, either um, Brennan Ross or Steve Burko, who are both closing in now from behind. Yeah, they're starting to play catch up here as well with Ross and Burko. They're, they're again doing the same sort of thing that Brunswick just did to Hall. They've smelt that the 237 machine is a little bit out of control and not quite fine tuned enough for the mountain at this stage of the race, and they need to put in some good laps. Last time around, Ross with an 8 2. Burko with a 9.7 and then relative to Brunswick and Hall, they're both in the high eights. So they can keep, if uh, Ross can keep that sort of pace up, he'll be on the back of the 237 machine in a couple of laps. It was just starting to emerge in the back of shot there uh, as we were heading up towards the cutting. Well, after his incident with the wall cam, Rutledge has now found himself occupied with uh, Justin Cecil. So he's been in for a stop, but he hasn't changed drivers yet. Neither has Cam Rutledge. So Daniel Cox is still waiting to get aboard the 915 machine. We're past the 25% distance mark of this race now. So it's a bit of an opportunity for us to, I guess, throw out our first, uh, I won't say poll for the day, but throw out our first question for the day. And let's see... Um, what sort of answers we get. This is going to be a closest to pin argument. So we've got a funny feeling we know... Oh, it's, it might, oh I was about to say, we might have to pause that briefly for a minute <laughs> as Cecil hit the wall heading down towards the elbow. We'll call this a closest to pin. We know who's going to probably be at the pointy end of the field with regards to Dane Warren, Kurt Stenberg and Luke Rosella and Corey McFarlane. So those are the top two positions that we're expecting are going to be filled in the end of the race. The question that I want to pose here is not who's going to finish third. I'm going to throw this out and say, who's going to finish fifth? Which car number? So I want the closest to pin for fifth place. So if you say, let's say, for example, you say it's right now, you know, Scott and Braxton Stancliffe, and you're right, you'll win the prize. But if they finish sixth and nobody else gets closest to pin for fifth and you're that one, then you'll be the one that gets the prize still anyway for being closest to pin. So in the live chat, Throughout the next, I'll give you until lap 40. So that's plenty of time. That's another, that's probably going to be a better part of another full 45 minutes. So in the live chat, who is going to be finishing in fifth place by the end of this race, closest to pin, and you'll win a prize pack courtesy of Penrite, a better class of oil. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. And the way this plays out, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I see there being, being probably four or five cars that maybe expect to play into that battle. But the question is, who's going to fall out where? I mean, look, based on sort of pace and where they're sitting, look, at, at this point, you might be leaning someone like maybe maybe a, a Ross and a Lewis that, look, they've had a, a pretty average start for the race, unfortunately. You know, they, might, they may not come back, but they're just as easily... Um, will be coming back uh, as well and all, all it takes is, is a well-placed safety car or just some really solid driving and look look those guys have have, have had a bit of a troublesome season in supercars um and, but uh look you know when they needed to they've able to put the pace together i've just actually you know slipping down the timing order at the moment uh, greg tara has just dnf as well oh dear so that's another drama because remember last year in i uh, was it last year sorry in 2020 in the 500 uh, they dnf with only a couple of laps to go 
as well. So that was a bit of a, a heartbreak for them as well. So something's not quite right for the Taras. I'm wondering if that's a, rem, a reoccurrence of their uh, their internet dramas in the Adelaide Hills they've had from time to time. But it's been a while since the Taras have had that sort of a failure. I, I think it's entirely possible, just looking at it, uh, that uh, looking at the run down is DNF at the run, uh, just at the exit of the second corner at Griffin's Bend. I think it's possible. I haven't got the puddle of effects on because I need to make it through the, the day without crashing. But I think it's entirely possible that Tara's blown the engine on the downshift into turn uh, two. That's not a great thing that we'll do as well because Tara had some redemption that he sort of had to go for because he was very apologetic to his son as we see Brendan Ross now go through on Ben Hall at Griffin's and Ben trying to do his best to hang on to the Mustang with a bit of sideways action. Yeah, he was very apologetic after what he did at uh, Phillip Island a couple of weeks ago and sort of felt like he put Tara, uh, sorry, put Noah Tara on the back foot for the better part of that race in their run to ninth place finish. But they've had a drama here at Bathurst. Well, their attention is now going to turn, I guess, over to doing the best job they possibly can for their home race, which is the last round of the Enduro Cup at Adelaide in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, so look, and that's going to be a big round for them as well. Yeah, yeah it's an absolutely home round. Um, you know, there'll probably some big good, good, good family sport on the stream. I know um, they've run previously under the Lone Wolf and Cubs name. Um, Lone Wolf, uh, obviously referencing to the fact that um, that, uh, that that Greg is the the lone adult driver or the lone parent driver in the team. Um, Cubs meaning that we could, I don't know, we could maybe see another one of the Taras pop up at some point in in ASR, but at the moment we do just have Noah. Um, but no, that's going to be a big home round for them. Um, and yeah, I expect to see that they're going to try and blow all the stops for that final round. Yeah, I think so too. They've, you know, historically, and I think Matt Cecil sort of said it in a live chat, I was just about to type in as a response here, but um, I'll say it in the live stream. Um, they're great GT3 drivers, those two. They really enjoy the GT3 machinery. Oh, I think we've got, uh, or oh, Sticks is around again. He's gone around at the cut, at, uh, on the exit of the cutting and sort of in a bit of a precarious spot here, but he's done an all right job. It looks like he did that all on his own. And manages to cop up. Oh, the car's a bit loose. So the car's going to hit the fence here, and they're going to be a little bit slow, I think, heading down the hill here. Are there any cars in the vicinity that are catching up to them? I think uh, the Damo and Luke Yeager, uh, Kiwi Sim Sports, underdeveloped squad entry is the next car in the queue. But... This stint for Mark Davies sort of going from, once they're going from bad to worse, but this is becoming a very challenging stint for the 38 machine. Now, I think for Bailey Hall, he's probably got, as the primary driver, Rody, he's got a decision to make about whether he pulls David or Mark in and settles him down or whether he tries to just get the minimum laps out the way and then just start praying that he's got to get like some sort of a safety car or something a bit further down the train where they can get back onto the lead lap. Yeah, it's, it's a tough decision to make. It, like having seat time in the car will, by nature, as long as you as long as you can keep it out of the fence, it will it will set you up. I have seen the pit the pit cog come up, so I think they might be playing a stop of some form on this lap. But uh, look, it's you can make arguments both ways. You you bring the driver in, you sit them down, you know, in the ice bucket, you let them chill down for a little bit, you know, you, or you send them to to Murph's toilet for five minutes to just to, just to chill off. Um, but uh, there's also the argument that you leave them in the car just to try and get situated and to get stable and to get so happy in the car. Um, we're going to see in about 30 he's seconds pits. what decision's been made. Yeah, he's so. in the pits right now, so we'll keep an eye on that one on the other side of the uh, on the other side of the screen while we keep an eye on some of the other battles unfolding here at the moment. There's going to be a coming together, I think, in the next few moments or so because Boke has dropped off the back of Termo quite comprehensively over the last couple of laps or so. You've got. Nathan Higginson closing in on the back of Braxton Stancliffe here. You've got Brunswick closing in on the back of him. And then you've got Brendan Ross, who's coming like a freight train at the moment. Actually, Braxton pulls the pin. He goes for the pits. So too, Brendan Ross. Oh, well, that just blows that theory out of the water. <laughs> um, I was about to say, there's going to be a five-car situation about to happen very, very shortly when all of this was about to go on. So for the moment, Boak now gets a bit of a reprieve for a few seconds. Um, and then Higginson's now left to deal with the rampaging triple one of Brunswick. Yeah, it's, and that said, like, Boki is still there. Boki actually trailed through the grass out of the run, out of the chase that time through, and actually I did get a message from uh, Foley earlier in the race, would have probably been when I was talking about um, setups, that uh, in, in classic PBF fashion, they decided last minute to just go back to last year's setup. Um, 
despite all the work that was put into this year's setup. But from memory, last year's car wasn't too terrible either, but that maybe explains some of the traditional PBF characteristics we might be seeing in some of the cars. That said, I don't think uh, as the years have gone by that we've really changed setups so much. We'd like to have a steering car as, um, as Vokey nearly does a reverse entry drift into the turn before the before going under the tree. Um, but no, he's in a good stead right now. He's, he's got a you know pretty healthy gap uh, from third place, being Temo, who's, who's processed him and is off running his own race. Um, he's got Hans Brunswick and Ethan Higginson behind him, but he's probably got a bit of time and he might luck out with where they're going to catch him just based on the way, they, the way they're gaining, that he might be able to do this, uh, do this passing or do this race in a slightly more straightforward section of the track. You don't want to be trying to deal with two faster cars that are trying to race each other at the same time um, when you go over the top of the mountain. Absolutely. I mean, I'm just actually having a look here as well. There's been a couple of driver changes for some cars that came into pit lane. Lewis Wedding's got back aboard the number five machine, and so too Scott Stancliffe. He's got back aboard the 187. There's actually been a change in the pit lane as well, because Braxton and Scott Stancliffe were actually sharing with Mark Davey and uh, Bailey Hall, and they couldn't get into the pit box side by side when they came in, so that's a little bit of a, a, uh, a bad decision for those guys to come in because it's cost them a heap of track position with uh, Wedding make and Rossi making the change as well. So for Brendan Ross, that's only a 10 lap stint, which is a little bit of a head scratch up. And same for Braxton Stancliffe, there's a 10 lap sort of stint in there as well. So we're gonna start to I'm figure this one, we have to start to unravel a little bit this now as we keep an eye out for who's doing what. And here goes Brunswick down the inside of Phil Boak at turn one at the beginning of lap 26. So he's now moved the triple one machine up into third place on the road. What that probably does for, uh, for the has-beens car is it puts Ross in position where he's comfortably within a, a pretty, almost a two-stop, uh, two-stint window um, to, to come back. Um, they're just being dominant on the chat, continuing to fire off the, the, the zingers. Mm -hmm. uh, Lewis is in for his redemption stint, um, which Oh, look, yeah, that can come at any point. The race doesn't have to come right now, but look, you know, th they've got a bit of work to do. They're not the only car in that position, though. Um, you know, uh, Nathan Higginson and Tim Redmond are going to make some moves as well. I'm seeing Higginson in the back of this three-car battle for third. He's getting a little bit sideways. I'm not sure whether it's the tyre life or whether it's just um, maybe Higginson dipping into the old Higginson. Um, but, uh, yeah, they've got a bit of work to do as well. But, yeah, Lewis Wedding is back in that car. And also, we did see coming through the lane recently enough as well, um, Dane Warren is now back in the guest car. They are currently sitting sixth on the road, so they'll actually be catching this battle in probably a lap or so. But Dane will be putting in some pretty breakneck pace as well. Kato, pretty good stint. We didn't actually see much of that car, but uh, they've been comfortably out in the lead. Um, the only sort of real hiccup for them today so far has been the potential AI lap car incident that uh, happened with the 158, but otherwise pretty smooth running for them today. Yeah, absolutely. So they're in sixth place at the moment after the pit stop and change over to Dane Warren. So for Kurt Stenberg, that was an 11-lap stint for him, which is a little bit short of the uh, the money. It was about 12-lap stints last year when we had uh, did all the math earlier on in the piece. When you do the math as well, Rody, and you sort of look at it, even if you break it into 12 lap segments, you know, stopping every 12 laps at 12, 24, 36, 48, 60, 72, you're going to, you know, that'll get you to, you know, the end of the race quite comfortably, you know, in terms of your, your windows, because it is an 81 lap race. So you can do it on six, but I think a few people will have it in the back of their minds whether or not they could push it to be a little bit more and a little bit longer than what uh, the, the 12 lap is, like we said before. With the safety car, we were probably expecting to see a few people extend as much as they possibly could. So that's what Redmond and uh, Bailey Hall did, and also for Lockie Burke, they got themselves out to lap 15. Granted, a couple of them came in and topped off throughout the course of the, uh, the safety car period as well. So there'll be a few little things there. Oh, we've got a car that's lost a wheel. We've got a car that's lost a wheel. That's the Luke Jaeger machine that's just coming down towards the pits now. Now, I don't know if they're going to be able to put a wheel back on that car. I'm not sure how the game works with regards to that sort of thing, Rody. But uh, we might have to go back and have a bit of a look and see how on earth this car has lost its wheel. It's lost it really early. It's actually missing the wheel coming down to the chase. So I don't know where they've lost this wheel. Somewhere across the top of the mountain. Oh, I've, I've gone back there. It's, it's going to be just after Skyline. Uh, wow, so they've done happened. half a lap. They've done half yeah. a lap without a wheel. But, uh, yeah, run a little deep in at Skyline. Uh, a common place to run. We saw uh, a couple cars go through there already. 
just ran a little deep and just the luck of the draw, the way they hit that wall has just torn a, the front left corner off of the Emirates back to Kiwi Simpsons underdevelopment team entry. Um, look, he's made it back to the pits and credit there, but he's not going to be able to get that repaired uh, from my understanding of the crash damage. Um, that said, if that car does move again, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be proved otherwise. But um, yeah, that, that's a pretty almighty hit. And look, regardless, although even if he is out for wheel damage, he was lucky to also blow an engine doing that because that's a pretty decent hit. Yeah, so we'll have to wait and see how that uh, comes into play here. We're just keeping an eye on the pit lane with uh, one of the cameras at the moment just so we can get an, an understanding of what's going on with that car. I believe there's also been a driver change aboard the, uh, the Darren Kemp and Matt Cecil machine that's on the screen at the moment there as well. So a few of the youngsters are starting to, to make a couple of mistakes. I guess that was the whole point of the, the de underdevelopment squad is that's their first sort of proper hit out in these sorts of things. And they're bound to make a couple of mistakes. And a lot of drivers are in this just for the fun of it, just to enjoy themselves and see what they can do and run with somebody else. I'm actually seeing, I, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm wise, am I as deceiving? Yeah, they have been able to repair that car. So yeah. there you go. They've got it out. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something I haven't seen in a while. I wasn't no. understanding. It depends on, might depend on the damage set up in the original model, what it is. I know I've torn wheels off before and I haven't had the same luck, but uh, look, it might just be the way things are set up. But look, crucially for them, the important bit is they're back in this race. They are going to be a few laps down, um, but look, they're still in this race. So, you know, they can keep keep pushing on. But uh, look, now the I think now that uh, now that Luke's made that mistake, he's once bitten twice. He won't be charging into uh, into the S's, into the into the uh, into the Dipper quite so fast for the next few laps. No, well, that's actually well, it's a driver change as well now, isn't it? So with uh, with Damo, who's actually the more experienced campaigner out of the two of them, um, managing to come in and you know bring the car back to the lane. So that's probably pretty smart for them. And he's now at the beginning of, uh, well, they're now at the beginning of lap 26 for them because they are, of course, a, uh, they're now two laps down on the field. The only car that's currently two laps down. Um, other cars are a lap down so far. You've got the likes of uh, Mark Davey, who we saw a few moments ago on the screen. You've got uh, Darren Kemp, Ryan Cox, Peter Throw, and Camp Rutledge there. The car's lap down. Justin Cecil is about to go a lap down while he's in the pits. I believe we've got the, uh, well, currently the race leader, Corey McFarlane, was in the pits as well. Dane Warren will reassume the lead of the race when they get back up and running in a few moments' time. I'm actually just waiting to see if car t uh, 21 is going to undertake its first driver change, and it does. So, Taipan into the number 21 machine for the first time this afternoon. Yeah, and that will hand the lead back, as you mentioned, to Dane Warren. Uh, Corey is another one that's been out there just having a really quiet run, as we mentioned. He's going to be running a triple stint, um, and he's just fallen back in. Now, actually, he's, he's made up quite a bit of ground on... Oh, the car, um, the Redmond cars are around again. The Tim Redmond cars are around again at the top of the hill, and I didn't quite see what happened there, but uh, this car's has certainly been in the wars today. Let's see if we can get an idea of what happened. So it looks like he was coming up through Reed Park. Has he hit a wall or has he just gotten out of control a little bit here through Metal Grate? And well, that's a most unusual incident. Didn't hit the kerb at all. Oh, jeez. How's the reaction yeah. from... Was that Burko? That was Dane Licardo. That was Licardo. How's the reaction from Licardo? Great situational awareness. I think the most he would have got was a, was a yellow flag telling him where to stop, and uh, like you know, a lot of drivers have have have, uh, have learnt that yellow flags do actually mean something after Gold Coast. Dame wasn't there for it personally, but he, but he was he was a witness to the whole thing. Uh, I think that probably helped him as well, but also just some really good judgment, just able to able to in that moment just track right. There's a car. This is where it's angled. This is what it's doing. This is the safest way to go around it because he could have jerked the other way, thinking the car was going to come across, and he would have smacked, smacked. He would he would have mean hard into the side of the Kiwi Simsports car and probably would have put both cars out. So, um, look, credit to Tim uh, for not for so much for the spin, but he once he spun, he sat there, he waited, he did, he did everything right on his point, and Dane, quality reaction time, and probably also a good respect to the yellow flag that meant that both of them got out of that without any damage. Yeah, you're spot on there as well. So, Licardo actually jumped aboard this car at the last stop as well, so that means they did 25 laps. Steve Burko did 25 laps, so he's currently about eight laps short of the driver minimum. So just doing a bit of math here as well, just seeing who's done what. Justin Cecil's actually completed, uh, or by my math, 
uh, 27 laps. So he did two stints. So that means he will have done a, a 13 lap stint and a 14 lap stint to get that far. So he's only within six of meeting the driver minimum. So, you know, that potentially could leave Taipan in for a fair bit and then put Justin Sessel in almost right at the very end if they wanted to, to just chalk off those last few laps. So out of all the cars so far, they're probably in the best position about getting their driver minimums out of the way. Those two cars, they're right on the money. Whereas everybody else is elected to sort of split strategies right now. Then you've yeah, got yeah. the likes of uh, Cam Rutledge, who hasn't yet handed over to his co-driver in Daniel Cox, and they're now on their 29th tour up. So they've already stopped twice to take fuel and tyres and service the car. So I would expect at the next stop, Cam's going to get out of this machine, probably go and check on that power generator of his, and <laughs> then probably see what Daniel Cox can do. Yeah, so Cam is one that has been pushing through. The other one, as we mentioned as well, obviously because of um, uh, hardware software issues, I'm not even really sure what causes it for Corey, but the gist is Corey can't swap into a car without crashing out of the game in, in, in any Enduro. Um, he's restricted to run through, so he's probably going to run through. I don't think they're going to do minimum code overlaps for Corey because Corey's still of an of a, a, a achieve, achievable pace. He actually managed to pick up a lot of time in that last pit stop. Though, so I'm not sure. Maybe they maybe they short field the second stop or something to try and get him in for that for that just those minimum co-driver laps. I'm not sure what the strategy is down at AAR, but he actually did come out pretty close to the leader. They're actually they're not in a battle so much, but there is just under two seconds between them, which is the closest it's been for the lead since I think the start and the restart of the race. Um, and I'm not sure whether at this point maybe maybe Dane's just in, in a bit of a entering a, a bit of a cruise phase. Um, you know he's. He's pretty comfortably set up. He, he knows, you know, we know he we know he knows the pace that he can do on these hard tyres around here. Um, he's not going to be touching it really until maybe the back end of the race that he starts to go back towards the threes and the twos. But even then, like he's still got very comfortable race pace. He doesn't need to push too hard and probably just needs to give himself a bit of a margin to work with um, as they start to negotiate some lap traffic. Yeah, you're not wrong. So the margin you're right out in front is probably the closest it's been for a little while. Uh, Dane Warren's fastest lap of the race so far at a 203.778 was set quite some time ago. I think that was in the opening stint. In the last lap alone, McFarland did a purple final sector, 38.115 was his quickest uh, final sector. You can see there, visually, it's in range for McFarland uh, over with Dane Warren just a few moments up the road. Then trying to reference where the third place car is with uh, Will Devish Timberwood. Safety car. Safety, Safety car's time. been called. So trying to figure out where that's come from. Yeah, there is something that's happened here. Now, I don't believe that this is one of the randoms. I think... I oh, no, know. it's Hall. It's Mark Davey. He has nailed the wall coming through the dipper. Or down the S's and into the dipper. So that is heartbreak for that machine. That car is over and done with. Now, I think he's done this all on his own here. And that means the, the 38 machine is out. So Sticks of Day is done. Oh, yeah, massive lick. And on top of that, there's a bonnet sitting there from the, the Kiwi Sim Sports underdeveloped machine as well. Now, who arrived on scene? Stancliffe and Burko. They all went through. So, yeah, Sticks's Day is done. To quote, my, to quote uh, what was it back in the day? Sticks is in the wall. Sticks Day is done. Yeah, and that was a like, similar accident in principle to what happened for the underdevelopment squad car, just a lot more of a head-on impact. Like that would, that's definitely going to trigger, that definitely would trigger the Hans IRL, that, you know, big whiplash impact. Um, the, the two cars on the scene next did a pretty good job, and actually the leaders that came through as well, um, I think there might have been slight contact, and it's a hard one just because it's a blind, that's a blind position car. Yeah, there's a yellow flag out, but maybe you should have to be further down, and, um, uh, look, look, wheel off, he could probably have repaired that, but the way he's gone, he's more than definitely got engine damage. That thing hasn't... Race leader's in. Yeah, that thing hasn't hasn't started back up and didn't start up until, obviously, back in the pit lane. So, look, shame for Mark. The important thing, at least, for, for their car is that Bailey and Mark did both get some laps in, but, um, yeah, Styx is probably going to be a little filthy with himself, and, um, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's going to be a sort of a, a what the day could have been for that car. Yeah, absolutely. So... I just noticed as well, so the race leader's in here. McFarlane's gone around again. I've got a funny feeling that the uh, the Stancliffe entry may have been in the lane as well. So they've come out behind uh, the 55 machine for McFarlane. Now, importantly for them, he's got to chalk off. If they want to do minimums, he's got to chalk off these laps behind the safety car here. So he's got to be careful 
I think Stenberg's actually climbed back aboard the uh, the the, rate, the car that was in the, in the race lead here. So that's a really short stint for Dane Warren. So that only got them to the end of lap 31 for Dane Warren. Um, and Stenberg's now gone back into the Triple Eight machine, heading up the hill. Now, importantly for Termo uh, and Will Demers, they haven't stopped. They've just made up the ground here. So I don't know whether that means they're going to stop under the safety car at some point or not. But this is going to throw up a few things here. There might actually be a chance for a number of drivers that are a lap down to get a lap back here. But they're going to have to be pretty clued in to what's happening. A number of them will be taking pit stops. They'll be trying to get driver changes and that done. But then when they leave the pits, they've got to get a wriggle on with it. They can't afford to dawdle. They've got to get onto the back of the train. Otherwise, they're going to not be in a position where they can get their lap back. Uh, yeah, so they have to come back onto the back of the train. I've seen a few comments in race management if the people are keeping an eye on the stream. Um, if this does go to a third lap of safety car, we will be um, initiating the, uh, the full field, or not the full field, but the full field that is more than a lap down, uh, a lap down or more, wave through um, for those guys that are a lap back. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a shame. I've also seen that um, uh, car drivers drive trying to get the car back from the tower. I think unfortunately um, for, for Styx and uh, for uh, Mark, even if even if the, the uh, even if the wheel was repairable, the engine wasn't. And um, uh, unfortunately, the way things are set up, uh, yeah, once your car's done, it's your car's done. It's it, it, it would be nice to have uh, the IRL proposition of spending you know an hour under the car, you know, rebolting bits on it, putting a an absolute crap ton of race tape over the front, stop the whole thing falling apart and sending it back out for to, to get the minimum lap count. But uh, not an option on this platform. I know uh, we, we are, are penciling in a, a move to RF2 in the future. And I believe RF2 does actually, to some degrees, give you flexibility on that. So that's a possibility in years to come. But unfortunately, things sit at the moment. That car is out and uh, we won't be seeing it again. Yeah, you're not wrong there. So drivers are just now being instructed that if the lucky dog is going to happen and, dry, and cars are going to be let through, that the queue needs to be closed up as quickly as possible. So we can actually allow that to take place. So this is the first lap effect. Effectively, the safety car's got control of the field right now, but there's still drivers across the top of the mountain that are potential. They're not a lap down, but some of them are in the pits and some of them are doing all sorts of things at the moment. So we've got to pay attention to where everybody is here. So let's look at the lapped cars that are in the situation here. So the first one in the queue is actually Taipan and Justin Cecil, the number 21 machine that's right there in the second car in the queue. The next one I'm looking at as well is uh, Darren Kemp uh, in the 23 APK Sim Sports car. Um, I'm just looking to try and find out where they are on track at the moment. Uh, the 13th place car, I think, may be coming up Mountain Straight at the moment. Then you've got Ryan Cox, the Ignition Sim Racing car. Now, they've come into the pit, so I'm just looking at them on the screen right there. They're in pit lane, so they're not uh, going to be in a position to make this happen. And then the last one of those is Peter Thrower um, and Jake McPherson in the, the number 56 Mustang. They have it. Uh, looking to see if they've caught the queue up as well. They're only at the final corner right now. So uh, if they're going to make this happen, we need it to happen fairly quickly because otherwise we're running out of time here. And I can understand that people want to get in and get the pit stops done and you know try and make take advantage of some of these situations. But unfortunately, there is also a need for drivers to hurry up and catch the train in order for this to be executed properly. Otherwise, we end up with a mess. Yeah, essentially, the way I think it's going to play out is if the safety car pulls in in this lap, we won't be able to we won't be able to operate that. If it hangs around for another lap longer, we will be able to afford it. I think the way the cars are going with the speed the safety car train is going and the speed of the cars behind, I think everybody that even Ryan Cox is maybe the only questionable as to whether he'll be able to get a lap back or not. Um, but otherwise, I think all the cars are going to catch the back of the train. Pete Throw is currently coming up through under the tree with uh, Tim Redmond behind. Tim Redmond obviously a lap ahead. Um, uh, yeah, Ryan Cook's the only one potentially of a question, but honestly, I think they're all going to catch the train as they get back to the The only actually other one that is on the lead lap but is a long way back in the queue is the Braxton Scott Sandcliffe car. I think they went through the pits as well. Yeah, um, so I actually, uh, I actually believe that they, they did go through the pits, but I think they might be the luckiest people um, of this one. They sort of came out virtually neck and neck, I think, with the leader, Corey McFarlane, 
and they ended up sort of being in a position where they could actually go ahead because technically they were, I think, maybe in front by a bumper bar. Yeah, that's how so bad. That's how bad. It, that's how close it was. So they've actually got their lap back already um, by virtue of the fact they got out of the pits. Just, they were actually when the safety car was called, they were actually ahead of the at the safety car line, but they were just a bit slow at the exit. So we're just keeping an eye on proceedings here to see if the safety car comes in at the uh, the beginning of the, uh, the end of this lap, or if we're going to go again. I've got a funny feeling just by virtue of the fact that drivers are not. Um, weaving tyres or dancing around at the moment that we're probably going to get at least another lap and the answer is yep. yes. So McFarlane's now coming into the lane, I can see that now and so too are a couple of others. But crucially we are, we will be able to get everyone a lap down so to be everybody from Taipan back so Taipan, Darren Kemp, Pete Thrower and I believe it actually is that Rob Carr I was seeing? I'm not who I was seeing. I no, no. Named, oh, Cox I was seeing, sorry. So Cox. Cox is the other one that we'll be able to go through and they will be able to get a lap back. Yeah. But uh, otherwise we've got... Actually, it's, it's worked out pretty nice actually in terms of that the only person that really got to get through back and pass... All right, well, so the way this worked out, actually, they're going to have to uh, pass the safety car. I can't set up yet. They're going there. The message has gone yep. out. The lead, the, the other lap cars are now permitted to overtake. So through goes Type N, through goes Kemp, through goes Thrower, and uh, I think the other one I wanted to see was Ryan Cox. So they're the ones that I'm trying to keep an eye out for here. So, yes, yeah, so Type N, he's taken that machine through, so he's up at the cutting. Then you've got Darren Kemp. Peter Thrower and then Ryan Cox. So they're the four cars that were given the wave around. They were the only four cars one lap down because the other ones that were multiple laps down are out of this race. So the last one of those was Mark Davies. So it's just a bit of a it's a bit of a shame that they were probably in a position where they were a lap down or two laps down, and had a safety car had come out, they would have been in this group of cars to get at least one of those laps back. But now they are going to be uh, they're unfortunately watching this one from the sidelines. And as I said before, John McDonald, I think, called this one pretty perfectly. Yeah, the luckiest people out of the lot here are going to be the uh, the Stancliffs because they've actually not only come out, they were 11th throughout that whole entire stint. And they have now come back out. And with the virtue of a few people that have decided to come in and pit, uh, they've now found themselves up into seventh place. Uh, just keeping an eye on who's on board that car. It's actually Scott Stancliff that's got out of uh, that car and so got into that car now and that uh, I was going to keep an eye out for when that actually occurred. Now what's happening here? Um, uh, what are we saying? I'm watching Scott Stancliffe just gone ahead of Luke Rosella so what they've it done it might be there. the game telling him to be in a position i know he i know he passed a lot of cars as a result of not pitting when the rest of the cars did but i believe rosel was either already ahead of the car in the queue or if he'd pitted was already out of the lane i know i saw both the cre cars in the pit lane which i was going to talk about actually we're just seeing rosel go back through i know we saw um uh, we saw both CRE cars in the pit lane. Actually, I was going to talk about that quickly because they did try to park alongside each other, sharing a pit room, but that didn't work out. So actually, Cam Rutledge had to reverse and wait for the lead car to finish its stop before he could go through. So, so Cam's lost quite heavily off of that stop. Um, but uh, no, that seems to be sorted all now. But um, uh, yeah, uh, in terms of the, the lap cars, Cox is probably the Cox is having Cox is now actually in the in the Cam Rutledge car. Yeah, um, he is. And that's so on, they've managed and that, that perfectly. And, and that's important. They've got Cam's co-driver minimum out of the way. So yep. two drivers have ticked off at least one driver with minimum laps now, which is Corey McFarlane and Luke Rosella. Corey's done the 33, so we won't see him again today. And Cam Rutledge has ticked off his minimum. But whether or not we see him or not for a bit more is a bit of a question mark. Um, Cox has now got at least by, by law laws he's got to tick off the minimum as well and are we getting a restart here we are indeed we about to get a restart, restart here yep. so the top 11 cars are in the queue to take the restart with uh, Kurt Stenberg at the head of the train followed by Lockie Burke and Brent Foley there's been a few driver changes in the field there as well and off we go for the restart at the beginning of lap 35 and the uh, the, the, le the lap cars are still crossing the top of the mountain at the moment. So 15 cars out of the 22 that started still in this race. 
Yeah, yeah. we're just seeing Tony Sorry now, which will be going in and clearing. Yep, they are being cleared as we speak right now, so that part won't be uh, too big of a drama. I believe uh, Brendan Ross potentially has all that under control at the moment. And actually, it's, actually, it's Taipan is the only one, so um, there will be that will be cleared. Um, we'll uh, wait to see how things happen there. So as the restart executes, and Stenberg heads the field up toward the cutting. Yeah, and a pretty good run for the drivers off that restart. I saw a little bit of a bobble midfield. Uh, Lucky Lock actually got sort of caught up in probably just positioning where he was in the train, just trying to get out of the, out of the final corner, but not go quite yet, as opposed to uh, Licardo and I think Cox behind, who had a, a Cox had a bit of a run in actually, just by virtue of hitting what he did. And Licardo was better positioned to get a run off the corner, so they've both gone through. Um, but now, yeah, now leading this train is the. Uh, here's the guest car with Kurt Stenberg now running uh, for the team. Um, he's now back in that car and Lockie Burke is actually running second, which I didn't actually expect from all that. With, oh, um, so this wedding in third place, but look yeah. at this queue on the screen as well. So Wedding's had a little bit of a mistake over the top of the mountain. Foley's now right on his hammer. And they've got Redmond absolutely going hammer and tongs here with one of the AAR machines. That's Luke Rosella down the inside at the elbow, gets that job done. So there's been a change in that car as well for 430. Redmond stepping back aboard, just trying to work out what lap number they actually took their service on to get that done. Doing the math up here as well for all of the, uh, the driver changes. It's a little bit difficult uh, sometimes in all of that. It looks like that may have happened uh, at the end of lap 27. So only a short stint for, uh, for Nathan Higginson. Yeah, so probably just, again, the way they're managing those laps, you know, probably a good position to put Redmond in the car with this restart with a lot of cars clustered together. Good opportunity to really make some spots up, try and sort of go back on some of the little mistakes they've made today. Same with, you know, putting Lewis Wedding in the car. Rossi's on a slow drive by any means. They're probably re reasonably evenly paired at um, in, in the has-beens team. But uh, a good position to put Lewis in the seat. Lewis has had a lot of time in the sim rig over the last 10 years. Um, he's probably better positioned just to get themselves situated nicely on this restart as well. So a, a couple of key positions, a couple of key opportunities Here opening up for teams in this start. Here comes Redmond looking down the inside. Griffins, he's not quite there. Lewis is a little bit wide at the apex as a result as well. He saw him, he knew he was there. But the number five machine's coming under some very heavy pressure from a whole pack of Holdens. Right up his chuff. Look, one, two, three, four. There they go. And if you count Cam, um, Daniel Cox in that one, make it five. So he's a, a Mustang roadblock at the moment, heading up under the gum tree and through Reed Park. Now down through Metal Grate and onto Sword Park. It's, it's funny that we talk about roadblocks, actually. Um, just a little further ahead, and this, this roadblock train will catch the other roadblock train. Uh, we've got the 2019 Series Champion racing the 2021 Series Champion from Supercars. Um, and Foley is probably not of the pace of Luke Rosella, but he's entitled to fight him to make him earn it. And yeah, Luke's having to empty his empty his wallet to try and get past Brenton Foley here. He is, he just gave him a little bit of a nudge there on the exit of the elbow. Foley was a bit wide and just tried to tuck it in a little bit too late with Rosella there. So let's have a look here from the helicopter shot, gaining straight line speed in the draft. Look at that, how powerful the draft is, so powerful for Rosella. Now he gets to the turning point. He's not quite close enough, but he'll send it down the inside at the chase. So for the turning point, he wasn't there, but Foley didn't make it overly difficult. He knew the gig was up and stepped aside, and it's still a long way to go in this race. One thing that's not got a long way to go is the closest pin vote. So I think we've got about uh, we've got five people in here, sorry, four people in here at least that are tipping on closest to pin. So if you want to get in for the person that's going to, the, the car that's going to finish in fifth place by the time this race is over, closest to pin, you do get a prize pack from Penrite, a better class of oil. So you've only got four laps to get that in. The, uh, the nominations close at the end of lap 40. Yeah, we've just, uh, speaking of, of stuff in the live chat, we've just got a message in from Cam Rutledge, who, as we mentioned, one of the few drivers running running basically a triple stint to get things done. He's mentioned, yeah, we ran the entire race on generator power. Um, power network failed for him at 11 a.m. And apparently, actually, it's still out. So that would explain why he was on the on the generator. Um, he's, uh, I think his biggest issue is he didn't want to be able to put a fan on. Um, so he's going to be a little sweaty right now after a triple stint in the car. But... Uh, Really good run for um, for Cam Rutledge, and he now gets to sit back and watch the rest of the race with 
Daniel Cox now in the 915. Well, Daniel Cox is giving pursuit here to Scott Stancliffe aboard the 187 machine, heading down across the top of the mountain now, lap 37. So importantly, that safety car has dealt a pretty good hand for everybody. The uh, Everyone's back on the lead lap. We're also getting some word through through the live chat, but thanks to Matt Cecil that the, the Darren Kemp machine the number 23. Oh, and Stan Cliff has lost it coming down the hill. Oh, oh drift style actually. And then right back into the path of the number 237 machine with Lockie Lock at the wheel. We basically kept him, put, pointed him the right direction. It was drift style going on down the hill. And he was so, so lucky that there was a car that has put him the right direction and that wasn't a bigger accident. Yeah, Lucky Lock's done him aside. Actually, the other car in front of them as well, that actually leaned sideways down the hill, I think was Dane Licardo. Not nearly as bad, though. I saw Dane in the in instance and thought he was going to offence it, but he managed to catch the car. But no, the the action there. Actually, just skipping forward a little bit from there, there's, a, there's now a battle, a three-car battle, cropping up over fifth place with uh, Tim Redmond, Will Devish, and Luke Wedding, uh, Luke, uh, Lewis Wedding. Um, both, you know, all, all three very quick drivers in the Supercars Championship, all battling now in Enduro Cup. Yeah, here they go. And there's a few nominations. I think a few people are actually putting for some similar ones here. So I can just see the last couple of uh, people putting their uh, their details in for the closest to pin. I've got two nominations for uh, for the has-beens. We've got two nominations for Boak and Foley. And I think we've got uh, uh, two nominations here for Redmond and Higginson. So uh, we might have to look at potentially splitting some of these prize packs if uh, anybody gets close. But uh, the only one that only has a fifth place finish so far, I think it was Zach Ross Saint going after uh, Brunswick and, uh, and Lockie Burke was the only one here as well. So it'll be interesting to see who actually gets closest to pin out of all of this. Um, at the moment, it's currently held by Redmond and Higginson. Yeah, but... And ben Hall putting dibs on himself. <laughs> I mean, like they've had some good pace, uh, at, at a good pace so far. Um, the the two three seven, um, but at the moment they're sitting back in eleventh, obviously assisting uh, Scott Stancliffe out of his spin there earlier. They are still regionally approximate to the train, though they are the last car, not the last car on the lead lap as a result of the unlapping. They are the last car in the lead lap train. Um, so look, they're in a good position, uh, but they need some positions to sort of fall their way as well. But they've had a pretty good run so far. Well, here's all the drivers that actually got the, the, the yellow flag wave around in the queue. So you've got Taipan here in the second of the LLM machines. And then you've got Peter Thrower latched onto him. There's Ryan Cox in the background there. And then we've got the Darren Kemp machine, which is oh, it's doing... Well, it's lap times are off the Richter scale in terms of speed. Like That's the, the opposite way, though. That's the problem. So... Now look for Darren Kemp here heading up the hill. His last lap time was a 2.21. And I, I reckon there's maybe some brake drag or something going on. That's what I we're hearing. So. Yeah. I, uh, one thing I would say, Matt Cecil, if you, are, if you are listening to the chat, one thing I would suggest, and it, I've, I've had it work before in, in real-life scenarios, as, as an option, if there's a bit of dust or something clogged up in the pedals, yeah, flushing out would be an option. Just without trying to destroy the thing, give it a couple of kicks to see if that loosens up whatever's gone wrong for Kempi's pedals. That might be the fix for it. Otherwise, um, it's going to be a long stint. I think uh, otherwise the best you can hope to do realistically is to get Kempi through the rest of his laps and then jump back in the car yourself. But that, that's a shame. That's one of those hard ones to fix because, uh, look, look, pedals, especially with wheel issues, they're not easily fixable in the moment. And... Look, the credit at least for Kempi. Kempi's been on the on the grid a few years. He knows how to behave around cars. He doesn't actually play too much as the lap traffic has been pretty competitive in Dev Series. But um, look, I, th I think he knows how to drive the car around others. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, crucially for Kempi, if nothing else, just getting to that lap count number that he needs to get to, and then handing the car back to Matt Cecil. Yeah, you're not wrong. I mean, Matt Cecil started the car as well, so the Kemp's in the middle of right smack in the middle of his 33 lap minimum stint if he wants to try and get it done. And you've got Redmond is now being made to fight for everything here with Will Devonish. I think now Termo's ticked off the minimum laps as well. So for that car, that's pretty important um, from what I'm reading here, if my math is correct, that Termo's done all that he needs to do. So Will's potentially good to the end here. But in a similar vein to what Termo was doing on the back of Phil Boke in the early going of the race, uh, oh, sorry, the other way around, actually, what Boke and Foley were doing to determine how they're into the race. They're not really fighting the position overly hard. They know there's still over half the race to go, and they don't need to do anything silly at this juncture. They just need to actually stay there and you know, be in it to win it right till the very end. 
Yeah, I'm just actually looking. I think I was calling incorrectly the battle between uh, Rosella and Foley is actually Burke and Foley. Um, I don't know, there's been a mysterious change of driver somewhere without having to stop the car. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Into the chase, and Redmond had to leave a bit of room. Sorry, uh, yeah, Redmond had to leave a bit of room there for Will Devonish, who was having a bit of a cheeky look at the inside at turn 18 and 19. And now he's on the opposite side for the last corner at Murray's. And Redmond's going to hold this. Now, we saw Justin set as a uh, Lockie Lock had come into the make a pit stop. There's also another car in the back of shot there coming. And I think that's the car you were just mentioning. Yeah, Darren Kemp is in the lane now as well, Rody, along with... Uh, who's that he's got with him there? He's got one of the AAR cars. Lockie Burke. Lockie, Lockie Burke, Burke. from second on the road. Okay, so I don't know if they took service under the safety car or not. I can't recall. Um, I'll have to go back and fact check this. Um but it doesn't look like they're doing any tyres at this point either. Maybe this is just a top off of fuel. So I've got a funny feeling for... Bur oh, there's the tyres. Oh, he wasn't, maybe he wasn't in the box or they weren't ready or something going on there. But that's a bit of an, an interesting decision. I'm going to yeah, go back and take a bit of a look. It's possible that they're just, they're just running, they're running the calculators to the point where they're catching fire Brunswick, over at AAR. Yeah, just Brunswick's trying to play back in. Out. I think Brunswick's back, might be back, maybe back in. Yeah, actually, so it was, sorry, it was, it was, it, okay, that was throwing me off then. So it was Rosella battling with, with Foley. It was Burke, I was, I was confusing my AR drivers. That's, uh, that's not great. It's, it's easy enough to do, though, when they're running nearly identical cars. But, um, uh, yeah, so Hans is back in. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's, it's an odd time to stop. We did see the Locky Lock car in early, Locky Lock Ben Hall car in a little earlier as well. Um, actually, I've just seen a car around at the, at the, uh, at uh, the the corner after the S's, it's that's Dan Licardo. Um yeah. He's he's just sort of wobbled it down the S's itself and back into the wall. Only lost a spot in all that, but that car looking a little happy actually. It's it's I'm not sure if it's put a tie down or just what it is, but Dan's been looking pretty unstable in the back with the back end of that car in the last few laps. Here we go down the hill. Let's have a look at it through the S's here. What do you make? Yeah, rear end got away. Oh jeez, just gave the wall a glancing blow there, and he's backed it into the wall there and done the right thing to loop it, wait, as you said, wait for a car to go. Again, another one of those situations that could have been worse than it actually was, and lucky to escape, probably with not too much damage after all of that one. All right, so with that in mind, the race leader has started uh, their 41st lap, so the vote uh, for closest to pin is officially closed. So I've got all I've got them all written down here, and we'll uh, we'll see who gets closest to pin by the time we get to lap 81. So we might have another little uh, something a bit later on in the piece. We'll uh, we'll have a little bit of a, a think about what we can do there, and we'll get another little prize pack sorted out. I, I think we've got a opportunity actually. We've just been halfway through the race. Um, got an opportunity to talk about some of the cars we haven't talked about. We've yes. got an opportunity just to, just to, just to breeze through and just to, just show where the order actually currently sits. All right, with let's all kick the drivers. Well, let's kick it off, Freddie. Where do you want to start? Um, oh, we'll just go top to bottom. So just just to show where everybody's at at this point. Um, not a surprise, as we mentioned coming into the race, that we'd have the wildcard car out out front currently, Kurt Stenberg, but he's actually having a bit of a battle with Luke Rosella. Uh, I don't think there's necessarily a pace-based thing. I think probably they're having a bit of fun with a bit of fun between the pair of them. Um, you know, they've raced together and know each other for quite a while. Probably having a bit of fun. Like we've got a pretty good idea where first seconds going to be sitting, bar any external influence or any engine fails or the like, which uh, we don't wish on any drivers. We'll point that out there. But um, yeah, Kurt Steinberg currently leading the race uh, with Dane Warren, uh, not in the car currently. Probably probably currently in the ice bath or in the VIP room. Uh, Luke Rosella currently. I'm not sure if he is actually passing yeah. for the lead here. But he's definitely looking at it. But, they, know uh, they've the got, they know they've got air time, and that's why yeah. they're doing some stuff here at the exactly. moment. Exactly. So, yeah, so Luke Rosella and Corey McFarlane in second in the AR car. Oh, actually, a bit of contact there. It's just, uh, just, just just some good rubbing is racing between the two lead cars. Uh, good running as well for Luke Rosella. He's now running to the end of the race. Um, even if he wants Corey in, I don't think that it's worth rolling the dice for them in that position. And to be fair, Luke has been the quicker driver of the two in supercars this year. Going back to third place, sort of, I suppose, the best of the rest, as it were, or at least the first position to actually expect to change in this race. It currently is Brenton Foley. He's had a good run, actually. The car's been looking a little sluggish in the last couple of laps for the stint. Actually, he's got Will Devonish catching him as well, and that probably won't be much competition 
uh, if Will has the quicker car. Uh, Will currently in fourth, obviously running with Termo after a good opening couple of uh, good opening stint or so for Termo. Starting uh, running currently in fifth place, which is the position that we're looking to see with that initial pole, is Tim Redmond and Nathan Higginson. They've had a pretty good start to this race, probably running about where they thought they'd be running. Honestly, at this point, um, probably not the cars fit to have in front of them necessarily, but about where they thought they'd be running. Um, probably would like to go a little bit further in front, but realistically for where they're sitting, they're still looking pretty good from the overall points point of view. Running in sixth at the moment is the has-been racing car, the, uh, well, I was about to have, uh, was Castrol, but it was actually has been sponsored. Uh, the, the many, the many fake sponsors on this car. Um, running, uh, running with Lewis Redding currently in the car and Brendan Ross uh, currently in the, uh, probably in the, uh, the, broadcast chat somewhere um, just keeping yourself busy as Lewis Wedding puts on a bit of redemption you seen going through there on Taipan um, seventh is Daniel Cox uh, running with Cam Rutledge Cam Rutledge as we mentioned earlier is done the, the Jenny hung out and got him through his 33 laps so now Cox is running until the end of the race but unlike the the car in the lead battle these guys can swap again if they need to later in the race for whatever reason but we expect to see Cox in the car until the end Eighth is Dane Licardo running for C7 Motorsport by CRE, running with Steve Burko. Um, fairly uh, fairly quiet running, all things said, for this car. Um, you know, they have been involved in a couple of battles, and we have seen Dane get a little bit excited with that car in the current stint, but uh, they've been running pretty comfortably. Um, they're um, up to the second last car in the back of this train, but they're starting to fall back off the back of the wall. But eighth is a good run for them. They are up on where they qualified. Um, and, uh, you know, probably pretty good running for that car, all things considered. Uh, ninth is Braxton and Scott Stancliffe. I believe we might currently have Braxton in that car. Um, Braxton's uh, putting in some good stints. So Scott just, uh, as we mentioned, uh, you know, a couple of couple mistakes here and there, but luckily had the, the Locky Lock car there to save him. Um, and rounding out the top 10 at the moment, having pit fairly recently, is the triple one AAR Mustang with Hans Brunswick coming behind the wheel. Uh, Lockie Burke having just got out of that car um, they're probably running a bit of a, a contra strategy to most of the cars around them um, and uh, we you know pencil them to sort of be in that top five battle and uh, look you know they've got a bit less time than they had when we talked about it 20 laps ago but they've still got 40 odd laps to really make that happen so uh, you know keep an eye on the triple one car uh, off the off the back then from there we've got Lockie Lock and Ben Hall running the uh, the first of the Lockheed Lock Motorsport Mustangs. This is the number 237 with uh, backing from Westside Orthodontics. Um, they have a pretty good run so far as well. They're targeting to be in that top five. We saw the comment from Ben Hall earlier. Um, and look, they could get into that top five battle. They're going to need to really put the pedal down and get some pace in. They have recently stopped though, so they're probably running a similar strategy or at least in a similar strategy position to where the Arms Brunswick Lockheed Burke Australian Races Triple One is. Behind them, we've got Ryan Cox. He actually pretty quiet run for Ryan, but he's he's able to he's able to benefit off some of the safety car playing. As he is actually currently the only ISR Ignition Sim Racing Mustang on the grid, the number 85, running uh, with um, with Ayrton Felipe. Um, Ayrton should be back in the car at some point later today. Um, but uh, look, these guys have been a good quiet run at the back. Cox and Felipe both had pretty good runs so far in the Dev Series this year. Uh, Felipe, um, I think, finished in the top 10, and Cox actually coming on quite nicely at the back end in the, uh, I think, either Ignition Team Racing or a wild card entry, but a pretty good run for Cox as well. And they're, and they're just the rookies to the Enduro Cup, um, so they're just having a good quiet run uh, towards the back, but keeping themselves out of trouble. Running out of 13th, uh, and I will make mention of who was running in this position uh, very soon. Running out of 13th currently is Taipan. Uh, running with uh, Justin Cecil. Um, they've had a good run as well. Uh, the second of the Locky Lock Motorsport cars, the number 21. Um, another sort of quiet runner, quiet achiever. Um, Taipan and Locky, uh, Taipan and Justin Cecil, both also good runners this year in Super 2. Justin Cecil um, uh, was definitely in a swing for better better things, and he's had a really solid season, and he's uh, going to continue next year for an stand with Locky Lock Motorsports in Super 2. Uh, Taipan... Uh, had a bit of an up and down year running with Higginson in um, Super 2, but they did actually manage to get the team's title at the end of the day. Um, and uh, look, they're having a good quiet run here as well. 
Um, and the last car currently running uh, with Matt Sessel back in the car is the Matt Sessel Darren Kemp car. Um, based on the pace he's now pulling, I expect that, uh, that obviously with Matt in the car, that car isn't a penalty issues, and Matt's just probably trying to recover what he can for that car. The other car that I was going to mention at the start of this run, but I didn't get a chance to, is the 15th place car that's currently out of the race, and it's Pete Thrower, and I missed what happened to a few laps ago. It's a shame for Pete. Pete and... Um, uh, I'm flubbing Pete, on who Jake, it was. Pete Jake and Jake. Madison. Pete and Jake. They were running a very good, quiet race there. They were... A, they were in that battle pack of cars that were able to, that were given their lap back, and they were just quietly plodding along in the uh, the Wapai Gentlemen's Club backed number 56. Um, and uh, shame for them to be out, but uh, look, they made it halfway through the race, which is a pretty good run. But uh, yeah, well, unfortunately, we're, we're not a good attrition rate for the Kiwis in this race. No, definitely not. And uh, they just said so, again something similar to what the uh, the 158 edition Sim Sports machine had earlier in the piece, where game glitched or something happened when they did the tried to execute the uh, the driver swap because um, Pete I think had done the lion's share of the driving up to that point he was about to hand it over to Freakish in the United States and something's gone wrong and rather than have the car run around like an AI uh, did earlier in the piece they just elected to, uh, to rip the band-aid off and not come back into uh, traffic. Just seen the race leader come in as well Kurt Stenberg is in and I believe handing over to Dane Warren now just keeping an eye out to see if that is the case because I'm just going to have to start doing a little bit of math here as well but now at the uh, end of lap 44 so I'll be able to try and start working out who's actually ticking off uh, their co-driver minimum requirements. We've also got uh, actually no Kurt Stenberg staying in the car so um, the last few times they've been in for a stop they've actually handed over at, uh, at each and every opportunity so Kurt's going to stay in here and I think this will then stint should see him right to tick off his co-driver minimum requirement the other driver that I was in the pits actually got Mikado in Higginson's just gotten back into the uh, the 430 machine so they're leaving the lane um, Redmond had uh, completed a lap up until the end of lap 44 um, so that now hands it over to uh, Higginson for another stint. So that means Redmond had it from the end of uh, lap 28 uh, all the way up until 44. And then I saw Dane Licardo in the back there as well. And he's now given that over to Steve Burko. So there's another change there for the 735. Yeah, so we're starting to get to the point of the race where drivers uh, drivers uh, that win from the start will have ticked off the minimum laps and it's one of those things you don't necessarily put your b driver in from the start you might put your a driver in from the start we've seen drivers play it both ways our uh, teams play it both ways um but uh yeah we're starting to see the point now where a lot of the teams will have oh dear drive through penalty for uh i think it is actually scott stancliffe now in yeah that it car. is it is and where are they that's the question i need to see i think that uh, actually no sorry that is braxton now in the car sorry so yeah drive through penalty for braxton i'm not sure whether that was that's the I, exit they've exited the pits i've got a funny feeling they've actually just come out of the pits and that'll be a pit lane speeding penalty that will be i'm just trying to pick on where that happened I'm, my guess might be that they've just a lot of drivers trying to do it. They're just trying to maximise uh, the entry speed and could, possibly pushed a little deep in. Yeah, it looked like he was okay on the exit. I got a funny feeling, yeah, it must have been on the entry. That's the only possible opportunity there. I could actually see him maybe starting to apply the brake just a little bit as they were exiting the pits, maybe trying to fool the uh, the timing sensors into that little glitch that a few drivers have been able to manage to ha get happen uh, over the course of time. It, no, it's not even that. I think purely what's happened here um, is actually... Um, uh, it was Scott in the car. Scott's um, lost uh, control of the car coming into the pit lane. He's actually managed to find a gap in the wall oh, on the inside there you and go. the car in reverse. He's had to then reverse the car, sort of back down the lane, try not to go backwards to the direction of flow and pick a penalty up that way. As uh, so to sort of flip the car around, uh, he's got going again and he's crossed the line and then put the limiter on just in the buffer while trying to get the car back going again. So he, he entered the pit lane at probably 50, 55 k's an hour, got back down to speeded. We got that back down to speed, but it was a bit too late for the, for the game and a bit too much of an exceeding speed coming in. Um, it's it just that's a, a very much a bad to worse for them. That's just that's just piling on the, the the time they lost and the entrance to the to the to the lane to then come in now for Braxton to have to pick up a, to pick up the penalty to have to serve. Um, he's going to 
uh, they're going to go a lap down. Fall a lap down. Well, he so. will. He will anyway because Luke Rosella, who's just in the back of shot there as well, is uh, hasn't stopped. Uh, unlike uh, Kurt Stenberg did a couple of laps ago, so they'll come in and serve his penalty now and get it over and done with. So they'll lose. But actually, they won't actually, go a lap down because Rosella's following, following them in. So actually, the timing might not actually be too bad. But the car in second place will Devonish. And, uh, and Termo, the number 15 machine, is the one that we'll be interested in right now. Are they coming into the lane two? They are. So, all right. for the stand, so the for the stand cliffs, yes. The stand cliffs are actually not really lining up to be all that contra, at least, at least to be fair. Maybe just the other AAR card they got running on an alternate strategy is just to see how that plays out. Maybe sort of use them as the as a bit of a test. I mean, just keep them out of traffic. But yeah, so that's, that is the, the two lead cars in, which is going to cycle the lead back through to, to actually Foley's Foley. in as well. Foley's yep. in as well, so Kurt Stenberg will resume the lead. Yeah, Stenberg's going to take the lead back because there's Foley coming in. Now, I expect Foley's going to probably hand this car over to Phil Boak, I think, because they have... Uh, there's been a few changes of position there with regards to uh, their standings, or listed in the standings, but also Foley is uh, definitely is... I'm pretty sure he's made the minimums here now. This is lap 47. He's coming at the beginning of lap 47, so that means up to lap 46 uh, for Foley. And then I'm just doing some rough math. In my oh, hitting. no. Rosella pit lane speeding. Boop, boom. That's I, the I, end uh, of the day. I, it's, it's maybe not quite the end, but it's definitely going to make their life a little harder. I, I saw that as they came in. They came in behind. Obviously, we saw them come in behind the, uh, the Stan Cliff Kiwi car. He did make up quite a gain on the pit entry. I know that Braxton would have been very circumspect. He didn't want to pick up another speeding penalty, serving his speeding penalty. But uh, Rosella with a drive-through, that's... that's. Uh, I mean, look, if you're going to have one, earlier in the race is better. It gives you a chance to work your way back out of it. But look, this is gonna, those calculators are going to be... Like, they're going to be risking a house fight with those calculators right now, trying to work their way back into this race from here. That's it. Well, I mean, they're second in the road at the moment. They're going to drop 30 seconds. So you need to work out based on that mathematics where that's going to put them. It'll probably, it'll definitely put them behind the sister car, which is this one here on screen with uh, Hans Brunswick still aboard the wheel. I'm just looking to see whether it or oh, no. I think it'll put them behind no, Will Devonish as well. Another another championship combatant, uh, Nathan Higginson's around at the cutting. Well, there Sorry, you go. Actually, Griffins. Gr Griffins. He's Griffins. Yeah. He's just recovering it now. So. Another one, geez, the mistakes usually come late in the race. They don't come at about the halfway point. Oh, no, and he's hit the fence. He's gone straight into the fence at the cutting now I, as well. I, puncture. I, I reckon it's got to be a puncture. Re it's, it's probably a puncture. Like, like he like he did have, I, I, I think Cox was maybe a little happy about the, the way that the car rejoined, but the way that car's tr trundling, not racing, it's trundling. Yeah, I reckon there's some severe damage on that car. Here we go into Griffins, and he was well wide, and he lit it up, so he's done it all on his own. I yeah, don't know front, if he's... Front right puncture. Yeah. I, it, oh, and then he's done the, the old rejoin there. Clunk, clunk, clunk. And then got it going. And then the next part of the equation was the interesting bit. The car just braked and watched the front right corner. Straight on in the wall. So, yeah. So, there was a front right puncture as a result of what didn't seem like it was overly heavy contact with the wall. No, and that's just the roll of the dice sometimes in the way that plays out. That, uh, like we saw this earlier, you know, the um, uh, the uh, it wasn't the ignition car. No, sorry, the Kiwi Sims on development squad car hit the wall with a decent lick of speed, just tore a wheel off, was able to repair it, kept going. Um, we saw with the 38 racing car hit the wall, similar speed, different angle, engine, uh, wheel and engine gone, and that car towed and um, that car out of the race. Um, pretty decent lick there for Higginson. All we got out of that was a puncture. The tire, is the wheel is still on the car. It's just, it's all it's just doing is just serving to paint a nice big long rubber strip down the racetrack as, as he goes around. But um, it looked otherwise not too bad. But look, crucially for them, it sort of puts them off kilter for their strategy. They were probably running pretty comfortably. They were sort of working yeah. their way through a recovery and they're going to have to start another recovery from here. Now, importantly for this car as well, I'm just doing, if the, my math is correct, Tim Redmond had actually met the minimum driver requirements as well. So they were trying to get Higginson's out of the way. Higginson to this point had only done 11 laps. So he would have had to double stint anyway. This actually throws them well out of whack. And at some point, I dare say, once Higginson clears the minimums, they're going to have to put Redmond back in this car and get them to the finish line, especially if there's a late race safety car or something happens. I mean, the safety car rods are actually diminishing a little bit too because there's less cars on track, you know, so the potential for cars coming together is being a little bit more reduced. Um, but at the same time, there's, you know, 
there's still a couple of the op, the op there. There is still the, uh, <laughs> the, the the little bit hanging over people's head about whether or not there'll be uh, another safety car at some point. You know, we did talk about the random one as, as well. Um, we've seen most of the ones that have come out so far. I think both the ones actually that have come out so far have been accident driven. So mm. the random one's still yet to happen. Luke Rosella now in to serve that drive-through penalty. So he didn't come in it as soon as it was issued. He's come in here. Does he get it stopped importantly this time? Hmm. I, I, Let's I, see. I, 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 I feel like he, he would have. It would be. I, I appreciate that he's going to be. It's going to be pretty, pretty, pretty hot helmet for him right now. But uh, look, you don't use up any favours by compounding the penalty and adding another one just in the process of trying to clear the first one. Look, he is still going to be in the lead lap. He is going to drop a few spots. But look, the way that those guys have been running, they've been pretty comfortable on pace. It's going to be a bit of work to get back to second. And he was racing for the lead a little bit there at one point. But it depends also on what strategy. The oh, he got another one. Car, he got another one. one. So, oh, and that's, that, that, that's what I was surprised at when I said, hmm. I thought to myself, that looks a little bit quick. And, well, he's, he's paid the penalty for it. So, off he goes. He's now in fourth place. He's going to have to... So, he's dropped, obviously, position to the sister car, which we were talking about was going to happen. Dropped position to Devonish and, uh, and Termo as well. And who's behind him on the road? You've got Brendan Ross and Brenton Foley that he's going to lose positions now to as well by having to tour the lane again. Yeah, I, 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 I the only explanation... Look, and, and, look, it's... it's you know, the, the tunnel vision, the red mist, it, it gets to you and it affects your decision making. I've been there before. Um, the, you just you just get a penalty and you just, you're just just so frustrated because it just ruins the strategy you're on. It ruins the pace and the momentum you were carrying and you just want to get done with as soon as possible. Like we saw, obviously, Braxton in the same position. He got in first lap he could and served his drive through. But uh, clearly just trying to run those mark just trying to make this the shortest race they possibly can make it and overdriving the pedantry and... Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Oh Luke no! Foley! Right Foley in the wall! Had a, oh, he was chasing hard. He was chasing Ross extremely hard. And he's hit the wall. He's done a 360 and carried on. But there's going to be damage on that front corner of that car. I think you'll be, we'll be seeing him come into the pits. Yep, he's hit the wall there as well. There's a front left puncture on car 0046 for sure. We uh, I was I was thinking it uh, like uh, not even a lap ago, but we're really getting to the point. We like this is set up as to run as essentially for the cars a full length 1,000 in half the time. And look, we're getting to that lap 80, lap 90, lap 100 stage of of the race itself. Um, just simply because that's when everybody where where just everybody gets a little bit tired. Everyone the focus starts to go for whatever reason, and uh, just some of the uh, some of the just unfortunate stuff starts to pop out. Like you know. Picking up a drive-through, and then pick up a drive-through while serving your drive-through. Picking up a puncture um, with that wall contact. The spin oh. we saw for Higginson. Um, actually, this will be really interesting because well, Lockheed was behind Foley. Yeah, well, importantly, he's going to be checked up by the car pitting because Foley can't do max speed into pit lane. No, that's right. Well, Foley's going to get into lane now with Lockheed Lock. Now that we were talking about that Foley was probably going to take a position of Luke Rosella as well, but that puts that to a uh, a burden. There is Rosella serving the penalty. So going through actually, Steve Burko and Daniel Cox and Brendan Ross, of course, went through because he had position. Rosella leaves the lane, and. Just waiting for the timing to clear itself. The answer is, yep, no speeding on pit road that time around. Now, I guess the important thing for Rosella is he hasn't lost the lead lap at the moment. So for him, he's lost track position. He's had to do 30 or 60 seconds worth of touring the pit lane across a couple of laps, but he hasn't lost the lead lap. Um, so I mean, importantly for him, if the safety car comes out, he's not trapped a lap down. If it's a short safety car, um, you know, you might be lucky if you can catch up to the snake and you might be able to get your lap, you know, you should be able to get your lap back. But he's, they've still got to stop again as well because they came in to change drivers over to uh, Corey McFarlane uh, at the, the, the last safety car, so lap 33-34. So Rosella's been in the car for the better part of, you know, 13 laps or so, but he's had a stop where he's then, you know, had to tour the lane. He's then toured the lane again for the drive-through as a result. He's in two of the lane again. And then f for them, I guess, it, it, I don't know, Roddy, does this actually extend their pit window by a lap because they've had to tour the lane twice at, you know, trundling speed? Or what do you do? Does, that, or does, that, does the limit of bashing when you're in, you know, on the pit lane speed limit actually, does it have a detrimental effect on fuel? 
Well, I'm pretty sure it's not so much you revs, it's where your throttle's at, and you don't have to be full throttle in the pit lane, but you kind of normally are, because you're just using the limiter to determine how fast you're going to go. So, uh, look, it's uh, 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 I don't think it's a full lap worth of saving, is what I'm trying to get to. He, he might have saved a little bit. He might have saved, you know, a Conrod's worth of fuel. Um, so he might be able to extend a little later. He might have options in strategy that maybe it's it, it's hurt him. He's lost, you know, best part of 40 seconds. Um, but it might still open up a strategy for him further down the road that will have a bit of a silver lining to this very, very stormy, stormy rain cloud. Um, but... Look, he's not out of it yet. The crucial thing, as we mentioned, he's still on the lead lap. He's, he's actually not even the last car on the lead lap. That currently is on a, is going to, I believe, Nathan Higginson, um, who's also on a recovery drive. A lot of drivers on the um, on the recovery drive start at this point, actually, sort of the guys back of the top 10, Higginson, Foley, uh, Braxton and Scott Stancliffe, um, and not so much recovering, but if they're trying to get the top five, they're going to start pushing is the Locky Lock car. Um, Speaking of pushing, Rody, yeah. I actually was watching one that's happening right now. Will Devonish is giving Hans Brunswick a uh, very hard time at the moment across the top of the mountain. Definitely some more pace aboard car 15, and I'd say there's probably a, a good deal of, uh, of driver pace difference in amongst all of this as well. I, I think probably what's also playing into this, I wouldn't be surprised. They are running an off strategy to the cars around them, and currently the triple one, so I wouldn't be surprised if they're not far off pitting, and they're just on the bed just at that stage of the race where I need to pick, pick up a bit of fuel to get to the end or the tyres just aren't playing ball. Here we go, down into the chase, come the two cars side by side. Will's going to go the long way round, he'd set himself up for a run down into the heaviest braking zone on the circuit at the chase and gets it pulled up very neatly. So very smart movers alongside fairly early, commanded the space and then Hans had to give up position. In actual fact, Brunswick pulls the trigger and decides to pit after all of that as well. So. Brunswick fought it for a little bit, but uh, at the end of the day, decides, well, now it's time to play the strategy game. And even with the pass there, 7-2 for Devonish. It's not too bad on the lap counts here. The uh, race lap re record is, uh, it was a, well, the fast lap of the race, I should say, rather, is a 3.778. And I think fair to say that's a new lap record anyway. And it's gone. It's been, it was in the very early part of the race that that race lap record actually took place um, at the hands of Dane Warren. So... We'll get, get to see him in the car again a little bit later on as things unfurl. Rosella, meanwhile, despite the drive-through penalties, plural, has uh, now wrapped up uh, getting ahead into what is currently position number four because he's gone past Steve Burko. He's gone past uh, Daniel Cox because and also picked up a spot on the sister car that was in the lane. Yeah, look, I'll be honest. For the guys that are, that are in that top five battle, he's fair... Uh, if we're going top five, I mean, ignoring Rosella being one of them, he's already passed one or one or two of them. I, I think I, I don't think Ross is going to find himself fighting Luke too much. Um, look, Will might, um, and it probably won't be for another another stint until they're probably really battling each other. Um, but at least anyone that comes across Luke in the next stint, um, even if you're on pace with him, I reckon just let him go because he is going to be a very angry man right now. <laughs> Oh yeah, and you, you and you don't want you, you would not want to be on the, the wrong side of him in, in the next sort of five or ten laps. So you know, Burko, Burko's known Luke for a while. I don't think they necessarily get along the greatest, but you know, he's probably either he's seen what's happened or Dane's informed him of what happened or he's just played the smart move. Burko's having a quick run, but he's not as quick as Rosella in this race. He's sidestepped the argument pretty easily just because it wasn't worth fighting it. And I think honestly. Um, uh, you know, racing's racing, but I think at this point, for uh, anyone with, with Rosella coming up to the rear bumper, give him the time of day, give him the room to get through, because either he'll get through on you by pace, or he'll get through on you by other means. And I don't think either of the parties want that to be the actual outcome of the of the uh, of the uh, of the manoeuvre. Absolutely. Behind, well, actually, just the next car up the road ahead of Luke Rosella is this car, the number five has been racing Mustang. Brendan Ross has climbed back aboard the wheel at the beginning of lap 46. So just doing my math as it sits right now, Lewis Wedding was in the car first up and he did the uh, the third stint as well. So just if, if my math is correct, because the, the in-laps actually count. So Lewis did 1 to 12 and then did 25 to 45. Um, uh, doing all those laps, I dare say he's actually just ticked off the bare 
minimum, the absolute bare minimum. So they might be lucky here. I'll have to back, back check it. And I had a very quick look just in the timing just to see if that was the case. So I might be maybe a lap out or something, but just with the, uh, the very quick chance I've had to take a look. But I believe this car might be good to the finish. I think so. Like, they'll be running their strategy pretty well. I think they're balancing the drivers across the race, obviously. Lewis has had, to, Lewis had as John McDonald flagged earlier, his redemption stint, and I think he's done a pretty good job with how that car is sitting right now, obviously. A uh, few drivers on in... Oh, no. Oops, sorry, pardon for that. A uh, few drivers on uh, approaching strategies to each other, so we don't really get a quite a good idea on where everyone's sitting until maybe the last 10 laps. Um, but right now, they're running pretty well with that recovery. Um, and... Yeah, they're just sort of in a position now where they probably need to just sit back, sort of back into a rhythm. Uh, by all means, run nine, nine and a half tenths. But um, look where they're at. They're probably pretty comfortable. With that said, they're going to have a much better idea on where they play into this race than we will because they've been focused on where the cars that matter to them are as opposed to us where we were watching the entire field. That's exactly right. So we've still got 14 runners left in the race. And just keeping an eye again on this margin between Ross and Rosella at the moment. It stands at 13.3 seconds at the second sector split. It is now officially down to 12.2. Uh, so Rosella's making big inroads to mowing down this advantage. And then you've got Will Devonish is about, uh, what's he, up the road. The better part of 14 seconds up the road. A 5-9 for Devonish last time around versus... Oh, how's this, Rody? Kurt Stenberg currently in the rate, rate leading the race. His last lap at 205.955. Will Devonish 205.951. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, they, they, they're, just, they're just running... You know, it, it, it's, it's all that it's all that gamesmanship, even at the sort of where they're gapped out on the field. It's all that gamesmanship, just trying to get into each other's heads, just, just running... Just running close lap times and just trying to play each other. That said, like as I said, you know, drivers, it's it's a cruise stint for some drivers. And some drivers start their run this early for the for the final for the oh, final getting some, part of the race. Getting some word coming through as well. We've had another retirement from this race. It's Lockie Lock. Looks like there's been an engine failure for the two three seven Mustang. So they've literally just that's just happened in the last couple of minutes. Thanks to heads up to Justin Cecil in the live chat for tripping that one off. And yeah, they've fallen out of position uh, or they were in 12th so that unfortunately means that the only car left in the race for the LLM stable is this one the uh, the number 21 machine with Taipan and Justin Cecil Taipan in for a stop and he hasn't uh, ticked off the minimum laps just yet I believe uh, Justin Cecil actually uh, may have ticked all those numbers off yeah, he actually he did lap so 1 to 27 so Justin Cecil's got to get back in at some point, I've, I've just uh, just to try back to have a look as well. Same corner as I as we believe um, Tara blew the engine at uh, coming uh, up through Griffin's just too hard on the downshift. Um, it's a shame, and you know it's twice in two years for for Ben. Uh, the difference is he's not the one doing it this time around. But last year Ben and John McDonald, um, as John still remembers very vividly. They got to, I think, the last lap for where they were in in the race, and then Ben blew the engine coming into Dananong Road. Um, not quite as far in this race, but they were running pretty comfortable. It was a pretty quiet point of the race for the, LL, for the LLM 237, and uh, that's going to sting. But look, uh, they, they can take out of the race. They had a pretty good run up to this point, and you know, they maybe weren't going to angle for that top five that Ben was Ben was uh, playing towards, but, you know, they were going to probably slide into a comfortable top ten and probably a little higher than that again. They had a really good run up until this point. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, there's still some dramas, I think, for a few of the Mustangs in the field. Looks like a number of them are not only battle-scarred and bruised, but there's plenty of them uh, that are having some other malfunctions of uh, varying natures as well. I mean, not the fact that it's driver malfunctions out there as well, or, you know, brain farts or malfunctions, as other people are putting it uh, politely. But, uh, for example, I think it's the... Uh the Darren Kemp and uh, Matt Cecil machine, there's some gear selection issues happening here as well, and I don't think that's probably down to the car issue. I think that's probably no, down to the uh, hardware issue at the uh, the user end. I, I'd say I'd say maybe maybe it's like not so much the pedals necessarily, maybe, maybe possibly just the wheel base itself is is giving way for Kempy. It's not a great time for it, but you, you don't choose that sort of stuff. It just comes upon you. Um, the only consolation is, is, is that he's done the rest of the season. I actually am seeing a bit of brake sticking for that car as well. So yeah, I reckon between the, the braking and the gear changing, I reckon maybe it's a it's, it's a wheel base issue rather than independent independent components because for them to fail, you know, within 
30 minutes of each other is is pretty rare um but um uh, yeah it's 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 a shame they've had a pretty good run and look the way they're going they're committed to it they're still going to come around and get some good points by virtue of sticking in the race but their biggest problem so much is not the braking it's actually the gear shifting is if the car either doesn't downshift doesn't upshift they risk um revs giving some safety car damage. Safety car's been called. I'm not sure if this is a random or not or what's happening here, but it's going to trigger a flurry of activity in the lane. So there, I think there's a, a few drivers, I think, that were just in prime position to make that happen. So Redmond and, uh, what's it, Redmond and Redmond Higginson, and Higginson we're we're in the, in. they were in the process of, they were about to be lapped. So that's fallen at a really good time for them that they've been able to come in and make that happen and the race leader directly behind them. So there's definitely going to be a, and I think there was a car already on pit lane at the time, which was Hayden Link in the last remaining ISR machine. So yeah, there's a flurry of activity happening here in the lane. So Will Devonish has also decided to take this opportunity to get in. Now, this is a really interesting time. Who gets in the cars? Link leaving the lane, I can see that now. He's leaving the lane and he's still in the car. Um, I think this is possibly an opportunity for Stenberg to get out, I think having possibly cleared the minimums and hand over to Dane Warren. Will Devonish, we know, is going to stay in this car uh, when the time happens. I don't expect that to uh, to change anything there. Yep, there we go. Dane Warren, for sure, is uh, is jumped into the uh, the number triple eight machine. So that is as planned. Uh, Brendan Ross has actually jumped into the number five. So he's, has been he's, he's still well. in there. He's still oh, in he's there. Still in. Sorry, I thought. Yeah. I thought it, uh, sorry, I, that's uh, me. Can I give me track? I thought he had. I thought he'd only just jump in. But yeah. So he is going to stay in the car for the next stint. So this will be his chance to get a to get a race restart under his belt. That's right. So Will Devonish, as we predicted, stays in. Now this puts Burko and Licardo into the lead of the race. So this is interesting. They've still got to stop again at some point. Um, the question is going to be when. Yeah, like like, like we talked about. Oh, oh, it's, oh a, be careful, yeah. Steve. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure whether Steve may be a bit, bit, a bit far gone on tyres, or maybe it's just that thing of you've been driving a car at 10 tenths or 9 tenths for the last hour. When I drive it at 6 tenths, it's all something very, very, very hard. Um, There's a change as well down with the triple one machine. Lockie Burke's gotten back into that car as well. But um, yeah, I, I think. Um, I think uh, I was trying to come off strategy, but, but like in terms of um, for where the um, CRE um, the CRE C7 car is, um, I don't think you want to make too much of a gamble uh, on there being another another pit stop. There could be. Look, restarts are a good way to cause them. Um, but I, I think honestly, you, you 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 at this point of the race, you take every safety car as the last safety car, and and I think their best strategy. Like they'll get some air time by all means, being at the front of the thing, at the front of the race. But I think their best strategy for them, granted, they've been watching their race. I haven't, but just from where they're sitting and where their pace has been, I think their best strategy would have been to pit. But even now, was probably to pit or, and look, you going to the unknown is hope for a safety car breed safety car situation and to pick up a stop then. But you can't rely on that. You can't bank on that. And he's looped it actually. I think that car's yeah, has. anyway because. That car's almost got no rear tyre on it, the way that thing's driving. Yeah, yeah, so he's going to have to come into the lane now anyway. That's on the cameras there. So uh, there is the actually, race I think leader, he's actually. at this point. Possibly, possibly. Um, so through he goes. And that will then give Dane Warren back the, uh, the lead of this race. I'm actually just keeping an eye out here because, yeah, Link and a bunch of others are now being told to go through uh, with the safety car because they were trapped between the safety car and the race leader. So actually... This, this might have actually ruined their race, potentially, because with a rear puncture, it's, you know, he actually okay, has gone out of the gravel. I was really worried there with a rear puncture that he wouldn't have the grip from the rear to get out of the gravel. But crucially, he did park it in the gravel on the entry. Yeah, one or both rears is gone, uh, which meant he couldn't stop in a straight line because the ring just wanted to rotate. Um, so he's lost some time there in the, in the pit. He's still going to come out on the lead lap. He's going to have a chance to catch the train. It might not have too much of a factor in the end of the day because all the cars that wanted to pit have already pitted. So he's going to fall into the back of the train. But... It's just those mental games, just a little bit again to your head that throw you off your game as well. Um, and that's the thing as well. I'm not sure if Burko's going to stay in the car or not, whether we see Dan Licardo return. Uh, well, I'm just going to do the math on that particular car as well. So Burko has done laps 1 to 25. 
uh, Dane did laps 26 to 44 and Burko's currently in. So Burko's got the minimum laps out the way. So that part's mm. not uh, not in question here. We just need to see whether or not there's a driver change because Dane has got to do more laps, got no choice. So they have to make another swap at some point. And it, look, it's the prime opportunity under safety car to get it done now, get any damage repaired and then catch back up. I am expecting that they will change out here. Um, and put Dane Licardo back in the car. The answer to that uh, question is yes, they are changing over. Alrighty, so now that we've got the cars uh, back out of the lane... Oh, no. Oh, no? I've just seen in the live chat, uh, we've just lost Foley and Boke. Foley and Boke out of the race, so... A similar thing to the couple of other cars had the AI, AI takeover during the driver swap. Yeah, so there's been a few little hiccups like that today as well. So it's a bit strange that three of them would happen in quick succession. So if you actually, I think there was a few people that, uh, one or two people, I think, no, it was uh, Pete Savage and uh, John McDonald who actually picked Foley and Boke as their pick for the uh, closest to pin. So unfortunately, gentlemen, that's you out. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to guess, yeah, the car did make over the pit lane, so I'm going to guess the AI took over and was running around, but they need to get out because the AI, well, they, look, the AI is going to do what the game tells it to do off the restart rather than what we tell it to do when we don't follow, the way we set things up, we don't follow the game rules precisely because they're a bit broken, frankly. Um, so it was going to cause a headache at the restart. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be impartial, but this is both my team cars out now, and... I'm a little bit pissed off, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's how the race goes. That's right. So there's only two cars that are one lap down now in this race. One of them's in the queue here, which is Taipan, and then the other one is uh, Darren Kemp, but he's on the opposite side of the mountain. So depending, we'll see what race control does here if they let one of the cars through, or if they try and get uh, the queue formed up quickly. I'm not sure how yeah. long the safety car's going to go for. They may only... Uh, we'll have to just play this one out. Because the field is so far spread apart, the other lap car needs to really catch up pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I don't think that other lap car is actually going to catch the back of the train. I think he's just heading over the mountain now. Yeah, Kempi's just heading over. The, he's just coming down over the skyline. Uh, he's going to catch the back of the train before the restart, but I'm not sure he's going to catch the train before an opportunity comes for him to get a lap back just by virtue of Ooh, either just late stop or just here. where he's at on track. So, Brendan Ross. Okay, so he's been in the lane at the beginning of the safety car period. Well, this will be interesting. Topping off of fuel. I'd say... Uh, Got to be. More than, well, it has to be. Either that or he's, he's either that or he's missed something, but that's the only other option. We keep an eye on that one and see what happens. And uh, while we just see how the, uh, this, this field cycling through, and no, there's tyres going on that car as well. So they've um, uh, possibly, depending on where they're out on the road, I actually miss where they're out on the road, possibly had to maybe juggle pit stops to try and may maybe stay on the lead lap. I'm not sure. I think they were running pretty well, so I'm not sure. Maybe just in, in, in the mess of, you know, like that came out of nowhere. Safety car wise, probably just in the mess of all that, but it's just something that got missed in the menu. Maybe a front or a rear tyre got missed or maybe both. And so they've just had to pick that up. But look, you know, they're still fully fueled. They're going to catch the back of the train. They're still in a good position. That's right. So it looks like race control have given clearance for the 21 machine to unlap itself on Mountain Straight because Taipan has cleared the pack and has gone for it. The other car that we'll be interested in keeping an eye out for is, uh, is this car that's battled through mechanical issues, brake issues, all sorts of issues this weekend. But they're still in the game but they've just got to catch up to the back of the train as quickly as they can. Hopefully, there'll be enough time left for them to unlap themselves. The, uh, the snake's actually just coming up under the tree at the moment through uh, through Reed Park. So Kemp has not got a huge amount of uh, road to make up. Here is the safety car train heading down toward middle grade at the moment. So I'm pretty confident Darren Kemp is going to be able to catch the back of the queue. A bit of checking up going on at the back of the uh, safety car train there of uh, one of the AAR machines. Uh, I think that was the, the Hans Brunswick machine was off to the left-hand side. Yeah, probably just maybe as they're catching the train or where it is, maybe just guys just trying to obviously keep cars warm, keep tyres and brakes in tent, maybe just uh, just sort of maybe trying to find their own space. It's hard to do over the top of the mountain. There's, there's, it's really mostly a one-line section, so... Yeah, so we're just seeing what uh, happens here uh, with the, uh, the 
field going through the last part of the of the, uh, of the lap here. Yeah, it's a tricky position because this is about the point where in IRL um, Kempi would be let through, but he doesn't really get he, 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 like he, if he was to go through, he would get away from the field, but maybe not comfortably enough. The other concern is for Kempi is that if he is running it, with it looks like he's been given away he's been, through. He's been given the way through here on Conrod, so I think that's just trying to get. Uh, him out of the way, I think, of a couple of lead lap cars that are behind. Uh, yeah. There's the ninth Kempe's and 10th place cars of Nathan Higginson and Hayden Link that are just coming round the elbow now. So he, biggest, they, yeah, they don't want sorry. him in the way. Yeah, Kempi's biggest concern, though, is um, he's still dealing with brake... I, I can see he's dealing with brake body. He might still be dealing with gear, gear shift There it issues. is there. You can just see he's, it on the camera. He's going to be reined in pretty quickly. So, look, it's probably better that he, he, he gets reined in one at a time rather than being stuck in the middle of the pack. But... Um, look, Kempi's going to have to have his hand on a swivel at the free start. Yeah, so the question is, does the uh, safety car peel in at the end of this lap? And the answer is no. So we're going around again. So race control are obviously pretty happy with the fact that uh, to release Kemp on Conrod straight, give him as much time as possible to gap mm -hmm. the field. So at the restart, there isn't any major hiccups. That's the thing, actually. Type N is probably going to catch the train, and Kempi won't catch the train necessarily, but he's going to get pretty damn close. Probably going to be... I imagine maybe the other end of Conrod from the field when the restart happens or something close to that. But he is going to be far enough ahead that he's got some space to work with. Yes, good work from race control to uh, to realise that. I think they were keeping an eye on Kemp and he caught them uh, the back of the train as they got to the elbow and uh, to give him the wave around on Conrod, I think was probably the smart thing to do. So it puts them back on the lead lap. Yes, I think it was, I saw it in the, uh, in the chat just a few seconds ago. I think it was NZ Snipes. We've got about half the, the field that started still going. I think we're not quite there yet. Kemp's the last one. If we got to 11 remaining, then it would be yeah, half the field going. But the bit for me has been the AI issue that's sort of taken over the car at a couple of random times. That's the bit that's sort of, you know, making me question what's going on. Um, yeah, it's, I, I've heard it happen, like, occasionally by mistake, and... Uh, the the only thing I could maybe attribute it to is is people not putting in the preparation time. I mean, it was it was a bit of a congested schedule this year, just in the way everything's played out with um, running running uh, Dev Series bookie, Supercars bookie, and then running Dev Series and Enduro Cup Bathurst. Um, it's entirely possible just within sort of the way the last week and a bit and, and more even more has played out that drivers. It, it's weird though because they would have a chance to practice driver swaps at. Um, Phillip Island. At Phillip Island, but to be fair, a lot of the issues for teams that weren't at Phillip Island. So I think maybe just maybe just being a little rusty on the driver swap. Um, I, I I know that I, like I know I know it doesn't matter so much from this point of view. I know that John and Brad in the um, the one two seven did actually practice driver swap fairly recently, like in the practice session today. But I'm not actually sure that it works properly to begin with as well. So. I don't know how they would have gone for a stop, but I think maybe that's it. Maybe just drivers just are out of practice with the driver swaps. Um, and it's just, it could be as simple as somebody hasn't got the passenger select key or they're not actually busy. I, I think with the AI control, it's possibly the passenger select key is, is maybe where the issue is. Mm. Or the other reason being that they haven't uh, entered the game or they haven't entered the, the race session correctly. They've entered it through the replay button and through the button that we use to get into the into the session itself versus through the arrow on the bottom right. That's that, that's just me spitballing ideas right here, right now. And it does very little help for all the teams that have suffered from it. But um, that's 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 not great. And actually, I'm just seeing from um, Darren uh, chat, Darren in the yes. chat that, that, that they were practicing driver swaps in practice. Um, I'm not sure whether this is referencing to the 48 car or referencing to Warwick and... Warren. And um, and Darren, but even either way, you know, people practicing driver swaps and they worked fine. So I, I, I don't know. It's 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 a mystery at this point. And I actually it's, think it's we, a shame. Roddy, I think we may have actually lost another car out of this race. I can't see the uh, the last of the ignition sim racing cars moving at all over the top of the mountain. I um, think it has come yeah, to a I complete think standstill. Had a disconnect. Yeah, I think Darren. Disconnect or a game freeze. But yeah, he's currently yeah. paused where Kempi has just driven through. So that's right. That's uh, and they were running. They were having a really quiet run, but they were well. They are only up ten spots. They were up a few more spots when they were running. Um, yep. Here we go. And we're going back. To, and we're going back to a restart here as well. So you're right about Taipan. He caught the back of the queue. So that part's fine. Kemp is actually at Forest Elbow now, so he's going to be racing down Conrod. 
with all these drivers just getting ready to take the restart. So still on the lead lap, but well clear. Obviously, those penalties will be taken care of as we go back to a green flag restart at the beginning of lap 60. So 21 laps remain. Yeah, and a pretty good restart for all the drivers. Dane Warren, obviously, pretty comfortably off, off the start. We'll definitely actually manage to go with him, uh, as has Luke Rosella. Um, good run for, for Luke, actually. He's breaking away from Daniel Cox, probably uh, one of the comfortable stars of this pack, probably really more worried about what's in his mirrors, which is uh, Brennan Ross and Lockie Burke and Dane Licardo currently looking at trying to go three wide at Griffiths. Yeah, there they are. I can just see him in the background. A shot here with Taipan, probably got the best view of a lot of them as they were all just having a little bit of a moment going into Griffiths Bend. So ugly fighting as it all happens going up the hill at the restart here a bit further behind as well Rosella looks like he's challenging on Will Demish he's actually gotten through so he got through at the cutting so the two drive through penalties haven't really hurt their race they've managed to get themselves back through into the position they're probably expecting to be in at the end of this race with or even before the green flag drop they would have been targeting top two they've done just that what it does do with the restart is compresses the field so spices up a little bit of action here as we continue to have a look at how things are playing out here. I think there's maybe a little bit of a timing glitch going on here. It's showing the Dane Licardo car in 10th place on our scoring, yeah, but I he think, is in I queue. Think, I think he's been penalised and put a lap down. Yeah, so we've actually got to... Uh, yeah, correct, he has. So we've actually got to, uh, to correct that, so we'll sort that out. But, uh, no, pretty good start for all the guys, actually. Uh, yeah, the only other guy with, with a penalty to clear is... Um, Type oh, sorry, Type Typan and Higginson also, who, and he's seen his go. But yeah, the only other issue for Dane is he is, a lap, he's, he is currently a lap off the leaders, which he was in the queue correctly position-wise, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so we're going to leave that there, and we're going to have to just quickly correct that one on the fly. So that's a little bit of a strange one. Normally that doesn't happen at the restart, but we'll get all those things occurring while we keep an eye on the, the battle here. Brendan Ross here, uh, Rody, just been passed by Daniel Cox. Yeah, so Coxie's having, having a really good run off the start. And I'm not sure whether maybe maybe Rossi's just been dropped back in the order, just trying to get. Uh, I'm not sure whether maybe just a bit of distraction for Rossi or what it is. Um, he's actually just dropped back. But yeah, he's dropped behind Cox. He, he is he is still going though. So maybe just maybe just run wide a little bit. I just see a couple of guys run wide at the at the end of that first uh, resumption lap. Um, but yeah, that's it. He is running on the back of Coxie now. I don't think Coxie's going to run him too hard for this one. He knows that Rossi has got a bit better pace than Coxie's managing to achieve at the moment. Um, but he's he's managing to come back through. Actually, no, almost an over under there, but no, Coxie probably thought better of it. And uh, he slots it back now into fifth place. Yep, absolutely. So it looks like the uh, the timing has just been corrected to sort out the, uh, the lap counters here. So there you go, Dane Licardo back into the uh, the right spot that he exited the lane in sixth place. The other one that copped the uh, the lap penalty as well was Darren Kemp, but uh, he was that far off the back of the field. The, uh, the timing didn't make a huge difference when we had to sort that out, but we're now back on schedule with all of those sorts of times. But actually, I was just looking in the, in the back of what we were watching. Actually, there's a good little battle there going on with Lockie Burke and one of the Sanctus. I'm not actually sure who's currently in that car. Just confirmation from the chat from one of the ISR drivers that Hayden's game did crash, uh, which is a shame. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just going to have a quick uh, look over on the uh, the race cam and just see who actually is in the uh, that particular machine. It's Braxton Stancliffe that's in that car at the moment, and he's been in that lap, in the car since lap 45 as well. So they didn't actually change drivers at the stop. Yeah, he's he's done a yeah so, yeah so that. Words, words, words are gone. Oh, he's, he's got a prime view of this. He's got a. He's having a really good move now on Dane Lacato. Actually, got that done before the braking zone. Yeah, he has. He was about to say Braxton had a pretty prime view of what was going on ahead of him there with Lockley Burke getting through on Dane Lacato down the chase. Very, very smart move as well. And then Braxton behind, starting to get a bit interested in the back of the 735 machine. Getting very close through the final corner as well. Licardo going to look possibly for a defensive move. He does. He moves oh. right over. And they can't move back now. He's got to leave the space. He's got no choice. Braxton's right there. He's going to look maybe for the over and under. And the other side gives him a little bit of Morse code on the exit of the first corner. And is in the toe heading up towards the second turn. Up and over the rise here. Licardo positions the car on the right-hand side. So, again, he can't move over to assume the proper racing line. He's got to leave space. For Braxton here, that narrows his line, means he's a little bit slower through the corner here. He's under pressure. 
I, I wouldn't be surprised, both both a pair of young drivers in the field, I wouldn't be surprised if Steve Burke is in Dane's ear and if um, uh, Scott's, uh, sorry, Braxton's father Scott is in Braxton's ear just trying to get them to calm it down. Look, it's, look they're racing position, but they've still got 20-odd laps of this race left. They're not going to win anything right here, right now. Yeah, they want to set themselves up well, but look, yeah, they, they need to be smart about this battle. They do. They need to be smart because they've still got another stop to go at least to make it through to the chequered flag here. So lap 60 to 81, there's 21 laps. So you can essentially try and split this one down the middle. It's a comfortable 11 and 12 lap stint to make it to the flag from here if it stays green. I mean, if, it's, if we get a yellow flag at a random point, that's going to uh, cause a little bit of headaches for some people about whether they stop or whether they try and, you know, make it through to the end uh, on the... You know, on just one more you know, early stop, but we won't know that probably for about another 10 laps. We need to see how the rest of this shakes out. But this is going to be a very interesting little battle right through until we get to the next round of stops because this is potentially going to decide those sort of, I guess we would say the coveted positions, but the, uh, the positions definitely outside the top 10, that, sorry, outside the top three that are, uh, I guess, are a bit of pride for a few people uh, in this particular race. Lockie Burke goes now through on Daniel Cox at the chase. Second position gained at that corner into laps for the triple one AAR Mustang. I think the I think interesting point actually looking at the with with the uh, with the 55 actually I was just looking at it just thinking through. With how far back they were with the result of the double drive through, I'm not sure if they stopped in the last safety car or not. And if not they're running uh, they're running a strategy of some sort but they're going to probably be the first to pit of this group because I don't see how they made up 40-odd seconds under safety car um, and actually made the spots back to second without foregoing a pit stop somewhere. Absolutely. Oh, I, complete, I completely agree. The, uh, the pit stops from here are going to be very important as to who jumps who through the stop sequence. You, d you just don't want to get tangled up. The bit you don't want to worry you want to happen now is you do not want to get tangled up in something. You've maybe got to settle in and stay as close to the cars in front as you can before you get to that next stop because it's now going to be a case of if you try and pull the trigger one lap earlier if you react for an overcut or an undercut or whatever you try to do that's going to determine if you come out in front or if you come out behind or importantly as we've already seen today whether or not you get a pit lane speeding penalty by trying to get a bit too greedy in the process yeah just looking now at the other AAR car the number the number 50 sorry the number 111 uh, uh, Luke has uh, put the wrong numbers on the cars and it keeps throwing me off um, oh, for you it's yeah. different for me I think it's fine oh uh, no no he actually he has uh, the, the the window numbers are the correct numbers the is the yeah anyway the it's no I actually checked earlier this morning with Lewis they are actually did actually submit them incorrectly and he hasn't actually given us a fix for it yet so that's what's throwing me off but there was a good little battle happening. He's actually managed to pull away from it, though. So now it's Daniel Cox and Dan Licato now in a little scrap. The other point I was going to make, actually, keep an eye on the broadcast chat. For those who are interested on how the lead car is doing, it's currently got just under a two-second lead. Um, Dane's sort of really starting to run the legs up on that machine. Probably won't be pushing for his ultimate pace until we get to the last stint. Um, just make sure he still has a little bit in reserve. Um, but the, the guest car is comfortably out front at the moment. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah, the people with the brains of a budget regard could have read the timings tree to work that one out. But uh, actually, there's a car that's just gone into the pits, I think, as well. Actually, yeah, it's the Matt Cecil and, and, um, and Darren Kemp machine that's actually just leaving the lane as well. So I think that's, again, probably a, uh, an unplanned stop because they've had their fair share of drummers. But Matt Cecil's gotten back aboard that car. So they've been trying to troubleshoot some of those issues all race long. You know, Kemp's gear shifting issues, the brake sticking issues. I think maybe what they've done is given Matt Cecil an opportunity to just go over his whole sim rig entirely, make sure that everything's as clean as it possibly can be and just get him in for the final stanza. So I think Kemp's cleared the minimums, that's fine. I think this will put Matt Cecil in good stead to clear minimums, so that car should be good to the finish. Actually, speaking of the minimum lap requirements, just working it out here, I think just about every car now, I believe, has gotten job done that's still running um, I can't find anybody on my list uh, that apart from maybe the 21 machine so Taipan and Justin Cecil I think that's the only car that I can find that hasn't finished its minimum requirement this Justin Cecil got out of the car at lap 27 Taipan's been in uh, since the beginning of lap 28 and he's now well and truly cleared that minimum
Yeah, so I think, yeah, at this point, with this far into the race, with minimums being 33, with 64 laps done, you've 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 got to be trying, you're intentionally strategizing to not have had a driver complete minimums at this point. Um, yeah, we're pretty well tied off, so it's just, I think most of the drivers are in the cars now, probably going to see you through to the end. The only question just would be is if you prefer to put a different car, a driver in uh, for pace or strategy reasons, depending on how the back half of this race goes. If there's a safety car that falls with, you know, 15, 14, 13 laps to go, you might see driver swaps just to really get their their gun aggressive driver in for the last end of the race. That's right. Just looking at the, uh, the Daniel Cox and Dane Licardo battle, it was uh, ding, 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 round two heading down into the chase and Cox actually had to apply a little bit of early break before the, the kink heading into the chase just to make sure he didn't run into the back of the 735 machine. So they're locked in combat over 6th and 7th place at the moment. If you're playing closest to pin, which of course the, the vote is closed, the, uh, the car that's currently sitting in 5th place is the triple one machine, which is uh, Lockie Burke and Hans Brunswick. And at the moment, Zach Brown's looking pretty, uh, pretty good for the uh, the prize pack with thanks to Penrite a better class of oil for that one if uh, Brunswick and Burke stay where they are. Yeah, it, it, it figures that if anyone was going to be the only one to put Hans in that position, it would it would be Zach. Um, they've been having a bit of a adoptive father-son relationship going on in the back half of this season. They've got a similar we on similar wavelengths when it comes to uh, levels of humour and the like. So. Uh, that would make sense, but uh, yeah, at this stage, yeah. Oh, I was about to say, it looked like Daniel Cox maybe gave the wall a bit of a rub there at the cutting on the way through. It just sort of was flicking through from a different viewpoint. It looked like he got mighty close to the wall at the cutting. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, probably just... Uh, I'll have to go back and actually have a look at that because I was watching the, watching the cars coming through. Yeah, probably just just a, li a little bit off track. Yeah, 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 I've seen now, yeah. Probably just a little bit off track, but yeah, like still within margins. Um, and yeah, he's probably just trying to, again, get into the window. He's he's probably in a position where I, I'm not quite sure where where they're looking to have that car finish and what sort of their goals are with the car. They have been their qualifying performance, which is which is a good start. But um, whether he's trying to tack onto the back of Dane Licardo and just try to run with him or whether he's just maybe trying to hold a bit of a gap out to Higginson, who will catch him, but over time. Absolutely. Actually, speaking of Nathan Higginson, he's sitting in eighth place at the moment. This battered and bruised KSS Beyond Borders Commodore. That's well, what is, what's happened to it. It's been in the wall, Rody. It's been in the wall. It's been around at the top of the mountain. Um, it's been involved in a couple of other skirmishes. Yet it's still going. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's a few cars. That's obviously the, the the prime car at the front of the field is still battling along, uh, despite not really having had the race that's gone their way. Look, the, the bigger thing for them, as we talked about, is 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 the wider championship standings, and you kind of need to be sure of finishing well in a three-round season to pick up try to pick up a championship. But it, you know, they they they're complaining to you know something happening for um, or really build their finish in terms of their major battle, and they're currently third on track. So there's going to be quite a big points deficit loss there. Um, but uh, and probably not probably not enough of an proximity at this point to uh, to their car to really hold steady with them. So I think the order will change in the teams or the, the I suppose the Enduro Cup Championship. Um, but yeah, for where their point, probably just try and pick up a couple more spots that I mentioned. Um, Higginson probably is quicker than Coxie at this point in time. I imagine he will catch him uh, either during this stint or maybe if he can stay in the car uh, through the last stint. Um, Licardo's probably running similar pace, so I'm not sure he's going to catch him. And then from there, Burke's of similar pace, Ross is a bit quicker, and Devonish is a little bit quicker again. So probably sorry, seventh is about where they can ideally look at this point. They said if Red was jumping in the car, and if there's a safety car in the next uh, 10 laps or so, that opens that up quite severely. Yeah, it does. And I'm actually just doing the math on the other side of the uh, the screen here at the moment, just to see where things sit. Like if everybody finishes where they are right now the point standings going into the Adelaide round in a couple of weeks' time. It will flip around. You called it perfectly, Rody. It will put the other uh, five minutes racing Commodore of Termo and Will Devonish to the top of the pile. They'll go actually comfortably clear by 58 points ahead of Redmond and Higginson, who will be on 526. So it'll be 584 to the car 15, be 526 to car number uh, 430. In actual fact, car 430 will be jumped not only by... Uh, De Te uh, Devonish and Termo, it'll be jumped by the has been entry as well. They'll be on 532. So it'll be quite close for second and third overall in the Enduro Cup standings if it sits the way that it is right now. But there is still a good 15, 16 laps remaining. And they've still got stops to shake out. That's the important piece. So 66 
laps completed by the race lead up. Do the math, you've got to work backwards from this point, so you've got to have enough fuel in the tank to, uh, to have an issue. And, ooh, I was about to say, it looks like Higginson's had a moment coming through the chase, and, oh, is he just, it looks like he might have just gone off the track. Um, and maybe just lost it on the uh, on the change of direction here. Yeah, I'm just uh, just keeping an eye on the rest of the channel. Something we might have actually missed in that restart. We did actually ca we did obviously catch Dan Licardo going a lap down off yeah. the restart. One we did miss though potentially was Matt Cecil, who has reported his car went Do down it. a lap. Yep, that's through that, that restart. Yeah, that was so, that was corrected. So that was corrected. Okay, there, good. Yeah, that was corrected. There is the Higginson machine, and it's moment uh, coming through the chase. There's a big lock up there as well, so he'll get back up and running again. So yeah, so there were two cars at the restart that uh, had the lap deducted by the game. So that was the uh, Matt Cecil and type, so the Matt Cecil and Darren Kemp Mustang that got its lap credited and then Dane McCart and Steve Burko who were buried in the pack, uh, in the middle of the battle actually, I should, I should say. So they've had their laps all corrected and because Matt Cecil's already been in for service, there is now uh, only one car, one lap down. Yeah, actually, I was just, uh, I did see a yellow pop up at some point, but it's actually just been cleared. Uh, Braxton Sancliffe, I think, just a little bit of a spin at the last corner, but he's got going again. I was worried that was going to flick a safety car, which uh, would not be... Well, it looks like it might have. It looks like it might have just thrown the safety car for that one. So I think maybe the officials have decided, well, actually, he might have had that spin on his own. Actually, I think, I think we've actually just lost... No, we've lost the car entirely. Okay. They... they I, I, I have to go by the replay. I... I I think that I think he's blown. I think he's blown the engine. Did he blow an in engine in that one. car? I, no, actually, the engine's still running. I, 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 I'm confused. I'm really confused. So, yep. the car spun at the last corner, went down the run, it went down the escape route turn one, and went back to the garage. Yep. Okay. So here we go. We've got a replay of this one here. So it's down Mountain Straight, and something's let go. Yeah, I think, yeah, he's gone straight on him out and straight. I think he's blown the engine. I think you're probably right, Rody. I think that probably answers the question pretty comprehensively. Yeah, and I, 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 I suppose he's enough to do. You, you, you're just pushing to get the thing back. I, and it, to be fair, we've seen a few guys talk about where uh, Lockheed's Lock uh, engine engine block wasn't actually a downshift from what, I, from what we heard. He actually popped it just on the, just buzzing the limiter, which you kind of do at race speeds. You can go up to six on your um on the run up mountain straight but normally you just buzz the limiter in fifth and that's your cue to then break for the corner but doing that times a hundred times 81 probably isn't ideal and that's possibly what's just happened where uh Brax maybe hasn't abused the engine didn't look like it was a heavy downshift but he's just done enough to just tip over that engine wear point and the engine wear's just gotten enough and just said yeah you know what actually i'm done yeah so at the end of the day as well what has what that safety car has done by virtue of the Stanley machine going straight on at turn one and needing some attention, is it's actually fallen just about perfectly on the pit window. The real question is how long do the officials need to clear that car? So it's lap 68, so that means we're on the 68th lap. We've then got 13 laps after that. So this is gonna be an all out sprint for 12 laps. Now, early in the piece, even with the safety car intervention, some drivers were only getting 12 to 13 laps on the stint. They were coming in fairly early, even with that like safety car that happened on a lap two. So I'm not sure, Rody. There's a few people in here, I think, that have missed a trick. Higginson has come out in second place, and he's going around. He surely has to come in. There's no way yeah. in hell that they can make it home from here. They've got to stop again, and they've probably got to stop now. Otherwise, they're going to miss the boat. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, I'd say that's, I'd say that's it. Only, I, I, like, the, I saw a lot of pit activity. I don't think I saw the Higginson car in there, there and I would have had to see the Warren car in there as well, and we didn't see, I don't no, see it came the in. Warren car it in did. It came in, uh, they were in, well, so. Okay, right. then, yeah, I, well, that's the thing. Well, no, actually, if we have a back in, no, actually, to be fair, I don't think Higginson has pitted. He needs to pit, because this is, you know, a, a, at best, a safety car flyout. It's going to be, at best, be a 11-lap run. They won't have 11 plus whatever they were already running okay. plus more strategy. Oh, on Matt board. Cecil. Yeah. So what's happened to the uh, the car? There's a 10 second stop go penalty for Matt Cecil. Uh, I've just seen. He's. Oh, we. Uh, that'll be maybe he's. He, I'm going to guess he's been given the wave around and then has 
enter the lane. Pro he, no, I think he gave, he, no, I don't think no, he has. I'm not he, sure he, what's he is happening. In, he, he's currently in the lane. He's, he's probably got the wave around him. He probably just was on the lead lap, but he's he might have even given the wave around for the safety car and has pitted now that he's clear of the leaders, but he probably is he's not actually going his lap back because he he, no. he needs to stay out and get clear of the safety car, get back on the back of the train to then continue back around. Crucially, the other thing that we've missed, Will Devonish is out. Yeah, I was about to say, I was just cycling through just to see what happened there. So they followed everybody in for a stop. So that's going to be a uh, game over for them. That's actually massive in the uh, uh, in the championship I picture think, now. Oh, no, they've so they've come down. Uh, they've done that on track. They've yeah. racked the wall coming down through the, the, the cutting and I think they've killed the engine. Yeah, I think you're probably right there. I'm just keeping an eye out to see. Uh, you'll have to go back and check that one out for me, Rody. I've just, I've just had a look. Yeah, that, that's essentially what's happened. He's, he's come in at pretty decent, not probably trying to catch the back of the train or something. He's got other cars around him, but I imagine it was just trying to catch the back of the train, just, again, maximising the time opportunities available to him. And, um, and, and yeah, that's... Uh, of the ways to do it, that's, uh, that's, that's, not the way to, that's not the way to do it. So... Um, yeah, that's a shame. Look, they were running pretty well. And look, look, swings and roundabouts. You know, we talked about the, the, the overall championship. That throws things heavily back in favour of Nathan Higginson and Tim Redmond. Yeah, it does. It pretty much gives them a free run here. Well, I mean, we've got to see where Higginson and Redmond actually come out. They're actually seventh on the road at the moment. So even a seventh place finish for them right now. Devonish and Co. not scoring any points. Uh, it puts them on 538 points for the championship pitcher. Brendan Ross and Lewis Wedding would now be their next closest challengers. They're currently sixth on the road and the car directly ahead. And they would be on 496 points based on that match. So they'd be 42 points behind going into Adelaide. And then the other car that's probably in the picture at the moment is Hans Brunswick and Lockie Burke. They're currently third. Um, they would actually assume the lead of the Enduro Cup they would actually be on 541 points. They'd be three points clear of uh, Redmond and Higginson. So that sets up a tantalising finale on the streets of Adelaide in a couple of weeks, if that is to be the case. So right now, the car that's in third place overall on the road, Brunswick and Burke, is looking pretty good. Yeah, I was just looking at the lead pack coming down the hill now, just getting an idea of how the safety car is going to go on for. Um, that uh, the, It was very quiet at the front. So uh, 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 Luke Rosella, sorry, in sixth down the hill. Dane Warren sixth down the hill. They're both uh, trying to make it from here with fuel. They've obviously come through for the stop, but they're not planning on stopping again. They don't want to. They're not wanting to risk a. Um, uh, 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 there's a word. It's a dash for fuel, but I forget the word. The thing and dash. They're not wanting to do that. Is is the is, is a splash and dash. They're not wanting to do a splash and dash. Um, so. They're, um, yeah, they're, they're trying to make it to the end from here. Um, and obviously, the longer the safety car goes, the more it opens up their window for them. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, actually, no, safety car's in. Yeah, safety car's in. So it's only a very short safety car period. So there was no lucky dog handed out for, uh, for Matt Cecil and Darren Kemp. So they're now under, I think they might have to be under some sort of order here to get out the way at the restart, and they are. So Dane Warren goes, Luke Rosella goes with him, and then with Matt Cecil now being told to get out of the way and let the leaders through, he's done just that. So great job there. Pouncing at the restart, Brendan Ross moves up to fourth place. So he moves ahead of Licardo, puts uh, Licardo right on his rear hammer, and then you've got Cox and then Redmond uh, behind him. So only nine cars left in this race. One of them a lap down. And on we go towards Griffins. Yeah, uh, well, that was, that was a pretty good restart. Obviously, great situation where from Rossi, just seeing how things were playing out in front of him. He knew it was going to be a bit chaotic and took full advantage of that to get up ahead of Licardo. Uh, he is now running in towards the back of what is now a pair of AAR cars. Um, Hans runs in, obviously, the first one he's going to come to. Yeah, absolutely. So you can see here, there's the leader going up under the PID automotive signage, followed by Rosella, followed by Brunswick, and then Ross. So he'll give Hans a run for his money here, I think. He's got to be so, so careful, though. This is now essentially a 12-lap sprint to the finish. So you do want to keep a little bit of fuel in the pot. You don't want to burn it all. You want to have a little something left just for when you need it most. But at the restart here, it's probably where you burn the most fuel because you've got to get out of first gear or second gear. 
out of a very slow last corner because the leader was controlling it and getting that up to racing speed is the key piece. So you will burn a little bit more on this opening lap than you would otherwise do so. But then if you can find your rhythm, you'll be back into that normal range. Yeah, it's, it's going to sort of it's going to sort of uh, err back into uh, where your, your fuel, fuel window is. It's really only maybe the first. Here he goes. Oh, well. Here he yep. goes. Here comes Ross looking down the inside of Brunswick at the chase. So pulls the trigger lap one side by side. So close. So <laughs> close to contact. But through goes the Mustang oh. at number five. He pinches the brake yeah. and then now checks it up on the exit. Is Brunswick going to have another shot back down the inside here? No. Ross covers and covers fairly aggressively. Yeah, you know, he, he wanted to make sure that one stuck. Yeah, uh, Ross is on a hard charge. We mentioned, you know, redemption drives. This is, uh, yeah, by all means, Lewis had his uh, he had his redemption run from the start, um, from that earlier stint from the start. But Ross is really trying to bring it home for the team. Um, look, they've had a they've had a pretty average year this year as a pair of drivers across the championships they've been running in. This would really, really try and and, and, and you know add a bit of a. There's bow another to battle the here. There's another battle here. Redmond is looking every which way but loose on the <laughs> rear end of Dave Mercado. Mercado shut that door pretty firmly up Mountain Straight. This is over fifth place. Locked brake for Licardo. That's going to compromise him here. Redmond's going to go the long way around. He's got to leave him some space. Oh, no, not, not too quite, that. and not too pleased at all. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a hard one to do. You can't really go too wide unless you come to the alongside, unless you're both backing out through that corner. We, we saw it, I think it was 2014-2015 IRL that um, I think it was, I think was it Lowndes or was it no, Frosty that year? Uh, no, it was, I think we kept trying to get back on Frosty that year that lost the race at the cut, at the Griffins in the exact same sort of a move. Uh, crucially though, for Tim, he's still got 10 laps on the board to make a pass. He is faster than, he is probably faster than Dane. He is definitely going to be a bit more consistent than Dane. And crucially, he's the one applying the pressure rather than the one feeling it. That's right. You always want to be, I think, the chaser, not the chasee. You want to have that carrot in front. You want your opponent to feel the heat. You know, if it's too hot, get out of the kitchen, so to speak. But for Redmond, this will be his element. He's used to applying the blowtorch to a number of these young chargers here in ASR. And Licardo, is he up for the challenge? It looks like he was feeling the heat, especially on the early part of this lap, as the car just come back into a range now where it's just started to settle down. They've been chasing it all Sunday long. Redmond now seizes the opportunity. He's going to do what Ross did to Brunswick a couple laps ago, but he's ahead this time before they get to the kink in the chase. And he goes through comfortably. So it was a little bit easier that time around for the, for the 430 machine. He gets that move done up into P number four. So yeah, P, sorry, P5, see, sorry. We're starting to see those laps I mentioned in the last thing We're going to start to see laps start to play out. Um, Dane Warren just went there with a 2038 from what fast up on the screen. So definitely not his best time, but really cracking into it now. And I imagine the next couple of laps, probably into the last thing we're going to start to see laps approaching the twos. That's right. So off we go. And... It's, yeah, as you said, it's happy hour here as well now, just sort of getting to the point where out in front, it's Hollywood laps. If they can just punch them out, they will punch them out. At the moment, it's a one and a half second margin to the tune of the Triple Eight machine as Redmond, having now cleared Licardo, is pretty much putting the hammer down, giving chase to Brunswick and Ross. So we'll get a read on it this lap time around and see if he can actually make any inroads. Leaving Licardo, still locking the brakes. He's, Brake bias, I think, on that car is maybe just fractionally too far forward at the moment. He's locked up going into Griffins twice in two laps. Locked up going into the cutting twice in two laps. And yeah, just starting to feel the pressure here a bit now. Daniel Cox is the next one bearing down on him for position six. Absolutely. And, yeah, it's I, I wouldn't have put Cox in the position to maybe you know, to be challenging at this point. But, look... Uh, Coxie has had some good pace this season. He's been a quiet achiever for a lot of a lot of the Supercars Championship. He's probably still smarting from how his uh, race went at Cookie. It was the only time he's been outside the top 20. I think almost even the outside, only coming down to the top 10. Then it was his only really rubbish, or really sorry, poor result of the season. Um, you know, this is a redemption opportunity for him to try and buy into the top six to maybe maybe not even buy in the top five, but definitely put himself in a position for some better some better spots here. Um, you know, Cam's had a solid run, and Cam put in a lot of work just, just externally to get his get his minimum stints in, and uh, his minimum laps in. And obviously, Coxie wants to repay that favour as well. So this is gonna be a pretty, pretty exciting battle. 
Um, these guys have raced together before in Dev Series as Dan Warren goes through another, another lap, 203 6, just working his way down. But this has been a good little battle. This is maybe a little bit patient for Coxie. He's still got, um, you know, he's still got a few laps left to get this done. And all he has to do is sit there in Dane's mirrors and, and try and convince Dane to make a mistake. Um, Coxie's got a, you know, a very senior head on those shoulders when it comes to racing. Uh, he's not going to make a move unless it's one that can stick. Absolutely. So he'll he'll pick the opportunity. He'll pick something else's mistake and he'll capitalise on it. That's what he's going to do. But right now, Mercado's still feeling the heat, but he's not quite made a big enough error to warrant giving Cox a real shot at it. And knowing Coxie, he'll probably leave it till like till the last two or three laps to actually make it happen. Yeah, all he's going to do at this point, is, as we as we're seeing, is just is just keep himself in in Dane's mirrors, keep Dane alive, sort of. By that, you know, keep him thinking, keep him changing direction, think, keep him thinking something's going to happen. And, you know, you, you wear someone off with all those sort of false starts. You go, okay, race is starting. No, 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 now it's starting. No, no, now it's starting. Eventually, you just don't respond to the to, to the false to the false inputs. And that's a very easy way to get a pass done is he just goes for a lunge. The Dane thinks, oh, he's actually not going to do something here. And then it becomes a pass. Absolutely. Well, he's just lost a little bit there coming up under the tree and under the POD automotive sign as he still gives chase. This battle up in front for third place is not going away either. Ross, despite clearing the uh, the Triple One machine of Brunswick, he hasn't been able to kick away significantly. They're pretty much locked in terms of lap times. It's, you know, four tenths one way, one lap, four tenths the other way, the, uh, the next lap. So it's just going back and forth like a seesaw at the moment in terms of who's got the ascendancy. Ross was a little bit out of control. He got very close to hitting the wall on the exit of the elbow that last time around. Now got Brunswick firmly in the toe. Is he close enough for a stab here down at the chase? Not quite on this occasion. So he's going to need to be a little bit closer than that to resend the move that Ross did on him a few laps ago. Now, crucially, the lap times last time around. So 5-7 for Ross, 6-1 for Brunswick. It was a 7-5 for Redmond. So he's not really making any inroads into this, these two as uh, Ross is sideways lighting it up in second gear coming out of Murray's. Yeah, so like Ross is doing just enough, really. He's probably, he probably I say just enough. It's not like he's running this at 8 10s. He is putting in a lot of pace. Hans maybe hasn't shown his pace this year. He hasn't had the availability. He hasn't had the time to commit to it. But in Enduro Cup, he's had the time to prepare for this. Um, you know, Hans is a quick runner. As I said, Lockie Burke, Hans runs with last year. The underdogs, you know, very nearly were in position to take the Enduro Cup hold with their with the performance last year. Uh, hasn't quite worked out for them this year, obviously missing the first round. But they're here now, and they're in the window, and they're in the window to be on the podium position. They're in the window to really help to wrap up the end of the end of the era for AAR by getting a second and a third at Bathurst at the big race of the year. Um, Ross, again, the redemption for the the regular season for the sports cars for this uh, the Enduro Cups has been car just to try and get a result to oh. salvage from the earlier in the race. Got whacked, the wall there. Yeah, whacked the wall pretty heavily there as well, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't close enough for Brunswick to capitalise on it, and it keeps the has-been racing number five machine facing the right direction. So this battle still goes on. The other one's still going on. So Licardo actually had made a mistake heading up out of the first corner towards Griffins. Cox was right on his hammer. Still couldn't get the job done. Yeah, so there's going to be there's going to be a bit more to play, to play out still. He's going to have, uh, I think it's going to be uh, uh, six laps the next time through to make this move done. Again, as I said, look, if Cox is going to, if Cox is going to go for a move, he's not going to go for something impulsive. He's going to make sure it's oh, something that's smart. Oh, they're both locking up. Sticks. They're both locking up, coming down into the elbow. I think one was on the front left, the other was on the front right. So they both got the worst of it, and they stayed exactly where they were. He's a long yeah, shot heading yeah. up over the hill here, going down towards the chase. And see speeds we've seen topping out around 297 throughout the course of the weekend. And now the heaviest stop on the circuit. And the problem is, I guess, for Licardo here as well, he's the first one on the scene. Your brakes have not got very much time to cool down before you get to an equally harder stop down here at Murray's. And this is where things went wrong for Lewis Wedding a little bit earlier in the race. We, he just said the brakes had melted and just went straight on for some reason. Just cooked it when he wasn't expecting it to, to be that way. I've, I've taken confirmation in the live chat. The other reason why we're seeing Kempi take his time with... Uh, sorry, Cox take, take his time with this pass. He's trying to drive to a fuel number. Oh, there you go. So he's, he's really got to also do at this point. He's trying to run to a fuel number. 
Andy's trying to get a pass done. One player trying to get a pass on, on a teammate. So, look, I mean, you could send it, but you don't you don't want to deal with the, the debrief of the team chat afterwards. If you make a pass, you want to make it clean. You want to do it properly. So he's got all to do, he's really got all to do at this point uh, from where he's sitting um, to try and get a pass done without exceeding his fuel usage targets. Dane, I'm pretty sure based on the way Dane's driving, I don't think Dane's got to worry about fuel. So, yeah, he's, he's really got to back up against the wall at this point. Cox. Yeah, another mistake for Cox just then. He went very wide at the cutting as well. As part of that fuel conservation mode, he actually locked a brake in. He got very close to the wall, so he's dropping time here. This fuel compromised run is starting to bite. He's probably done, a, he's probably, I get the impression he's doing a lot of the fuel saving early on to buy fuel at the back end of the race. So then he can just go full bore in the hope that Licardo is going to be compromised in the second half of the stint. But as it stands right now, it's not playing out that way. Licardo locking up, heading down into the dipper. So there's two great battles on track at the moment. This one with the fuel compromised run being chased with Licardo and Cox over position seven and six. And then this one still going on between Ross and Brunswick. And these two are not fuel compromised. They are going for it. Ross is oh, around. No. Ross around and, the, and the, the triple one machine into the number five. And I fear that one's all self-inflicted. Is that going to allow Redmond through? It does. So Redmond through to fourth place. Now Ross has got a bit of work to do here. Let's have a look at yeah. that one on the replay again because I've got a funny feeling that seems like it was yeah, very self-inflicted here. Let's go on board and let's just listen to the revs. Does he get the curb on the inside? He turned it in really early. And oh, I just fear that it, just a very, very odd mistake for Brendan Ross. And not a, a mooted spot to be making incidents all day. We've seen most of the incidents are at you know last turn, first turn, top of the mountain. There's only been one incident I can recall all race long where there's been an incident at the chase at that particular spot. And ironically, it was the car that just went through ahead of the tri of the five machine. Yeah, so that, that's, that's a shame for Rossi. Yeah, like it, there was a bit of assistance at the end of that spin from Brunswick, but at that point, Rossi was definitely already going to be either end stationary or end up backwards anyway. Um, I think the biggest concern maybe for Rossi is just, I don't think he's going to be damaged, but just keeping an eye on where the tyres are at. Like, he's not tyre limited. Um, but, you know, that will put a bit of extra heat into the right rear and probably the left rear just in the spin, and obviously then lighten the rear up, getting back on the track, um, just making sure he doesn't push his rears into too high of a temperature point. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, that's a shame for Rossi, and actually that, that really has sort of broken that battle up a little bit. He's got two seconds now to Tim Redmond, who can kind of cruise at this point, really. I'm not sure he's quite going to catch Hans Brunswick. He's got a, you know, he's got a two-second lead now over Brendan Ross, which is keeping in fourth, which is probably uh, the highest that um, they, that um, they being Tim Redmond and Nathan Higgins were expecting their, their car to end up. Um, but yeah, all he's really to do, I suppose, is, is defend and hold position and keep that position at this point. Rossi, though, will be charging. He will be charging. Now, I just saw a comment in the live chat just saying whether or not uh, Ross actually got hit with regards to that. I just went and checked it on the other replay. No, there was no contact whatsoever. It was just Ross getting a bit too greedy at the curb and there was probably a good, you know, six feet of separation between the two cars. So there was no contact from the triple one machine behind. So that's all on Ross, unfortunately. The contact afterwards was just secondary with uh, Brunswick having little time to react. Yeah, so yeah, as I said, that, that's, that's really splitting things up. It, it's, it's at the point now where uh, we, we're almost in a position where we can almost start to walk in the top three, which it was just good racing going on through the rest of the pack. But yeah, it's, it's been a top turvy race. Absolutely, definitely been a topsy-turvy race. Now, importantly, I guess we're playing closest to pin as well. We've still got a couple of laps left, but the uh, the car that's in fifth place at the moment, ironically, is car five. And there were three people that actually picked that car for closest to pin. So I guess a few people are going to be cheering on uh, the likes of uh, Rossi and to catch up to the back of Tim Redmond and get that pass because there's two people that are playing closest to pin looking for car 430 to be in fifth place by the end of this race. Yeah, there was a bit of a gamble there as well for those guys, yeah, as to, as to who's going to fall out where. Um, yeah, look, look, Rossi is definitely in an avenue to catch him. That said, he has actually given up a bit of time, I think, about last lap three, going up about a second, about just, maybe just over a second. So I'm not sure whether Rossi's having maybe to conserve. Maybe they're a bit questionable on fuel, and maybe the spin has picked the revs up and actually is tuned into their fuel window. Um, or, 
maybe Tim Redmond just with a free window, maybe he thinks he's got a bit of an avenue if, if something does go wrong. Oops, but Ross has just uh, shortcut the uh, Ross has he just has, shortcut yeah. the uh, the S's there as well, making a mistake. He actually dropped a half a second to Redmond on the last lap, so he's I think he's sort of realising that only four laps to run after this that it's going to be a very tall order. Oh, and he's given the wall a bit of a whack there on the exit of the elbow. So you're right, pushing quite hard, but it's at the detriment now of performance. And of course, he's now been awarded a track cut for going through the S's at the speed that he did. So there is no Sector 2 time registered for Ross. So I'm not going to get a real representative uh, indication of how much time overall he's dropping to Redmond ahead. But four laps to run. And now locking the brake at the chase as well is going to be uh, have to be consigned to a fifth place finish. Yeah, just looking back, we mentioned the other battle that we keep an eye on at the moment. Singers are still pretty steady with Cox and Mercado. He, Cox did look pretty close coming uh, onto the start of Conrod, and Dane has actually run a little bit wide through the chase itself there. But again, not really much changing. I suspect if there's going to be a change for position, it's probably going to come in the last few laps, basically. Cox is going to do it at a position where Dane doesn't have a chance to fire it back on the inside the next corner kind, be, of kind of deal. He won't be doing it there because it was very wide at turn 23 as they start their 78th lap. He closed up a little bit, so I think my strategy was sort of a bit spot on that uh, Cox was doing most of the heavy fuel saving in the early part of the stint and he's now starting to claw back the ground to Licardo sitting directly in the wheel tracks of car 735 as much as he possibly can on the straights right now. That's what he's got to do. He's got to hone in on the back of that rear wing and then put the move on. If, um, if you're going to pick a spot, Rody, where are you going to pick it if you're Daniel Cox? I, I, I haven't seen enough of their difference in driving. The only thing I would say is that it's very easy to rush Dane into overdriving corners if you're right on the back of him. So something like, I mean, that's a challenge. Maybe even one of the corners through here. Like if, it, although they're not really great, actually, probably. I, I think a good chance if you're trying to try and rush Dane off of his line, try and try and get in his head, is to maybe feign a move at Skyline, and run and get Dane to run off the preferred line on the run down the S's. He's going to lose a bucket of time doing that, and it's going to be a little bit messy. But you should be able to slot through and get a pass done and get far enough ahead that by the time you get to Conrod, that you've got a tough chance of holding him off. That's right. So here we go, looking at the rear wing of Dane Licardo's machine heading down towards the elbow for the 78th time basking. This is the critical piece for Dane Licardo. If he gets the run off the elbow perfectly every time, he insulates himself from Cox. You can see there the margin's good. It's a healthy three or four car length margin and there's nothing Cox can do about it. He's not close enough to really throw anything at him down the chase. He's got to be much closer than this. He's got to be praying for Dane to make a mistake. Yeah, yeah, and, I, I, and that's the thing, like, they've, they've ebbed and flowed pretty comfortably over the last few laps. Like, Dane, again, maybe not quite as fast. It's, it's, where, it's how this worked out, though. Dane's been slower through the, the actual corner of the chase, but he's gotten a slightly better run off the corner, and it's been the same the last few laps, and, like, this is the point where Coxie starts to rein in, so maybe maybe it's simply a case of uh, Coxie's got, uh, uh, he's got a better run out of the corner, he's got a better setup to get himself out of the corners. So he's able to do a little better down the bottom of the hill, where a lot of it is stop turn accelerate coming across the top of the hill a lot of it is carrying momentum and if nothing else dane's got the younger brain he's got the impulsive energy that he'll just send a car in there at you know maybe nine and three quarter tenths that said a really good run for cox actually he's i say a good run but he's backed off from that one so maybe maybe some gamesmanship here maybe waiting a little later as i said maybe trying to wait to push this pass out to the point where dane can't refire it and again we mentioned earlier cox is running to a fuel number as well yeah he's actually cutting off the avenues very, very early here, Licardo, who's making the defensive move early, which is a little bit unusual. Um, normally, if you're going to make the defensive move, you're sort of halfway up Mountain Straight or you're two-thirds of the way to the corner and you pull that trigger early, you know, at that point. But he's actually moving over very, very early, about halfway up, and making sure that Cox knows his intentions. So I think for Cox, that's quite smart. He's going to let him defend. He's then going to let him have the narrow line in the hope that he's going to make a mistake and be compromised on the exit of the next corner and then be right there maybe for a move heading up into the cutting. That didn't eventuate that time around. Now going to play, again, a holding station argument, but this is where you can close up if you're Cox. Just pushed a little bit too aggressively through the S's and the dipper, and that's cost him. Look at that. Lucado pulled the margin out because Cox understeered. 
through the first part of the of the second part of the S's and through the first part of the dipper, and that's cost him. And there, I did. I think he did. He get the wall. I think he got the inside wall I think at the you're elbow. Pretty close to it, yeah. That could seal the deal. That could give Licardo and Burko P6 overall. That could be just enough. Yeah, the only only consolate, only possible way this really sort of falls back for Coxie is if he's done enough to put himself in a window where he's not only good on fuel, but has excess that he can push the last couple of laps. That's the only way I think that he buys back into this. That said, I wouldn't put it past Dane to have a couple of wobbles maybe down here like he has been the last few laps by and really bring himself back into Coxie. That said, he doesn't have Coxie in the mirrors anymore, so that's probably what was putting him off. I think so. So look, Cox is doing everything that he can to try and catch back up. So we're going to keep an eye on this one on the other side because there's still a few things that are unfolding here. I've been keeping an eye on Hans Brunswick because the two laps ago, Redmond took two seconds out of him. The last point uh, across the line, Redmond took a half a second out of him. But the margin's still pretty handy at the moment, about five seconds difference. But I'm wondering if Brunswick's running to a fuel compromise number here. Rody, we're just on board with the hamburger cam. You tell me, what's he doing? Is he lifting and coasting around here? I, I don't think so. Actually, I say he, he might, he might, yeah, he might be, he might be lifting off into braking zones a little bit. So yeah, he might be a little compromised on fuel. Um, it, it's not anything excessive. It doesn't stand out immediately, but just a slightly earlier brake application, slightly earlier um, reduction of throttle pressure um, to what I'm used to seeing um, from some of the guys at this uh, end of the pace bracket. Um, I, I, th I think, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be by much, maybe by, you know, a, a couple of hundred mil that they're out of fuel. I mean, we saw on Friday night a car make it all but the last corner on fuel. Um, they're probably just trying to make sure that they're really comfortable. Uh, I mean, really, if they're the last corner in the round of fuel, they can roll it from there and they've got probably enough of a margin. Actually, no, sorry. It's coming sorry, down. They they it's really coming don't. down. They really don't. Oh, he's Actually, gone. They don't it. now. They don't now. It's all over for Redmond and Higginson. They're in the fence. The question is, have they got that car running? I don't know. I, don't hear, I don't hear an engine. I don't hear an engine either, and that's heartbreak. They are done. Redmond makes the critical mistake. The lap, it was coming down. Brunswick was just in front of him. The margin had been absolutely erased in the latter part of that lap. So that gives Brendan Ross fourth place overall on the road. Swings and roundabouts, and... Ross is going to be fourth overall at the finish here. So there'll be a couple of other spots that are going to change hands throughout the course of the next few laps because behind Brendan Ross, you've still got this heavyweight slugfest. Cox has closed in again despite that little mistake at the elbow a couple of laps ago. So this one's going to go down to the wire. Cox is going to throw absolutely everything at this particular car. So did anyone have car two... Uh, car 735, I don't think they did. Nobody had car 735 in the window for the closest to pin. I don't think anybody had 915 either. So we're going to have to figure this one out. This is, we tried to give these prizes away. Nobody wants them at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll keep an eye on this one. So they're heading up Mountain Straight, coming down the hill. And again, oh, oh Licardo's now. now getting aggressive, and that's going to be a bit of trouble here. Cox is going to try and nerf his way through, I think. So with all of that going on up towards the cutting, the race leader's about to finish the race. So we're going to have to be, just be very careful how we play this with keeping an eye on one battle and watching the leader come to complete their race. And at the end of the day, I said to Roddy, we'll be beginning of the day, we did expect that there would be a, uh, a race winner coming from this particular car. And it looks like that's going to be the case. And I think he's just sort of waiting up for... Uh, for one of the other cars that may be a bit uh, possibly fuel compromised on the back side of this. Uh, I'd say possibly given the gaps, there possibly might be plenty of formation finish. It would be potential maybe between the two. Or oh no, it's been a moment. Cars. Sorry, Licardo's had a moment coming down the, down the S's as well. And Cox has got the position. Cox has got the position. <laughs> So yeah, I'd, yeah, and I, I was saying, I was saying, what he wanted to do is get is get uh, Dane off his game through there because it's an easy spot to get a pass done. Uh, Dane Warren has just crossed the line. He has indeed. The he, here's the Licardo issue. So what happened here? Cox is right on his hammer. He did something unorthodox. He pressured him into the mistake, and then oh, he's done something similar to what a few people have done. Lost the rear. Cox, geez, slipped through the gap like a slippery snake. Just pitched Licardo's pocket right at the critical moment. But he's still not got it done yet. He's going to have to defend massively. It, it, we missed it through all that. But yes, Dan, uh, Dane Warren and Kurt Stenberg have won this race. Luke Rosella and 
Um, Corey McFarlane did finish second yep. Hans Brunswick and oh no there's been contact. contact contact Cox is off the road he goes right through the turn and through the corner here now question is what's going to happen I think Licardo's going to redress Licardo's redressing and lets Cox back through so that's an important piece of this puzzle yeah, that saved the argument. I could I could see Dame was wandering around in, in Coxie's mirrors, maybe just trying to put him off, maybe just trying to, maybe expecting Coxie to come back across and cover the outside, but um, yeah, some no, late. Coxie just hugged to the inside and, and Dane, yeah. Although, you know, credit, he redressed it and I, I he would have, yeah. because they're all under the same same umbrella. That would have been a big blow up if he hadn't. Yeah. Now going just back to the replay here, there is the race leader crossing the line ahead of Luke Rosella, and that's all fine and dandy. Now. Actually, I'm just noticing something here as well. Um, there's potentially going to be a post-race penalty coming here because the uh, the driver's briefing notes, I do recall, did say burnouts after turn one. So doing burnouts on the pit straight, uh, that is, by letter of the law, a no-no. Yeah. We'll let the stewards but, um, sort. We'll let the stewards... Cause exactly. Because there's, there's still drivers that are finishing here as well. You can see Brennan Ross. I was actually keeping an eye on this. And then he comes across the scene and, yeah, Dane Warren right there. So, yeah, we'll let the stewards sort that one out but uh, the Triple Eight machine could be in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, but uh, look, look, yeah, crucially, look, as things sit at the moment, a really good run for the top three. Um, there was, uh, Luke apparently was a little fuel questionable at the end, but a good run for Luke and Corey to come home second, especially after picking up a double drive through um, midpoint of that race. That was a good recovery drive from their good, good management of um, of their stops and the strategy to uh, come back in the way they have. Also a really good run for Hans Brunswick and Lockie Burke. I, I penciled them pretty early. They were going to be in the fight. I didn't pencil them being quite that far, if I'm completely honest. But look, third position and, and, and look, you know, it goes one better. I remember it was, I think it was, uh, it might have been last year that uh, Lockie Burke and Hans Brunswick ran third and fourth, but I believe it was Sandown um, uh, back in the, actually no, it would have been, it would have been this year. Uh, they ran third and fourth at Sandown, and I think we managed to get them both in the interview queue. There won't be that issue this time around where we have to do a, do a three plus one, um, if that's how things play out. But yeah, great run in the end for Hans Brunswick and Lockie to come in third, given where they started uh, the, the race and how their race played out. Good run in the end. Uh, Brennan Ross, it, it seems the guys, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's a really, really big what could have been for um, uh, for Tim Redman and, and Nathan Higginson, but crucially, like they gain nothing and lose nothing over Will Devonish and, and the championship. But what it does is everybody behind them is now going to catch them massively. So I don't know who's going to be the leader now. Um, probably leaning. That's the thing. Both the AAR cars weren't here last round. Um, the, the wild card cars are one off anyway. Um, I think Rossi is the best position car. I think that, I think the, the, the has been's car will be the leader of the championship coming into Adelaide. And then from there, really good run for Coxie in the end for fifth, Dan Licardo, tried everything he could but ended up getting home in sixth justin Cecil, we missed a lot of his racing but getting home in seventh with type and really good run for those guys they just kept trucking around as did matt Cecil and darren kemp they uh, uh that everything seemed to be going wrong for at kempy's end at points in this race but uh, look kempy's done what he needed to we got his minimum laps in matt can't go back in the car they got home they got home uh on the lead lap i believe at the end of the day as well um which is a really good run for them um, it will possibly be a lap down, but you know, really solid run for them to get back and to even just just be committed and just stick through this race. Absolutely. So we're just winding everything up here. I think there's a few things that are still to play out in this one. We've still got our uh, our top uh, three drivers to bring in for some broadcast interviews in just a few seconds' time. But I actually think they're waiting downstairs for us now uh, at the moment, Rody. So we might uh, we might flip over to. The, uh, the podium interviews with thanks, of course, to uh, our partners over at uh, Beyond Electrical. And we also like to thank um, the likes of CRE Electrical as well for everything that they've done throughout the course of the, uh, the year as well. So just bringing our, uh, our people up so they can have a bit of a chat. Hopefully by the fact that we muted a couple of them on the way up, they're probably talking amongst themselves uh, downstairs. So we need to bring them, at least they will give them the cue that we're uh, ready to bring them all up. And uh, where would you like to start, Rody? Um, I'll do what I've usually done this year in supercars and we'll go back to front. So we're going to start with the third place finishers in Hans Brunswick and Lockie Burke. Uh, look, we'll start with the driver who finished the last in for that car, Hans Brunswick. Look, 
underdogs last year in Enduro Cup. You had a pretty good run last year. Were you building off that momentum, or was it a bit of a clean slate for your car this uh, this time around? Uh, I can probably speak for Berkey and I when we say, say that we were pretty green, but uh, thanks, boys. It was great, and uh, great to be uh, sharing a chat with uh, Just ASC and uh, the AAR crew. It's just fantastic, and um, when, you, when you finish second to the caliber of those sorts of blokes, like Dane Warren, Kurt Stenberg, Luke Rosella, Corey McFarlane, and to do it with uh, Berkey, you know, someone, you know, we've, we've driven together for Yonks. Um, it's just fantastic. And, um, you know, building on myself, you know, three three podiums, three years in a row. So that's fantastic. And uh, we finally got, got some, um, we finally avenged our result last year. So we got past Rossi, but uh, bad luck to Rossi and Lewis. They were up and down all day. We were up and down all day as well. It would have been nicer to put a sticker pass on them in the end um, with a proper pass. But, uh, yeah, what what a fantastic sight. Uh, the three cars over the line, it was just fantastic. And, uh, yeah, we got there with the skin of our teeth and um, we, we made it out alive, Brody. So we did we did all right. Absolutely. No, I'll, I'll, I'll bounce over now to, to Lockie Burke. Uh, Berkey, you, you and Hans, and to be fair, a lot of the AARQ uh, crew maybe even had the, the the chance you wanted this year to to really dig your teeth into the Supercars Championship. But um, I take it you you both put in a, a quite a bit of time uh, to get yourself set up for for Bathurst, and it's paid off pretty well. Um, yeah, I wish we could say we put quite a bit of practice in. We've um, having installed the uh, mod about I think it was ten minutes before the practice session went up and turned on my first lap. So. Um... You know, Hans drove the car beautifully. Um, it was just a shame we got the I got a force feedback issue halfway through the race, so I had to come back and finish off my minimum laps. But in the end, it worked out for us. Um, there was some good, clean racing throughout the field, um, and like I can't thank like the just AC guys and AAR for their setups and all the help they do throughout like the Enduro Cup. It's been amazing, and I can't wait to see what we can do at Adelaide. Absolutely. Well, great work, guys. Great work to get yourselves onto the podium for this race. You mentioned uh, a podium every, a podium for the last three years. Good consistency building up there. Great work on P3, and you guys can go and get into the Champers now. Yeah, thanks, mate. Just wanted thanks, to mate. say, great job, lads. Happy birthday, Todd. <laughs> All righty, moving on now to the second place finisher, the AAR team owner, and I think the lead AAR driver from the Supercars Championship teaming up, Corey McFarlane and Luke Rosella. Um, Corey, uh, since you started the car, we'll start with you. Um, you guys were kind of fixed into the strategy options given your history with Endurance Cup driver swaps, but uh, I think you guys otherwise had it pretty well worked out. Um, yeah, just pretty much just me start the car and Luke finish. Um, so yeah, pretty straightforward um and then yeah just the whole fuel saving sort of problem in the last in and um yeah i think we would have been a bit tight if it wasn't to uh thanks to colin warwick for pointing it out that we uh probably should have hopped on the fuel save and um made it a little bit easier but i think uh dane did a good job of it and um hans as well and yeah luke and lucky and all danny as well drove unbelievably today to get a top three Absolutely. We'll switch over now to the driver that finished the car, Luke Rosella. Um, look, you, you you wanted to crack at the championship this year in supercars. It didn't quite fall your way. So it came pretty close. Um, didn't quite get the win today, but that still would have come pretty sweet. Uh, yeah, it was a good team effort with uh, all us, us three entries. Um, yeah, the car was good. Corey drove you know, flawlessly, didn't make a mistake. Um, I made a couple, but um, overall it was a good performance and happy to finish second. Absolutely. Well, look, great work, guys. Um, as we said, you know, second, it, it keeps it keeps you up, Luke, with your history uh, with um, uh, 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 words, with the uh, results at Bathurst and uh, obviously uh, good uh, stead going into Adelaide. We're going to switch over now to the race winners running in the wildcard super cheap auto racing entry is Dane Warren and Kurt Stenberg. Um Kurt, we'll start off with you. Uh, you mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago that uh, this was going to become a bit of a swan song for you. You are looking at stepping back from sim racing. Um, pretty good way to be going out. Definitely, mate. Um, we've backed it up. I've won last year with Luke, win this year with Dane, and that's just a credit to Dane. Um, 
you know, we had some struggles there in the race. I had some struggles where we got the baseline set up loaded and had a bit of a tyre drama where we actually had a spin. But um, glad that we could recover for that, and Dane's just incredible. So full credit to the AIR guys uh, and the Just ASC team. We, we really put it out there today, and we came to do what we did, and we it was mostly faultless outside of that. Absolutely. So we over now to the man that now holds both the race and the quality lap records for ASR at Bathurst, Dane Warren. Um, Doff, I, I think the big question everyone's asking is, how do you do it? Uh, well, obviously not in the correct livery, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Carl was final day. As Kurt said, we were in the wrong setup pretty much from the end of the first stint. So uh, that was kind of annoying. Um, yeah, I mean, it was pretty good besides that unfortunate fluke to run out of fuel at the end, but uh, yeah, can't really complain, really. Yeah, absolutely. No, good run for you guys. And look, it is just a one round entry, but it does put you guys, it does set you guys up. It does put you in the record books as the winners of the 2022 ASR Bathurst 500. Uh, and great work to all of our podium sitters. Thanks very much, Rody. Good to see. Yeah, I guess the uh, we we knew at the beginning of the day, didn't we, that uh, there was probably going to be uh, a very very difficult prospect for anybody to really even get close uh, to Warren and Stenberg and Rosella and McFarlane. We knew that was going to be the case, but um, the battle over P3, there was still you know a few people in it right till the uh, till the very end, and well. I guess no surprise at the end of the day, the top three fastest cars were the ones that were at the uh, the pointy end of the field. So I guess to recap the order, because there was uh, only, uh, what have we got here? Uh, eight finishes total. So uh, outside of the top three, uh, the, the the number five has been Racing Machine, finished fourth, Lewis Wedding and Brendan Ross. Cam Rutledge and uh, Daniel Cox finishing in fifth. They, of course, were given that position back by the uh, the contact with uh, Dane Licato and Steve Burko at the last corner. So that was a very sporting gesture of them to, to address that after a pretty hard and, you know, at times, I guess, pretty intense battle over that spot. Justin Cecil and Taipan, they get home for seventh place. So that's good for them because that keeps their finishing record intact. And then the only other car getting home in eighth place was uh, Matt Cecil and uh, Darren Kemp. So I'm putting all the point standings uh, together at the moment just to see how that all pans out. In terms of how the Enduro Cup is unfolding, essentially, it, it looks like going into Adelaide, it's going to be a race in two. So with the top two teams having not finished this race, they need a minor miracle to make anything happen. So... The Triple One All Australian Races machine of Burke and Brunswick is on top of the pile with 541 points. The team has been Mustang behind them is on 532. So there's not a lot in that at all. Only nine points the difference going into Adelaide. So that's nice and close. Then behind them, you've got two points separating the third-placed C7 Motorsport by CRE. They got 458. Then you've got Daniel Cox and Cam Rutledge with 456. So those two positions that exchanged late in this race are actually quite critical. Had it have actually been the other way around, the, uh, the C7 Motorsport guys would have increased their margin. So... That's an interesting battle to watch over for third place. Then you've got a gaggle of drivers that are actually in the in the 300s. You've got the KSS Beyond Borders team. Their non-finish means they're still on four, 346. Same with the non-finish for the five minutes racing guys of Termo and Will Devonish. They're still on 326. But then between those two drivers, you've got Justin Cecil and Taipan on 330. And the APK Sim Sports guys of Darren Kemp and Matt Cecil, and of course Jesse Bennett has been in that car at Phillip Island. They're on 334. So there's a couple of interesting developments heading into Adelaide, Rody, that we're going to be paying some very close attention to, especially for the positions that are outside the top four. Yeah, and they're proving the merit in just sticking in the race and just seeing out the, how, the, how the end of the race, uh, seeing out the, the race and just getting what they can out of it um some hard luck stories uh to um to both the pbf cars um uh, obviously missing the first round and a dnf that round um also uh, just well i was right to everyone's the dnf um but the, yeah the big ones from that in terms of the championship um kiwi sims will be on borders and five minutes racing they're going to be engaged in their own little tight scrap but it's they're going to need a minor miracle for it to be over first and second um 
look, there's still going to be a tight little scrap there, absolutely. And crucially, while they're not leading at the moment, it does put the uh, Team Hasveen's car in the window for a championship title again. But they've been there before this year, and I don't want to put the knockers on them because I'm I'm going to – Lewis would come to my house and <laughs> do bad things to me. But, uh, like, you know, the, the, on the plus side, this could be their chance for redemption after the year that they've had after the team, team championship that was – like they, they had to earn it, but it didn't end up going their way. But this might be their chance at redemption. Well, what we're going to do as well is we will be keeping a look at those redemption points. But just before we end the broadcast as well, we're just going to return to our closest to pin that we had about halfway through the race. So the question was, who was going to finish in fifth place of closest to pin? We eliminated a couple of cars from that. The uh, the closest one at the moment uh, that nobody got, well, actually, the, the car that finished in fifth place was Cam Rutledge and... Um, and Daniel Cox. So nobody actually picked them at all. So we don't have an exact number. We've got Steve Burko and uh, and Dane Licata behind in the 735. Nobody picked them either. The car directly ahead is the Lewis Wedding and Brendan Ross machine. And I have down here that there was three people, I think, that picked that particular car. I think I had some stuff in the chat from... I think the first person in might have been Lewis Cugley, uh, followed by Hayden Cupid. And Steve Warwick, I think. I'll have to go back and double check that. Um, but if that's the case, um, guys, please. Uh, I'm pretty sure I've got access to Cupid and to Steve Warwick in the Discord. I don't believe, I'm not sure about Lewis Cugley. I'll have to double check that one. So if that's the case and Cugley was in first, um, Cugley, you need to make yourself known to me if you'd like to claim that prize. I'll need to get somewhere where I can send you a, uh, a prize pack courtesy of uh, Penrite, a better class of oil. And, of course, we've got the one from John McDonald as well for uh, his light-hearted comments earlier on in the piece. He's getting a little uh, little pack with thanks to Milwaukee for uh, looking on the brighter side of life when it came to their <laughs> first lap uh, non-finish. Well, with that in mind, the, uh, the Bathurst 500 is over for another year and our attention is now going to turn towards the Adelaide round. So the 10th and 11th of December, it's three weeks away. It's going to follow the same sort of format, qualifying on the Saturday the 10th and then the racing on Sunday the 11th. So what happens in that situation is we do two sets of qualifying on the Saturday night, two top 10 shootouts and then... On the Sunday, we do two lots of 200-kilometre distance races around the concrete jungle of the Adelaide Street Circuit. So until then, we will see you next time, everybody. Take care, and bye for now.